Chairwoman, just confirming, we do have a quorum when you're ready. No, do we have quorum? Yes, Joe, and we do. No, if you're speaking, I can't hear you. Okay, you're on mute. I think looks like you're on mute. Um, can it, can you all hear me speaking? Yes. Yes. We yes. Can. yes, we can. Yes, Okay, thank yes. you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and start. It's ten o'clock. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to call this meeting to order at 10 a.m. And as many of you know, the governor has signed Public Act 101-0640, making certain amendments to the Open Meetings Act so that we, along with other boards and commissions, can continue to host virtual meetings during this COVID-19 public health emergency, provided that certain conditions are met. One of those conditions is that I, as head of the Chicago Plan Commission, determined that an in-person meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission is not practical nor prudent. I wanna make sure our virtual meeting meets all the conditions of the Open Meetings Act as amended. Therefore, I am making a determination pursuant to the newly created Section 7A2 of the Open Meetings Act that an in-person meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission is not practical nor prudent. Similarly, I'm also making a determination pursuant to the newly created Section 75 that because of the disaster as declared by the governor, it is unfeasible for at least one member of the Chicago Plan Commission or its chief administrative officer or its chief legal officer to be physically present at the meeting in as much as there is no physical meeting place. Before we get into the full meeting agenda for the October 21st, 2021 Chicago Plan Commission meeting, I would like to ask therefore that because we are meeting virtually, please be mindful of your surroundings in terms of noise. Please remember to keep yourself muted when you are not speaking. The meeting is being recorded and also live stream for public viewing. Lastly, if you are an active participant in the meeting, especially if you are speaking, please do not watch the live stream as this will cause audio interference. Thank you. I also want to quickly provide guidance to those who have pre-registered to provide testimony on the cases presented for public hearing today. Those who requested to testify at the plan commission Today should have already up submitted testimony forms, which include the speaker's full name and address. 
as well as a public hearing item number and those forms have been gathered by the staff. I'd also like to remind our presenters to please be mindful of their presentation length and to please stay on point in a concise and efficient manner so as to respect the time of all in attendance. And out of respect for others, speakers should limit their comments to three minutes. When your name is called, your microphone will be unmuted to allow you to make your comments. The public comment portion of the meeting is not a question and answer session of staff or the applicant, but an opportunity for attendees to voice their opinions on a particular proposal. Out of respect for others, please do not interrupt or disrupt the speakers. And any individual who, did, who does disrupt the presentation or any subsequent comment session may be muted and removed from the virtual planning session. Uh, before we take roll call, I want to extend a thank you to Commissioner Fran Grossman, who has graciously served on the plan commission for many years now. We thank her very much. Um, her commission has now expired. And I would like to take a moment to welcome Carlos Pinero, who was recently appointed to the plan commission and joins us for his first meeting this month. Uh, welcome, Commissioner Pietro. We're happy that you are here joining us. Um, and also would like to uh, welcome um, uh, Commissioner or uh, Director of uh, Acting Director of Public Works, uh, Rosa Escarano. So thank you also for being here. So now we will approve the minutes from the September 16, 2021 regularly scheduled plan commission meeting. The minutes were distributed prior to today's hearing. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the regularly scheduled meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission held on September 16, 2021? So moved moved by have... Commissioner Shaw. Moved Chairman, by... do we go ahead? Chairman, do we need to do roll call yeah. first? Yeah, sure. When I was gonna say we skip roll call. How did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it's one of those days. Uh, yeah, actually, it actually it is. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I, I'm going to need, I'm probably going to need lots of backup today here. So, um, all right, let me go to my Excel spreadsheet. Hello, where are you? Back, back to uh, page two, bottom of page two. Okay, got it. Uh, got it here. Uh, Commissioner Biagi? Here. Commissioner Brumfeld? Here. Commissioner Burnett? Here. Commissioner Cordova is here. Commissioner Cox? Here. Commissioner Flores? Here. Commissioner Garza. Here. Uh, Commissioner Pinero. Here. Commissioner Escareno. Is there, there's an Enya on that, isn't that? Isn't there? Es yes. Okay, Escareno. Uh, Commissioner Lightfoot. Commissioner Lyons. Here. Here. Commissioner Moore. Here. Commissioner Murphy. Here. Commissioner Novada. Here. Commissioner Osterman. Commissioner Barkley. Commissioner Reyes. Here. Commissioner Searle. Here. Commissioner Shaw. Here. Commissioner Sposato. Commissioner Tunney. I thought I saw Commissioner Tunney in the in the there. Commissioner Tunney. Commissioner Villegas. Here. And Commissioner Wagespot. All right, thank you. Oh boy. So this going back and forth and all these uh, documents here is not going to be so easy. Here we go. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we will now approve the minutes from the September 16, 2021 regularly scheduled plan commission meeting. Minutes were distributed prior to today's meeting. Do I have a motion to approve uh, the, from September 16, 2021? Moved by Commissioner Shaw. And seconded by? Biagi. Thank you, guys. Thank you, uh, Commissioner, so much. All right, Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Flores. Yes. Commissioner Garza. Yes. Commissioner uh, uh, is did I did uh, Commissioner Pinedo say he was here? Commissioner Pinedo. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I believe Commissioner is going to recuse on this one. Since on this one. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Nevada. Yes. Commissioner Dreyes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Uh, is Tunney available, Commissioner Tunney? Commissioner Viegas. Yes. And Commissioner Wagespot. I was not here. Okay, thank you. 
All right. Uh, prior to commencing the public test, uh, the Alderman motion Burnett passes. votes yes to. Thank you very much. So motion passes to pass the minutes. All right. Prior to commencing the public testimony and regular business listed on the agenda, we have one case for which the applicant is seeking a deferral to a date certain of the next Chicago Plan Commission hearing scheduled for Thursday, November 18th, 2021. The item is listed as number one under the disposition heading of the interagency section of the agenda. The item is a resolution recommending a proposed ordinance authorizing a disposition of city owned land generally located at 1300 North Astor Street and 24 East uh, Goethe Street to 24 East Goethe LLC. This is in the 43th, 43rd, 43rd Ward. Can I get a motion to defer this item to the November 18, 2021 Plan Commission meeting? Moved by Commissioner Shaw. Thank you, Commissioner. Seconded by, Seconded by Commissioner Searle. Thank you so much. Again, a roll call vote. Commissioner Biagi? Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld? Yes. Burnett? Yes. Fourth of us a yes. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Commissioner Flores? Yes. Commissioner Garza? Yes. Commissioner Pinero? Yes. Commissioner Esca, uh, Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Commissioner Moore? Yes. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Commissioner Novada? Yes. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Commissioner Searle? Yes. Shaw? Yes. Villegas? Mr. Villegas? Okay, motion yes. passes. Yes. All right, thank uh, you, Commissioner. All right, motion passes. We will now take public testimony for the items remaining on the agenda today. The following group of people signed in to speak on items today, a total of 13 people. When I call your name, please wait a moment until you are unmuted and then you may proceed to speak. Please be reminded that you will have three minutes to speak. First speaker is Dan Kim, followed by Ron Pooley on item D1. They will then be followed by Butler Adams, John Haisler, Michael Braun, uh, Nina Munoz, Munoz, and Sarah Nelson to speak on item D2 followed by Butler Adams and Kevin Drever to speak on item D3, and then Adrian, Adrian Soto, Dixon, Galvez, Cyril, Jaime, uh, Gorth, Cyril, and Joanne Williams to speak on item D5. And that will then conclude the list of those who completed speaking forms. So first, let me go to Dan Kim, followed by Don Pooley, item D1. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, commission members. Um, my name is Dan Kim. I uh, reside in Chicago and my son has been a First Tee participant for the past 10 years. Um, the First Tee not only teaches the game of golf and, and hopefully the love of the game, uh, but it teaches so much more than that. Uh, through its nine core values, honesty, integrity, sportsmanship, respect, confidence, responsibility, perseverance, courtesy, and judgment, uh, I've seen firsthand uh, how this has uh, impacted my son. Um, he is more confident. Uh, has, has been provided many opportunities. Um, the mentors uh, at the First Tee uh, are, are, are there not just for golf, but for, for life as well. Uh, one of the things I would, would stress is that um, a lot of these activities are also revolved around service. Uh, through that, my son has taken that uh, to, uh, to, to other parts of his life and has 400, 400 hours of, uh, of community service. Um, he's been offered public speaking uh, opportunities and wonderful friendships that will last him a lifetime. Uh, I uh, absolutely support the, the new facility uh, at the Sydney Maravitz location. Again, seeing firsthand the value of the First Tee program and the impact, uh, positive impacts on my son. Um, I think the, have, having a youth facility there will give a safe place to practice, spend time and interact with, with peers who have similar interests in the, in the game of golf. Uh, I know my son is looking forward to uh, uh, visiting and utilizing the facility during his summer break as, as he's busy with current activities and, and school. Uh, and as a side note, you know, Sydney Maravitz um, is, is really a little gem of a golf course, uh, nine holes there uh, with wonderful views of the city. And uh, this can only uh, look to enhance the experience of the other golfers, as well as myself, uh, who, have, uh, who have continued to uh, utilize and, and use the facilities at Sydney Maravitz. Um, I think the, you know, the outdoor facility that calls for, I think, 60,000 square feet of, of putting, two putting greens, short game uh, area, swing cages, uh, sand bunkers, chipping and pitching uh, practice areas, uh, again, will be fantastic for uh, the first team participants. Uh, our young youth um, hopefully will um, be, uh, be good for their practice, but also, again, interacting with uh, folks who are looking to uh, 
uh, expand their game of golf as well as in life. Thank you for uh, your time uh, and, uh, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much, Mr. Kim. We appreciate the time you took to come and speak with us. Ron Pooley, uh, again on item D1. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Ron Pulley. I'm a Chicago resident, first team board member, and a father of four young children who attend the CPS schools, um, South Loop Elementary and Jones College Prep. I've been involved with the first team since 2016, and my kids have been in the program since 2014. It's a great, well-run organization whose primary mission is to positively impact the lives of Chicago youth by teaching life skills and values through the game of golf. Um, I feel like as a parent, it's my job to give my kids experiences and opportunities for growth. And the first T is a great resource for our family to do just that. Um, Lee and her staff can get into the project. Essentially the first phase was the internal clubhouse, which includes both a golf simulator and a learning area. The second phase we're seeking approval on is for the chipping and putting green, as the prior speaker said. Um, when phase one was completed earlier this summer, the grand opening was attended by the police chief, the aldermen, uh, some Chicago Park District officials, parents, kids, and other members of the community. And I think this is just an example of the network of support for this project. Um, the first T is seeking approval for the second phase um, so that they can do programming when the weather permits outside. Um, just to touch on how this helps the community, I think this is a great example of how a nonprofit organization can partner with the city to create a positive developmental opportunity for Chicago youth. Um, given all the challenges we've experienced as a city over the last two years, be it gun violence, job losses, remote learning, social distancing restrictions, I count this as a positive contributor or a piece to the puzzle to kind of pull our community back together. And I just wanted to share my support for the project I think it's a great opportunity to provide a safe space for kids to grow and develop life skills that will serve them well in whatever path they choose to follow. Um, that completes my prepared remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pulley. Appreciate your time. On items D2, Butler Adams, followed by John Hessler. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Butler Adams, and I am speaking on Agenda D5. I am in favor of this proposal for 1112 West Carroll Actually, and 315 uh, okay. North May. I did submit a letter of support. Um, I'll just read that very quickly. Uh, I wrote a letter in support of this project. Uh, I have been following this uh, project for several months, once it was soon uh, dropped off of the zoning committee. Uh, oh, dog. A few comments on the design of the base of the office building is much more integrated with the tower from above. This is one of the first projects that went before the new design committee. And I do think that that was beneficial in helping to tweak this project. I think there's an overall better flow. The torque of the office building has been reversed from its previous iteration and now provides more setbacks and terraces with south facing views. This would help with uh, plantings and sustainability of the project in general. Some modifications of the residential building for me personally are a bit disappointing. Architecturally, it seems a little bit more watered down than the previous version, though I will say uh, the green space has been more enhanced. But I do like uh, the base of the previous uh, iteration of the residential building if the developers and architects are listening. Um, I'm going to quote myself from a letter that I submitted back in February of 2021 regarding the FMID, uh, the Fulton Market uh, District area, Innovation District. Uh, many comments have been asked about green space in this area, and it's my understanding the city doesn't own any land in the area, um, uh, making public parks challenging, leaving this to uh, developers is concerning, and it's challenging uh, if, there's a, if there isn't compromise. Encouraging taller and thinner buildings along with underground parking may be a beginning. That was my response to some comments. And this is what I'm talking about. This project does exactly what I was hoping it would do. A lot of the parking is underground, uh, the buildings are taller and thinner that allows for more green space and open space for the public to in fact enjoy so more of this please in the area so i do support this project uh, just a few additional uh, uh comments um the elevated green space overlooking the metro tra metro tracks is more of a berm and not a bluff and at some of the previous meetings they were calling kind of a bluff but i will, will say that like trainers and watchers will come to appreciate that space um, I'm loving the fact that the Metro tracks and L tracks are being, being canyonized in the area. 
um, the uh, if there is if there is not a density bonus for placing parking underground, there should be, and if there is one, it should be enhanced because there are too many projects who aren't doing what this project is doing, and this is a very good example of what should be happening. Um, I I know there's, there's some concerns about height and density, but again, this is in within the expanded area of the central area. So there are no height limits in DX zoning and a more density puts more eyes on the street and that helps with safety. So I like this project. I'd like to see more of it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, John Hessler followed by Michael Braun. John Hessler, are you here? Michael Braun. John Hester is here. John, you're un unmuted. We can't hear you, Mr. Hessler. Can you hear me now? We can. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is John Hassler. I'm a resident of Fulton. Um, I moved up to Chicago to open another office for our venture capital firm. We specifically chose the Fulton area to open our office and begin to hire our team, just given the growth the area is, the area is experiencing. Um, I've been closely following the 315 North May and 1112 West Carroll project through the entitlements, uh, and I wanted to voice my strong support for the project. Uh, they've been very receptive to feedback along the way from residents. Um, our firm is very excited to have uh, new working and living space available, and we're really excited to have the park, not to mention that this is a public park on private land. Um, also excited that this is outside the historic district. We think this will be a positive for our neighborhood and support its continued growth. Um, and just wanted to share our strong support. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hessler. Hessler. Uh, Michael Braun, followed by Nina Munoz. I want to encourage speakers to, as soon as I call your name, to unmute yourself and speak. Thank you, Madam Chairman. It takes a second with the delay, but um, my name is Michael Braun. I am a new resident to the Fulton Market District. I think I will speak kind contrary to the last two topics stated and show my displeasure in the current standing of the plans for 315 North May and 1112 West Carroll. Um, my concerns really stem from three primary points, one being infrastructure and supporting uh, roads, sidewalks, parks, school systems, et cetera, not being set up for this scale of development number of residents this will bring in and the size of the office space the surrounding area does not support that influx of people especially with the developments already approved and underway the second primary piece is the preservation of culture of the fulton market district um, simply put these new developments do not fit in with the surrounding area um, it's it's a vibrant scene of old charm meets new design and these two large developments are um, developments that would stick out like a sore thumb. The final point that I have to make and is near and dear to my heart is the neighborhood carbon impact of these developments. Um, and so the development of these taller buildings in a neighborhood where there are not these tall buildings renders on-site electricity generation pretty much useless due to the shading from the 33 and 26 story structures. So solar lighting, solar panels, other solar appliances, no longer available for use in surrounding buildings. In addition, the taller the building is, the less likely that any on-site generation can offset the electrical use of the space. Um, so it's gonna essentially create a large carbon footprint increase for the neighborhood. Um, in an age when net neutrality pledges are being made across the world, building these skyscrapers where there currently are none is reckless and irresponsible from my perspective. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Appreciate it. Um, Nina Munoz, followed by Sarah Nelson. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I sure can. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair, and all the commissioners today for the opportunity to speak. My name is Nina Munoz. I'm a member of Neighbors of West Loop and the West Loop Community Organization. I'm also a property owner in Fulton Market and I've lived in Chicago my entire professional career. Today, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and the dozens of property and business owners in West Loop Fulton Market who I've personally spoken with 
over the past several weeks regarding the proposed developments at 315 North May and 1112 West Carroll. There are numerous reasons why we strongly oppose these developments, but I will focus on two, the Fulton Market Design Guidelines and safety. The 315 North May development is adjacent to Fulton Market Historic District on two sides, nearly three. And as per the Fulton Market Design Guidelines, which was negotiated with all stakeholders in good faith, any building adjacent to the Fulton Market Historic District needs to be proportionate, which is clearly not the case with these developments. So far, all developments adjacent to the Fulton Market Historic District have been that, limiting height to 10 to 14 floors. The proposed development is a violent breach of that agreement framework. There should be absolutely no buildings of this size adjacent on two sides to the Fulton Market Historic District. Placing a 26 or 24 story building that is nearly as wide as the entire lot next to numerous three and four story buildings is a slap in the face and sets the precedent that there are actually no guidelines. The second point I will touch on is safety. With the buildings of this size, the foundation needs to be dug very deep, think dozens of feet into the ground. And in the case of these developments, just a handful of feet away from various 100 year old structures where people live and work. There is no doubt that there will be a good amount of seismic activity happening. This is incredibly dangerous and it is also the quickest way to erode the preservation of the Fulton Market Historic District. Nobody wants another Miami situation, and that is exactly what these developments are asking for. Lastly, so everyone on the call is aware, two days ago, I scanned and sent a physical petition with dozens of wet signatures from residents and workers in West Loop asking the city not to allow this development. This petition outlined why acceptable changes and was sent to Alderman Burnett, CPC, DPD, and the 27th Ward. It needs to be on record that the people of West Loop are practically begging the decision makers in the city not to allow these, de these developments to move forward. And if you vote in favor of these developments, you are voting against your constituents. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Munoz. And Sarah Nelson next. Hi, can you hear me? You can. Perfect. Hi, I'm Sarah Nelson. I am a Fulton Market resident. I've been here for about the last five years, currently at Lake and Halstead. And I just wanted to take a minute to express my excitement and support for the um, Carolyn May proposed development. I think this is a beautiful modern design that keeps in line with the rich architectural tradition that Chicago is known for. While um, it's placed, I think the towers are appropriately placed outside of the historic district. I think it pays um, homage to the historic district behind it while pointing towards the innovative future of Chicago with its modern design and bringing a piece of that skyline out and pointing towards that. I think another great part about this is um, we all know there's a lack of green space in the area and um, it's very evident and it would be an incredible value to the public, especially being privately funded. Um, it would be an amazing ad for residents and visitors to the area or like good friends too. So thank you for the thoughtful design and I uh, fully support this. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Butler Adams and Kevin Drever, or Drever, uh, you will uh, pronounce your name correctly for me, Kevin, to speak on item D3, Mr. Adams. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Mr. Adams. Okay, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Again, my name is Butler Adams. Uh, I am in favor of this uh, particular project in the West Loop. Again, uh, this is more office space in the West Loop area. This is going to be catering more towards a lab space. And there are companies who are really, really wanting more lab space in the city. This is in an area that's really, truly growing. Again, this is still a part of the central area. Um, you are going to get some comments, I'm pretty sure, against this project in terms, again, of the height and density. Well, again, I will just remind everyone this is within the central area expansion district, so there are no height limits and density has been encouraged by the city. Um, and speaking of uh, being smacked down, I just want to say thanks to the Alderman for also being able, being able to push back on some of the negative negativity when it comes to these projects and when it comes to certain neighborhood groups or perhaps um, uh, uh, condo boards who may want to assert themselves in different ways. So I want to say just thank you to the Alderman for being able to push back when so many other Aldermen uh, can't do that. In terms of the design of this project, I mean, I don't see it as being anything special architecturally. I mean, it's a nice project, but as soon as I saw it, 
initially at the one of the first public meetings i saw you know the same buildings on uh the loyola loyola campus on the north side because it's the same architect scb but again this is a nice addition to the area in terms of transportation this is an area where they're talking about perhaps building a brand new metro station so that's going to bring uh, more opportunities and way of ingress and egress of people into that into the area so i think it's a good project and this is helping this area certainly grow and i certainly hope that the city considers again extending uh that central area expansion it's a little bit further west i know there's a, a plan manu manufacturing district further west but seeing as right now the city just signed contracts for the Damon Avenue stop. They have an avenue, avenue stop on the Green Line that brings more potential for growth further west along the Green Line. And there's so much land potential in that area. Bringing some more density and zoning to allow that density, I think, would be beneficial. But for this project, again, thumbs up for it. I'm liking what I'm seeing in the West Loop. I never really expected to see stuff this big, but hey, I'm all for this more tax money for the city, and that helps everyone. So uh, thank you for your time and good luck. Thank you, Kevin Trevor. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Yeah. My name is Kevin Drever. In relation to 400 North Elizabeth Street, I speak today not only for myself and the residents in the three-story condo building where I live, but also for many residents that live within 250 feet and in the immediate vicinity of 400 North Elizabeth Street. The area along Hubbard, bounded by Noble Street to the west and Halstead Street to the east, is a residential community. The buildings are largely two, three, four, and five story structures. And this is also true for the streets that intersect Hubbard between Noble and Halstead, like Elizabeth. Uh, these buildings are single family, duplex, condo buildings, and townhomes. As someone who lives within 250 feet of this property, and as a 16 year resident of the neighborhood, I know this location well. It is one of the more unique parcels of land in this area that may come before the commission. I say this because it abuts, um, this property abuts railroad tracks and train viaducts on two sides, which naturally limit the accessibility to this location. It is clearly not situated on a standard city block where access to the property might be achieved from two, three or four different streets or sides. These physical barriers represent a major impediment to achieving commercial vehicle access to this proposed office building without causing material detrimental impact to the residents in this area. Many of the residents in this small nook of the city love Chicago and want to see the city and their neighborhood improve and prosper. We are not anti-development. We ask you, Madam Chair and commissioners, as stewards entrusted with ch charting our city's future development, that you look closely at the nature of this location and how this proposed development will impact pedestrian safety and traffic congestion for the residents that live in this West Town community. Given the prominence of residential properties in this area, a residential use for this parcel might make sense. Having said that, if an office building is to be constructed, I would ask that you not recommend a downtown zoning equivalent to DX 8.1, but rather recommend DX3 zoning with a 1.0 FAR bonus to be permitted. Such a modification would still help the city to, to pursue the, the goal of job creation and would also still grant the developer the opportunity to design and build a structure that will allow for their purpose of a life science office building without imposing a structure whose density and magnitude will have destructive and lasting impacts on this community. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, let me go next to uh, the next item. Um, next speaker for items D5 is uh, Adrian Soto followed by Dixon Galvez Searle. Great, first off, I'd like to thank Madam Chair Teresa Cordova, Chicago Plan Commissioners, and President Alderman for the opportunity to speak on the, the Claire Courts project. My name is Adrian Soto, and I'm Executive Director of Greater Southwest Development Corporation, or better known as GSDC. Uh, I'm a lifelong Southwest Side resident, and during the mid-1990s attended middle school at Tanti Branch on 49th and Laporte, right behind the, the, the Claire Courts project. 
Uh, GSDC is a community development agency based on the southwest side of Chicago, whose primary goal is to improve the quality of life in southwest side Chicago through entrepreneurial, commercial, and residential real estate development, as well as a variety of business and residential services. And on behalf of GSDC, I'd like to express our support for the development plan proposed by the Clare Partners for the Redevelopment of Public Housing Land. The scope of this development has the potential to inject new life and opportunities for area nonprofits, local small businesses, Chicago residents, and visitors alike. We are excited that this project will create a high number of temporary and permanent jobs for local residents, and we're also excited to assist local businesses, particularly women, minority, and veteran-owned certified businesses to ensure that they have an opportunity to work and benefit from this project. GSDC's opportunity to engage in a robust partnership with LeClaire Partners will allow Southwest Side residents full transparency on the project from a trusted community partner, as well as support LeClaire Partners as they seek to deliver on community promises. GSDC is prepared to hold LeClaire Partners accountable should the project begin to, begin to stray from its community commitments. So in summary and short, we endorse this project and we urge the Chicago Plan Commission to improve this redevelopment plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Soto. Dixon Galvez Searle, followed by Jaime Gorth Searle. Or maybe that's Jamie. She'll, he or she will correct me. Go ahead, Mr. Galvez Searle. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? We can. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, my name is Dixon Galvez Searle. I am a 11 year resident of Archer Heights, um, just to the east of the proposed LeClaire Courts redevelopment um, and a lifelong resident of Chicago. And I wanted to voice my support for the uh, LeClaire Courts redevelopment. Um, we've seen, uh, I've attended a number of public meetings um, that the developers and uh, the aldermen and some community groups have hosted. Um, I've been encouraged by the plans that I've seen so far. Um, we've been able to pose questions to the developers um, as a follow-up, uh, as part of a community group that I sit on the board of, the Southwest Collective. Um, and we're encouraged by the fact that they are um, soliciting feedback from community organizations and from individuals as well. Um, I would encourage um, the developers to continue to prioritize feedback, um, particularly from residents of the Hearst community um, who are immediately adjacent to the proposed development um, and also from residents of Sleepy Hollow um, immediately across Cicero Avenue um, and the Vidim Park community, which is immediately across 47th Street. Um, a few elements of the project that I'm particularly excited about um, is the inclusion of a federally qualified health center. Uh, this is going to be crucial for the Southwest side um, for the immediate vicinity, but for the larger Southwest side as well. Um, I'll note that one of the larger um, health facilities uh, in the vicinity, um, a three-story Mercy Medical Clinic at 55th and Pulaski was recently closed um, and that nothing has opened up in its place. So a federally qualified health center um, would be welcome and um, would definitely be, be used by residents in the area. Um, I was encouraged by um, the inclusion of a grocery store as well. Um, that's going to be crucial. And for uh, on-site childcare um, near the, uh, the two residential towers uh, that are planned. Um, I also see great potential um, for this to spur commerce on Cicero Avenue. Um, if commerce on Cicero between I-55 um, and 47th Street and then further south to Midway Airport, was simply a matter of traffic, um, then the area would be booming, um, but it's obviously not. Uh, this development will bring um, you know, a, a number of residents um, and a number of businesses to a location that uh, is currently vacant lots. Um, and I'm also excited at the prospect of um, you know, development immediately outside and adjacent to um, the proposed redevelopment. Uh, such as improvements, um, the um, uh, potential for a metro station at Cicero, improvements to LeClaire Court's Hearst Park, the possibility for a traffic light at 45th Street in Cicero, which would ease um, walkability, especially from the east to west side of Cicero. Thank you um, so much. Thank you so much. Your time is up. You want to just say, uh, uh, wrap up with, a, with five seconds? 
Um, nope, that was it, just to reiterate my support. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, next is it's either Jaime or Jamie Gorth Searle, followed by Joanne Williams. Uh, Madam Chair, I don't see uh, Jaime okay. or Jamie Gorth Searle. All right, thank you. We'll go on to Joanne Williams then. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. My name is Joanne Williams. Thank you for having me today. I'm president and founder of the Hearst Community Organization Incorporated in 1987, an IRS 501c3 corporation named after the local elementary school, PB Everson Hearst. I've lived in this community for 54 years. I'm a U.S. Army disabled veteran, former resident of LeClaire and worked in LeClaire as their economic development director. We are homeowners who reside adjacent to LeClaire and have partnered with LeClaire residents on various community issues before it was torn down 10 years ago. My community, we moved into LeClaire in the mid 1960s when I was a preteen. It was primarily a black community of hardworking blue collar residents consisting of parents who stressed the quality of education to their children. Their occupations were postal workers, bus drivers, registered nurses, factory and steel workers. We were surrounded by white residents who live where I live now in Hearst who were Polish, Lithuanian and generally Eastern European. Many residents declare at that time could have qualified to buy homes but buying a home had the, the sales contracts had discriminatory uh, uh, contract which had in them do not sell to Negroes. And it was only after the passage of President Johnson's Fair Housing Act in 1968 that Blacks could buy homes and many former LeClaire residents bought homes in the Hearst community, including my mother in 1970, where I now live across the street from Hearst Elementary School where I graduated. I graduated with white, Black, and Hispanic children at that time. When we moved into Hearst, we were subject to harassment by our white neighbors, firecrackers in our mailbox, used sanitary napkins, tampons, and tea bags thrown in our backyard. Our metal garbage can was set on fire. It wasn't until I borrowed my mother, my brother-in-law's shotgun in a case and removed it from my mother's car in sight of our white neighbors that the harassment stopped. I was 16 years old. As children, we survived the many race riots at Kennedy High School. A reporter in the newspaper referred to, uh, after one of the riots, referred to LeClaire as an island community. LeClaire was a village with a small town atmosphere where the adults could discipline you even if parents were not around. Many of us went on to pursue careers in the trades, obtained college degrees and advanced degrees such as myself. And there were many others who became professionals, teachers, doctors, lawyers, and, and one airline pilot. LeClaire began to decline in the 1980s when the crack cocaine epidemic hit and CHA allowed people of questionable character to move into LeClaire. As a resident of over a half a century, I fully support this development phase one and look forward to working with the developer on a community benefits agreement for LeClaire and other residents for, for fair economic participation during other phases of the project. I would, like to, uh, I would like the community to return to It Takes a Village and a supportive family community. We support this project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming to speak. I was really hoping that somebody who'd been a previous resident of LeClaire Courts would, would weigh in on it. So. Very much appreciate um, hearing your voice. That completes the, the list of those who completed speaking forms. Next on the agenda, uh, and thanks to everyone who came down or got online to, to speak with us. Next on the agenda are matters submitted in accordance with the Interagency Planning Referral Act. Do I have a motion to approve item number one under the negotiated sale heading and item number two under the disposition heading as a reminder Item one under the disposition heading was deferred to next month. Uh, uh, so did I, okay, uh, that was, uh, was that Commissioner Lyons? Commissioner Lyons seconded by? Commissioner Moore. Thank you very much, commissioners. Commissioner, Bia I'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Biagi? Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld? Yes. Commissioner Burnett? Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Commissioner Flores? Yes. Commissioner Garza? Yes. Commissioner Pinero? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Commissioner Moore? Yes. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Commissioner Novada? Yes. I'd also like to note for the record that Commissioner Barkley arrived in the meeting at 1020. Uh, Commissioner Barkley? Yes. Commissioner Dreyas? Yes. Commissioner Searle? Yes. Commissioner Shaw. For 2019. Commissioner uh, uh, Villegas. Yes. 
Thank you very much. Motion uh, passes. Now we will move on to the public hearing presentation portion for matters submitted in accordance with the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance and or the Chicago Zoning Ordinance. First item on the agenda is D1, a proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance application submitted by the Chicago Park District for the property generally located at 3701 North Recreation Drive. The property is zoned POS-1 and is within the public use zone of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection District. The applicant is proposing to construct a golf practice area with both natural and artificial turf surfaces, including putting greens, chipping areas, and sand bunker area at the Sydney R. Marovitz Golf Course, located in Lincoln Park along the lakefront. Paul Rees will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Go ahead, Mr. Rees. Great, thank you. Um, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Planning Commission. For the record, my name is Paul Reese with the Department of Planning and Development. The applicant, Chicago Parks, um, Chicago Parks Department is here today, represented by Heather Gleason, Leah Jesse for First Tee, and Todd Quitno, the landscape architect. The applicant is proposing to construct a golf practice area with both natural and artificial turf surf surfaces, including putting greens, chipping area, and sand bunker area at the Morowitz Golf Course. This request is being submitted for review by the Chicago Planning Commission pursuant to Title 16, Section 16-4-100 of the Municipal Code of Chicago. Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance Application Number 761 submitted by the Park District for the property generally located at 3701 North Recreation Drive is located within the Lakeview community area and within the 46th Ward. The site is in Lincoln Park in the city's North Planning Region and within the public use zone of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection District. The site is zoned POS1 Regional Park District and no zoning changes are being sought. According to CMAP's community snapshot data, the Lakeview community area has a total population of just over 103,000 people made up of 78% white, 4% black, 9% Hispanic, and 7% Asian. Asian. The median income for this area is just over $92,000. For the next several slides, Heather Gleason of the Park District will provide additional details on the proposal. Thank you so much. Good morning, commissioners. For the record, my name is Heather Gleason. I'm the Director of Planning and Development for the Chicago Park District. First, we'd like to thank the department, our project manager, Paul Reese, and Noah Safranik for their assistance with this item. So as Paul mentioned, the item before you is a lakefront protection application uh, that we submitted in August for exterior work to a portion of Lincoln Park at the Sydney Marovitz Golf Course in order to provide outdoor learning space for our youth golf program run by the First Tee organization. We'll get into further details about the project in a moment, but we just wanted to highlight the community meetings that we undertook throughout the summer of 2021 on this project. We held five meetings total, starting in June and continuing through July and August with a series of open houses at the Waveland Golf Course in their new clubhouse space for the public to start to understand what we are proposing for the outdoor space here. We also hosted sessions during our Park District Summer Camp in August. And then in September, we also held a session with the Lincoln Park Advisory Council, which is the community group that represents Lincoln Park with the Park District, um, where this proposed project is based. We also work very closely with Alderman Kappelman's office to keep him apprised of all of our community outreach and we really appreciate his support of this project. The most significant change that we made to the site plan as a result of all the community outreach that we did really involved redesigning the outdoor space to preserve and enlarge space around two memorial trees. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Park District has a memorial tree program. It's called our Green Deed uh, Program, and that allows people to plant memorial trees to purchase them um, in someone's honor or to commemorate an event. Um, and this particular space did have two of those trees. The Park District and our partner, First Tee, worked very closely with the families who, did, who donated these trees to us um, to ensure that as part of the design, they were preserved and protected. Next slide, please. Thank you. So for those of you who aren't aware of the First Tee organization, um, the Chicago Park District has had a partnership with this nonprofit organization focused on teaching youth the game of golf for more than 20 years. First Tee is a really important partner for the Park District in reaching out to our youth um, throughout our communities and providing fun, safe, and engaging recreational programming through learning the game of golf um, throughout the city of Chicago. 
And with that, if we could move to the next slide, I'd like to introduce Leah Jesse, the Executive Director of the First T Organization to explain their project and their program. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And for the record, I'm Leah Jesse, CEO of First T Greater Chicago. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners for having us today. So as, as Heather pointed out, um, we do offer programming all throughout uh, Chicagoland and that's really important to us. So you can see we are on the north side, the west side and the south side and that many of these facilities where we offer our programming our Chicago Park District facilities. So it's a, it's a really important um, partnership for us and we'll continue to be going forward as we expand into other parts of the city. So just a little bit about First Tee, as Heather pointed out, we are a nonprofit. We've been around for about 20 years. Uh, we exist to help kids build their resilience and their strength of character through the game of golf. And um, I think no time in our kids' lives has that been more important than the past few years. Um, you know, a lot of our programming is centered around helping kids to manage through stress and anxiety. And we use golf as a vehicle to teach them those coping mechanisms and those skills. We provide year round indoor outdoor programming. And as you all know, as Chicago residents, um, you know, our, our weather can be a challenge sometimes. And so in order to provide indoor programming, facilities like this youth facility are gonna be really important for us so that we can provide year round educational programming. And it really expands beyond the game of golf um, looking at uh, opportunities to bring the kids in for special opportunities like workshops, career readiness, financial literacy, um, special events, mentorship play dates, all sorts of things. Um, really, the goal here is to, oh, sorry, can we go? Can we go back one second? Um, uh, just one other point I wanted to make is just that the goal here is, is to reach kids of all backgrounds. And so the way that we do that with our programming is we provide our programs free of charge to kids who cannot afford it. And we also provide uh, the transportation and the equipment. So in that way, our programming is, is accessible to all. So as you can see here, this is showing the phase two outdoor practice area on the left. Um, on the right, you can see the kids are playing in, in a field nearby. Um, this, you know, this outdoor practice facility is going to be very important for us. It's going to allow us to expand our program schedule significantly, whereas now we can have full day and half day summer camps we can provide them um, very affordable. And as I mentioned before, for kids who cannot afford, we provide free of charge. We can do this programming six days a week throughout the entire um, outdoor season. And we believe that when this facility is fully up and running, uh, that's, that is when both phase one and phase two are complete, that we could serve an additional 400 to 500 kids per year at this facility. And these would be kids that are coming, um, not just from the immediate surrounding area, but we take pride in partnering with Chicago public schools and other youth serving organizations throughout the city in order to um, bring our programming to, to kids from, from all areas. And so um, Waveland will certainly be a big part of that. So with that, I will introduce Todd Quitnow. He's our architect for phase two from Loman Quitnow. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Leah. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners uh, for your time today. Um, for the record, my name is Todd Quitno. I am the Vice President and Senior Architect for Loman Quitno Golf Course Architects and the Golf Course Architect for the First Tee. Um, I'm going to walk you through the, the project. Uh, we'll start here with a little bit of uh, larger context. Um, our work area for the Outdoor Learning Center is at the Sydney R. Maravitz Golf Course. Um, for those not familiar with the golf course location, it basically sits east of um, Lakeshore Drive, north of Addison, and south of Irving Park. And we're in the southeast corner of the golf course property. Um, next slide, please. As mentioned earlier by Paul, the current zoning is POS1, and that will remain the same. Next slide, please. Um, just dialing into the site a little bit more, you'll see on the left, uh, this is the red 
boundary is the limits of the current Sydney R. Maravitz golf course. And our project site is the yellow uh, down in the southeast corner. And it's immediately east of the old cl uh, clock tower building, the old clubhouse to the golf course. Next slide, please. To give you a little context, uh, this is some photography from the site. So the, the inset photo at the bottom left is actually from the entry drive and the parking area to the golf course looking to the northeast. Uh, this is the clock tower building and the clubhouse. And on that south end uh, nearest us is where the phase one clubhouse renovations were completed. And then the, the panoramic view at the top is on the other side of the building. So we're standing on the east side of the building on the um, old terrace uh, looking east kind of northeast towards the lake and you'll see the site is currently characterized by um, some open grassland areas some spatter a spattering of trees uh, you'll see a, a building in the background is the old starter shack for the golf course um, and then the first tee for the the nine hole courses there in the background next slide please this is an aerial view looking from the south um, looking north, uh, you'll see the, the yellow outlined areas where our project site is. Um, next slide. Um, so just a little bit about uh, the existing area versus what we're proposing, and then we'll, we'll dial into the proposed here in a minute. The, the area that we're talking about is currently used uh, to some degree for golf functions. Uh, the asphalt area and some of the, the staging and paths around that are used for golfers when they're warming up or getting ready to play the golf course. You'll sometimes see people chipping balls in the open turf area. And then there's also a maintenance path on the east side of, of the, the dotted lines. If you're looking at the left image that the maintenance for the golf course utilizes to get up to the nine hole course. And we will be maintaining that. Um, next slide. So a little bit of detail about our proposal. Um, this all centers around this uh, big central green. If you look at the kind of the bottom of the slide here, it's, it says synthetic green. It looks a little, little bit like the profile of a whale, um, but this is a large 8,500 square foot putting and chipping green made of synthetic artificial turf. Um, and then uh, the purpose of it is to practice putting. Um, the, the idea behind the, the overall facility is that the first tee will use uh, these areas for five to 10 kids at a time in programmed learning, whether it's chipping or putting or full swing uh, play. And so this green will accommodate a few functions. Um, there'll be a putting course throughout the, the entirety of it, but it'll also be used for the practicing and learning of chipping and pitching. And so the darker green area that surrounds the synthetic green you'll see is labeled as synthetic fairway. Um, that's just another like taller height of grass uh, to emulate a, a golf course fairway chipping area. Um, and that's for practice and, and gathering and learning. Um, a couple of other ancillary features along the green. On the right side, you'll see a kind of a kidney bean shaped uh, yellow area. That's a sand proposed practice sand bunker for learning sand shots, very similar to what they would find on the golf course. And then to the, to the north of the synthetic fairway, we'll be providing a, a natural turf fair, uh, fairway area uh, irrigated where um, some of our more advanced students will be able to play off of real grass to this uh, synthetic green. And so I'll kind of work my way clockwise up, nope, stay there uh, for the rest. In the, in the bottom left corner, uh, we're proposing uh, uh, what we call hitting cages. So this will be uh, screened on three sides and then across the top with netting. Um, for full swing practice. Um, and we'll also have a windscreen around the outside to kind of uh, to camouflage it with some landscaping around. Um, I, I, there's also a, a fence that you'll see at the bottom of the screen uh, to be placed, fence net to be placed behind the synthetic green so we can maintain safe separation from the, uh, the public path that, that is right there at the bottom of the screen. Um, as we kind of rotate up north, You'll see two natural turf putting greens, each somewhere around 3,000 to 3,500 square feet. Uh, we have two greens so that there can be programmed use on one of these greens. And then the other green will be uh, utilized by the golfing public, something they don't have currently at Maravitz. So that north putting green is basically in the location of the current first tee. And so we'll actually be moving that number one tee 
to the northeast. You can see it at the top of the slide to accommodate that putting green. And then uh, within the area, we have a, a patio space at the center that's right next to that starter building that I pointed out earlier. And on the east side, you'll see we're maintaining vehicular maintenance path for uh, the, the club or uh, golf course maintenance equipment. Next slide, please. Uh, as far as circulation through the site, we're maintaining all of the access that's there now. The fire access uh, occurs at the bottom here along that service path that also takes pedestrians out to the lakefront. We'll be maintaining that. Um, we'll be maintaining the golf maintenance up to the, the nine hole course. And in terms of ADA access, um, we actually made some improvements during phase one. Um, there's a drop off area to the west of the clubhouse. And now there's a new ramp that takes you up to a corridor that kind of runs through the clubhouse uh, and will take you out to this practice area. And then from the, exist, the, the terrace, which was improved with phase one, we'll actually ramp down um, to our, uh, our practice area. Uh, in terms of landscaping, as uh, Heather had mentioned, we preserved um, as many trees as possible and we will be very conscious of that during construction. Um, we have uh, proposing some landscape expansions, um, basically taking what's out there and enhancing it, uh, extending some of the hedge lines just to create some framing, um, low maintenance planting, something that matches what's there. And then I had already mentioned uh, a little bit of safety netting uh, to make sure that we have safe separation from the public path that's at the south end of the property. So this is an, a proposed after view, standing again at this, the terrace, similar to where we were with the existing view. And you'll see right out in front of us on the right side is that main synthetic uh, putting green, chipping green with synthetic fairway. You'll see it kind of wraps around the trees. As you look to the right side of the, the image here, you'll see the proposed uh, fencing. And then as you kind of look from the middle of the, the picture here to the left, that's the uh, natural turf putting green. Um, you'll see an existing stone wall that's out there right now that will remain. And that will kind of, uh, on the other side of that wall will be where the, the public putting green uh, for the, the, Mer the nine hole mayor of its users and the first tee will exist. And you'll see right in front of us here, some security lighting that'll all remain intact. That's actually already out there. Next slide. Uh, this project will meet uh, Chicago Park District MBE and WE requirements, and we're looking to actually exceed those requirements. Uh, and with that, I will hand it back to Paul to wrap up. Thank you, Mr. Quintano. Um, again, my name is Paul Reese with TPD. TPD has reviewed the project material submitted by the applicant and has concluded that this proposal is in compliance with the applicable policies of the Lakefront Plan of Chicago and the purposes of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance as they apply to development in the public use zone. Specifically, policy two, maintain and enhance the character of the Lakeshore Park by improving and expanding the quality of recreational programming and the overall use of the section of the Lakefront Park System. Policy four, preserve the cultural and historic heritage enhancing by enhancing the existing golf course with new facilities providing youth focused activities. And policy 10, ensure the relationship between the Lake Shore Park and the community by preserving existing connections to the park pathway system and that ultimately provides access to the lake and other, and other lakefront parks. With respect to the policies and purposes not enumerated here, TPD has determined that they are either not applicable to development in the public use zone or that the proposed project will not have a detrimental effect on the Lake Michigan shoreline or any wildlife habit habitats therein. Therefore, TPD recommends that this application being in conformance with the provisions of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance be approved subject to the compliance and plan with the plans and exhibits as presented to you today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reese. Uh, do commissioners have any questions of staff or of the applicants? Uh, Commissioner Reyes. Yeah, apologies if I missed it. So what I understand is this is uh, an improvement that the Chicago Park District is going to do on this golf course. So I, who managed it, the Chicago Park District or is, an, or, or is the organization that uh, uh, the lady spoke early about? That's the piece that I don't quite understand. Sure, I can answer that. Um, 
Thank you for the question, Commissioner. So um, the First Tee organization has an agreement with the Chicago Park District to manage this program. They are undertaking this construction project um, at our behest and in partnership with us. So um, that is, they are paying for it. Um, they are, you know, promoting the plans and we have uh, sent it through a park district review as well to make sure that they're in conformance with our policies. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. So, so it's land that is the Chicago Park District, but because of this partnership that we have with them, they are the, the ones that actually are paying for these improvements. That's correct. And providing okay. programming to our youth. Um, okay, our so I want to ask them then more about the percentage of children that do not, cannot pay, uh, and then what are the agreements or the partnerships that they have with the Chicago Public Schools? Sure, so I can take that. So um, for the record, again, Leah Jesse, CEO of First Sea Greater Chicago. Um, so in, we have uh, two different facets of our program. So we have the, the direct enrollment programming, which is the junior golf life skills programming. And we also have what's called community outreach programming. And that's where we're partnering with, um, as I mentioned, Chicago public schools, other youth serving organizations to bring the kids to us free of charge. So if you kind of break that down, um, roughly speaking, I would say, um, two thirds of those kids. And this is sort of what's going on right now with COVID as well, just because Chicago public schools the past few years, we haven't been able to do as much programming with um, as they haven't been in person. So as of right now, roughly two thirds of those kids are in that direct enrollment program. And of those kids, I would say um, close to 10 to 15% are applying for the, the financial aid and, and receiving programming free of charge. Um, but when you look at the rest of those kids, so the, the, the remaining third that are part of those community outreach programming, those are all a part, uh, those are all free of charge. So we're looking at in, in totality right now, about 2000 to 2,500 kids annually who are coming through these programs. I think it's important for us to know that and appreciate these, uh, these details because Truly, this is uh, an asset that belongs to the entire community and is, is in the hands of the Chicago Park District. I appreciate the almost a million dollar that you're putting into this as an investment, but that's why I think it's important that we also see how the large, at large, the community, our kids can benefit from this. So, so no, no child is turned away from our programming uh, due to inability to pay. Thank you, I appreciate that. And what are the ages again? For this participation? Ages, starting at age seven, all the way up to 18. Great, okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, seeing uh, no more comments from questioners, I mean, from commissioners, let me ask, uh, is Alderman Kappelman here? Or is, does he have a, do we have a letter on file? Chairwoman, he left a letter. I didn't see him make it into the meeting. Okay, and the letter is in support? In support, correct. Okay, great. All right, well, seeing no other questions, do I have a motion? Uh, for approval of this proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance application submitted by the Chicago Park District to the gen property generally located at 3701 North Recreation Drive, finding that it meets the requirements for approval. So move. Second by Garza. A move by Commissioner Reyes, seconded by Commissioner Garza. Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Yes. Commissioner Cordova, yes. Commissioner Cox? Uh, yes. Commissioner Flores? Yes. Commissioner Garza? Yes. Commissioner Pinero? Yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Commissioner Moore? Yes. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Commissioner Novara? Yes. Commissioner Barkley? Yes. Commissioner Reyes? I said yes already. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, all right, so I'm um, going in order of the roll call here. Commissioner Searle? Yes. Commissioner Shaw? Yes. Commissioner Villegas? Yes. Okay. Commissioner Tunney is here for the quorum and also a yes vote on Recreation Drive. Thank you, Commissioner Tunney. Uh, glad Thank you're here. Thanks. Uh, motion Joanne, I passes. think you missed uh, Commissioner Murphy. I thought I saw. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Murphy? Uh, I'm a yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
All right, uh, great, motion passes, congratulations. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, next item on the agenda, D2, a proposed residential business plan development submitted by Tramel Crow Chicago Development Incorporated for the property generally located at 315 North May Street and 1112 West Carroll Avenue. The applicant is proposing to rezone the site from M2-3 light industry manufacturing to a DX-7 downtown mixed use district. Prior to establishing residential business plan development to permit the construction oh, of it's a PowerPoint. development consisting of two high rise buildings, a 410 foot tall 26 story mixed use office and commercial building containing 184 parking spaces, 650,000 square feet of office in sub areas A and 15,000 square feet of commercial space at 315 North May with a 370 foot tall, 33 story mixed use building containing 377 resident residential units, 96 parking spaces, open space and ground floor commercial and retail uses at 1112 West Carroll together with accessory and incidental uses. A 4.5 floor area bonus will be taken and the overall FAR of the plan development will be 11.5. This is in the this is 207, 20707 and this is in the 27th ward. Fernando Espinosa will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Mr. Espinosa. Tech support, can you please make sure Fernando has the ability to share his screen? Good morning, Chairwoman and Planning Commissioners. With slight technicality, give me one minute. Okay, can you see my screen? You can. Okay. For the record, Fernando is from the Department of Planning and Development. The site is an endearing one site community area within the 27th Ward. That is bounded on the north by railroad tracks and the east by North Amberley Street and the south by Portbook Alley and the west by North May Street. The site is also directly north of the historic Fulton Randolph Landmark District. According to CMAP data from 2020, the population in the near west side increased by 23.7% from 2010 to 2020. The total population 67,881. The site is also located within the Fulton Market Innovation District, approved by Plan Commission in February of 2021. The main plan for the area is the Fulton Market Innovation District, which promotes growth of mixed use and mixed income development for the area. The plan encourages development to provide affordable goals for the developments north of Lake Street. Also, the development in this area is subject to the West Loop Design Guidelines adopted in September 2017. The guidelines assist in development and define standards to serve the character, the high quality design, and dynamic nature of the West Oak neighborhood. The 
The site is situated one quarter of a mile from the CTA's Orange Peak and Rail Line stop, and 0.6 miles from the Grand Station Blue Line stop. I will now turn over the presentation to Katie Jackie Dale from DLA Piper, the applicant's attorney. Ms. Katie Thank Dale, please. Thank you so much. For the record, Katie Jenke Dale from the law firm of DLA Piper, along with my colleague Rich Clowder, we represent the applicant for this matter. We'd like to begin by thanking DPD and the Department of Housing and the Department of CDOT, or Department of, or CDOT uh, Department of Transportation. Uh, we worked very hard and very closely with all city departments on this project. I'm also joined today by Johnny Carlson and Grady Hamilton from Trammell Crow, Matt Axman and Matt Blewett from ESG Architects, and Louie Abuna from KLOA. As you can see, the site is currently um, is currently zoned uh, split zone manufacturing, and we are proposing to rezone it to a DX7 downtown mixed use district prior to establishing a residential business plan development. A 4.5 FAR bonus will be taken, resulting in an overall 11.5 for the plan development. Next slide, please. The site is a rectangular shaped lot that's approximately 90,974 square feet and currently occupied by an office building and a rental truck parking lot. The surrounding land uses in the area are industrial, commercial, and office. Next. The primary goals for this project were to maximize light and air between the buildings, enhance the public and pedestrian experience with the building forms, setbacks, and footprints, and a provide a publicly accessible open space that is unprecedented in this area. Next slide. Here's a bird's eye rendering of the two buildings from the Northwest with the office to the right and the residential to the left. Next. And here's another bird's eye view from the Northeast. Next slide. The applicant worked very closely with GPD to create a unique streetscape experience on Carroll which is made possible due to the fact that the PD includes both sides of the street. The applicant will continue to coordinate with CIA in executing on this plan. Next slide. We also work very closely with staff to enhance the views coming north along Aberdeen from the historic district to the south. This included strategically positioning the office building Port Share in the location where uh, you see here. Next. A new 35,000 square foot park will be provided on the 1112 Carroll site as shown in this rendering. This park will be privately owned and paid for, but publicly accessible, which will be memorialized in a development easement and maintenance agreement for DEMA. Next slide. On the north end of the open space, a buffer from the adjacent train tracks will be provided, which will give the opportunity for public art as shown on this slide in the upper left-hand corner. Um, along with other renderings of the residential tower, office amenity terrace, and the overall development from the uh, west moving clockwise. Next. Finally, here's an overall rendering of the development with the currently under construction project at 400 North Aberdeen, which is to the north to the right. Next slide. Similar to other projects in this neighborhood, we met with the three community organizations and presented at a community-wide meeting that was co-hosted by the Alderman and the West Loop Community Organization. We also were the first project to present to and receive feedback from DPD's Committee on Design. The project benefited from a very positive and productive discussion with the committee with an overall improved design quality and enhanced public realm design. Finally, as previously mentioned, we worked extensively with DPD staff on design. As a result of all this feedback, we made significant changes, including providing, all park or providing parking below grade and eliminating the Aberdeen curb cut for the office building, modifying the open space and introducing the shared street concept on Carroll and making modifications to the building design, massing and materials. Next slide. These changes are illustrated on this slide. And at this point, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Matt Axman from ESG Architects, who will go through the site plan and design, building design in more detail. Matt. Thank you, Katie, uh, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Um, as noted and for the record, my name is Matthew Axton uh, from ESG Architects. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here we can see the first floor program of each parcel. Um, items uh, to note are the vehicle and loading egress for 1112 West Carroll in the Northwest corner. 
um, loading from uh, 315 uh, May in the southwest corner and the tenant entry under a portico share access from the alley in the southeast corner. All primary elevations are faced with active use retail and building lobby. Next slide. In conjunction uh, with our landscape architect, uh, DPD and the committee on design, um, we've curated an open, open space experience that we really believe the community will be excited to live with daily. Um, the design is kind of this urban tapestry weaving together the past, present and a future of Fulton centered around the connections and urban adaptability. Um, the park uh, hopes to be an inclusive and inviting space. Um, the bulk of the park is divided into four interwoven experiences, the Carroll streetscape, the Grove, the Green and the Gateway Plaza. These areas break down the scale as to best suit the users. Um, some of the uh, unique features um, are the Grove, uh, this hill that sort of builds up into the Metro tracks, uh, creating a unique elevated experience that not only shields um, the site uh, the sight and sound of the train, but gives an otherwise flat urban landscape uh, the nod to the Illinois Bluffs. Um, a splash pad, a public dog park, uh, event stage, and then lastly, a, a curbless shared street experience that can host events such as farmers markets, street fairs, holiday events, um, et cetera. You know, we really hope to be kind of the catalyst in, in pivoting Carroll to be the linear landscape route as depicted in the FMID. Um, we've had the great opportunity to collaborate heavily with um, DPD staff and the Committee on Design and believe they have sincerely helped us in accelerating this to the current design. Next slide. Um, here we can see the sections through Carroll showing the kind of extent of that elongated pedestrian experience focused on not only the community engagement, but the, uh, the safety of the pedestrians. Next slide. Um, here we can see the first of the floor plans for 1112 West Carroll. Um, level two is a mix of typical units and amenity, and then our first typical low residential stack. Next slide. Um, here we can see our mid-block amenity and then our uh, mid-tier residential stack. Next slide. Back one more, please. Oh, and then lastly, uh, here is at 1112 West Carroll is our typical high stack and then our rooftop pool lounge amenity. Next slide. Uh, so for 315 North May, we have a series of offset floors that decrease as they stack, starting with stack one at 40,600 square foot and stack two at 30,250. Next slide. Uh, this is our mid-tier stack, stack three at 23,600, and then our high-tier stack four at 19,200. Next slide. Um, as previously noted, both buildings introduce all below grade parking. Um, it's really about enhancing the pedestrian realm and then all of those active levels above grade um, housing active space. Next slide. Um, we can run through these elevations relatively quickly as we'll kind of get into the details and materiality in just a moment here. Um, but starting first with this east elevation. Next slide. Here is our south elevation. Next slide. Our west elevation. And then lastly, we have our north elevation here. Next slide. Um, here we can see the overall section of 315 North May, and something to note here is really the, the key setbacks that happen along Fulton and Carroll. Um, this is kind of in response to really help buffer the height transition and active um, and activate those elevations to bring the energy of the neighborhood vertically to those elevated terraces. Uh, next slide. Uh, a unique feature of our metal panel uh, banding is this tapering and reduce, reduction of depth as it kind of dances from elevation to elevation. It's really about celebrating those balconies as it, as it expands in both depth and protrusion um, and as it meets those outdoor terraces. Let's put it on the fridge. Next slide. Um, the top, uh, this is the top section of, of May, again, showing the kind of unique banding, um, the balconies, how they're integrated within the facade and then the uh, penthouse mechanical and green roof above. Next slide. Um, the residential building starts its, ex its expression at its base uh, by drawing inward with an overhang to reduce the scale at the pedestrian realm. Um, from there, the massing is broken into two rectangular pieces, one rotated within the other. The larger mass breaks off twice as it makes its way up the vertical expression. Um, the base levels are clad with a warm tone weathered metal panel, kind of reminiscent of the brick or stone of the post-industrial era uh, with a stacked window expression. As it steps its first time, the silvery mass within starts to emerge and a more contemporary express facade is represented with our windows now shifted into a running bond expression. 
um, we are utilizing a kind of, kind of unique scale feature uh, type expression that is extended um, on one edge and then tapering back to the other edge. You'll note this tapering motif is a common design thread throughout. Next slide. And then here is that lower section 1112 West Carroll just described with the, uh, the weathered steel and the overhang for the residents. Next slide. Uh, and then lastly with 1112, here is the, the top of the residential building as it meets the, the pool deck amenity. Next slide. So our traffic study and site planning study were conducted by KLOA and approved by CDOT. Um, and we're continuing these ongoing discussions with CDOT and DPD to really help shape uh, the future of the Carroll Corridor with this Catalyst Streetscape project. Next slide. Um, and we're gonna quickly uh, run through some demonstrations of how we're meeting the West Loop Design Guide, design guide compliances. Um, to start with, all of our balconies are inset and integrated into the facade. Um, we are aligning um, our base podium with uh, the parapets of our adjacent uh, buildings, and then um, uh, active ground floor uses as well. Next slide. Um, here you can see us uh, in our alignment with a neighboring parapet to our west, preserving that urban street wall and really kind of accenting the materiality with the brick and the additional opaque fenestration. Um, uh, here you can see uh, on the right side of the sl slide, we're introducing a thinner structure at 1112 West Carroll. This is really to allow more public open space with an easily defined entrance with a shade structure and material change. And then again, all that parking brought below grade. Next slide. So the angularity of these masses and site design really pulls pedestrians from Fulton into the park experience, creating both visual and physical connection um, with these kind of focal nodes off of Fulton and Carroll. Um, and then with the varying setbacks in the tower, um, we really maximize the physical distance between the two structures. Next slide. Uh, a mix of metal panel and uh, glass are implemented on the, the taller sections of the buildings whereas the base of each building is fenestrated in either a brick and glass in 350 North May or a weathered steel striated concrete and glass in 1112 West Carroll um, to give the weight and complementary materials associated with the neighborhood. Next slide. In conformance with the sustain Chicago Sustainability Goal and the development team really looks to accomplish lead goal with the silver guarantee, um, vegetative roofs and EV charging throughout. Um, this development team has exceeded the sustainability goal um, at 1375 West Fulton with lead gold and is likely to receive lead gold at 400 North Aberdeen um, as well um, with commissioning beginning in early 2022. Next slide. Um, the stormwater approach um, has been approved with the conversion of what is currently at almost 100% uh, impervious surface to now 40 to 50% with given our green roofs and at grade plantings. Um, so we've greatly increased our volume control. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back over to Katie at DLA. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Again, for the record, Katie Jenke Dale. Uh, next slide, please. The project is subject to the new 2021 ARO and the applicant has agreed or elected to provide 20% of the units on site at a weighted average of 60% AMI. This goes above and beyond what the new ARO would require. Furthermore, the applicant has agreed to continue to work with DOH to try to secure the necessary financing to provide an additional 38 affordable units for a total overall 30% affordability on site. The applicant has already had many discussions with DOH about available city sources and had, has agreed to formally initiate the process and provide updates to DOH six months prior to submitting for building permits, then again closer to permit. We look forward to continuing the collaborative dialogue we've had with DOH to date in trying to achieve this goal. Next slide. This project has extensive economic and community benefits for the city. Beyond the unprecedented open space for the neighborhood, it will create 2,500 permanent jobs, 1,600 construction jobs, and an overall almost $9.5 million neighborhood opportunity uh, bonus contribution. Prior to wrapping up, I'm like, I would like to now turn it over to Mr. Johnny Carlson from the applicant. He will say a few words prior to turning it back over to DPD. Johnny. Thank you, Katie. And for the record, my name is Johnny Carlson with Trammell Crow Company. I just want to thank everyone. We're extremely excited to be speaking about this project in front of you today. And, and I want to thank a few folks that helped us get here. Um, obviously, Alderman Burnett has been great to work with, starting with him and working through the community has been just a great experience. We're excited. This will be our uh, fourth project in 
Fulton Market and in the city of Chicago over the last five years, totally about a half billion dollars. So we're proud of that. We want to be stewards of the city and really are fortunate for your partnership. Uh, commissioners, uh, work with various groups throughout this process, the staff has been unbelievable and, and really a special thanks to uh, the committee on design. I will tell you that when we first were notified of uh, this new step in the process, uh, we, we were, took a step back, thought what was it going to do for our schedule, but it kept pace, it a great remarkable experience with many uh, unique architects that have worked on projects in and around Chicago and across the, the country and the globe. So between all those various groups, they hung with us, they moved fast, we got through it and we're fortunate that we think we ended up with a better project for the city and for the community. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Fernando and we're here for questions. Okay, for the record, Fernando Espinosa with TPD. Permanent plan development has reviewed the project materials submitted by the applicant and has concluded the proposed residential business plan development. It's compatible with the character of the surrounding area in terms of uses. The project will be adequately served by existing public infrastructure and facilities. The proposed plan development demonstrates high quality urban design is evidenced by reinforcing desirable urban features, including massive arrangements and enhanced streetscape characteristics. The proposed development is in conformance with the West Loop design guidelines Improved by Planning Commission. The proposal promotes appropriate pedestrian scale and accessibility with active uses into peace support buildings. The proposal also includes high quality materials and design. In addition, the project will enhance the pedestrian experience with a 35,000 square foot ground floor open space accessible to the public. Please refer to the department staff report for additional information. Based on the foregoing, there's a recommendation of the zoning administrator and department of planning that the application for the proposed plan development be approved the recommendation to the City Council, Committee on Zoning Landmarks, and Building Standards, the passage recommended. So this concludes the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fernando. Um, questions from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Searle. Can we go back to the, the site plan? Um, Piece. I, I was not clear uh, as to which building was to the south and which was to the north, <laughs> having gone through all these slides now. Um, my concern is, so the residential building is to the north, is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, I, I understood uh, that the uh, Committee on Design suggested that this be reversed because this uh, office building would um, basically be shading the residential building. Isn't that correct? I mean, was there any, um, you know, consideration to change the two site plans to reverse them? Sure, that was definitely explored. Um, Commissioner Searle, I'd like to ask Matt um, to unmute himself and kind of walk through the, the planning uh, aspects that went into kind of where we are, um, what we're presenting today, Matt. Yeah, so in terms of the committee on design and, and, and the, the site orientation of the two buildings, I think some of the primary considerations there um, that kind of led us to uh, really get additional solar access to the park was, I think in taking that first step and taking that parking at the resident or the office building and pushing it below grade really allowed us a little bit more flexibility in reducing the footprint of our building. 
So um, if we if we went and looked at the previous um, iteration prior to or at Committee on Design and then after Committee on Design, we were really able to kind of keep the buildings in their current position. And by reducing the overall footprint, um, our shadow studies kind of have proven that we get really good morning sun kind of into the early afternoon. We get a little bit of reprieve in the afternoon given the, the direct south sunlight. And then come come um, afternoon time, we, we as the sun kind of peers around um, the office building, we again get good solar access from the west. So um, we, we thought that in, in reducing the overall footprint of the building and pushing the parking below grade, we were able to kind of meet a compromise with, with getting additional solar access into the park space. And, and Matt, this is Johnny Carlson with Trammell Crow for the record. I, I do want to make note that the we did hear one of the uh, committee members brought that up as an idea uh, as part of the process. Uh, when the meeting minutes, I believe they had an offline meeting to discuss as a whole, and the, and the directive was uh, to hit five or six points, and flipping them was no longer on that list. It was really of how to make the park better tied to Fulton uh, Street and, and a few other areas. So a lot of that was really about the parking and the podium and how it interacts with the park and the playoff of Fulton and driving people to the park from other areas uh, in various points of this community here. So I think we we did address their comments. We did meet with. Well, we would like to do, but I think we have some clarity. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. 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 So I'll, I'll wrap up, but I do want to say that we did meet. We had various meetings with, uh, based on those uh, items and addressed it, um, their concerns. Okay. Thank Does you. That um, yeah, I I think that. Um, this building, you know, I don't know. I, I find the design just still really lacking in so many ways. Um, I don't, I don't even know quite how to start, but this office building is still very bulky. And to me, doesn't fit any of the guidelines of the um, Fulton market area. Um, so I'll stop there. I mean, I think it's, it's good and admirable that you have 30% uh, affordable units. That's great. Um, but I think in terms of design and kind of contribution to the neighborhood, it's really lacking as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. And I want to also say, welcome, Fernando. It's so good to see your face. <laughs> Thank you. Right on. Uh, Commissioner Pinedo. And can you pronounce your name, please? Yeah, Pinedo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, somebody, uh, somebody from the development team can please address this. Uh, during the comment period, um, somebody uh, spoke about the age of the surrounding buildings and the potential impact of seismic activity uh, on, on those surrounding buildings and safety issues. Uh, I'd love to hear to what extent was that evaluated, assessed, and what were the conclusions? That's a great question. Thank you, Commissioner. This is Johnny Carlson for the record with Trammell Crow Company. Uh, we, we work with uh, first class quality general contractors, consultants, and every project we do, we do plenty of due diligence up front, and we've done that on this site. Prior to anyone mobilizing or swinging hammers or digging, of dirt, uh, we initiate with a third party uh, to monitor, set up uh, monitoring in and around, not just our site, but offsite. We work with the various buildings nearby. We measure those, we have standards. And if anything were ever to set off a, a level of uh, beyond code or beyond uh, where we are comfortable or uh, various standards throughout the market, we would stop construction and reevaluate. We do not think that will happen. We have a plan in place and uh, we're gonna monitor it and do what we always do is uh, be good stewards of the community. So that is not a concern for us. Uh, the general contractors that we do this across the country with uh, all take that very serious and we do too for safety. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Brumfeld. I, I actually do uh, um, agree with the number of the points that uh, Commissioner Scholl did uh, did raise, um, but one thing I do want to at least commend uh, the developer and the architect is to that they did uh, take in still uh, to consideration a number of points that were at least addressed uh, 
um, by the committee on design. Uh, I do think at least um, this plan, um, at least at the ground plane, uh, is definitely improvement uh, uh, from what was actually presented uh, a couple months ago, at least as it relates to the ground plane uh, and access to the park. I do appreciate that the uh, buildings um, have gotten leaner. Um, while there's still um, a number of things that I think uh, still could have been done to improve uh, the overall plan itself, um, I do think that this is definitely an improvement of what was uh, presented to the Committee on Design, and I do appreciate that uh, a number of the, uh, yeah. the uh, comments and considerations were, were taken into account and certainly reflect what was presented to the, uh, to the board today, so thank you for that. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Nevada. Thanks, Madam Chair. I, I wanted to take a step back as we are uh, getting more applications for residential development in the Fulton Market Innovation District. And we haven't really talked about the backdrop of this geography in a while. So to be clear, this is, this is about a set of comments broader than this particular application, but it includes it. Um, so just to remind this group, our, our fellow plan commissioners, back in February, we approved a plan to open the Fulton Market Innovation District to residential development after it had been you know, manufacturing for, for decades. And because this is such a rare opportunity in a transit rich and amenity rich area, uh, we set the goal of exceeding the ARO uh, within this district. So the plan that was approved by this body sets the goal of 30% affordability whether within this building or in another building, but within the district, one, one way or another. And again, and just to remind folks, the, the ARO expectation is 20%. So this is an additional 10% on top of that. And it's important to note, this is not an unfunded expectation. Uh, the plan that we approved as a body states that the Department of Housing is committed to providing financial support and or facilitating other private uh, public-private partnerships to help reach that 10%. So things like 4% tax credits um, could be CDBG, could be home, could be affordable housing opportunity fund. All of those are ways that um, we can help. So I just wanted to reinforce um, with all the developers interested in this area, also to remind all of us um, that the opening up of this incredibly valuable real estate to residential came with an affordability goal that we do expect to meet. And we're starting to hear some hints that the outcome may be that investors aren't, maybe to say that investors aren't comfortable with tax credits or with a 30% affordability level broadly. Um, and, and thus, you know, maybe it's a, we'll look at it, but we don't know if we can make it work. And I just wanted to take a moment to reframe and remind all of us that 30% affordability was part of the expectation of developing within this specific geography. We as plan commissioners um, passed the plan that established this expectation. And, you know, in reality, no one has to develop uh, in FMID if they can't get to 30% affordability with our assistance. So I think what's true and maybe worth noting is 99.9% .9 of the city does not have this expectation this small geography does. Um, and just to note, this is our goal. We, ex we really expect to partner with the development community to meet it. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Commissioner. And to, to clarify, so are, is, are the developers then proposing 30% portability? Um, yes, again, for the record, Johnny Carlson with Tramacro Company. The language in the PD that's been uh, in front of you in your packet today addresses that. So 20% uh, with the goal to work with the city and staff uh, for those credits and try to make this a goal for everyone to hit that 30% is addressed in that. Okay, um, is, is I, I guess I'm, so you're, you're committing the 20% with and saying that you'll work to try to get the 30%. Is that, would, would uh, Commissioner, um, Novada, is that, would we consider that meeting the standards of the uh, innovation district or is, I mean, is, or no. it, sounds, it sounds a little verging on vague, but I'm not sure. What, maybe you can help me out here. The, uh, the goal that we set in the plan is to get to 30% with the city providing this additional assistance. 
And um, so the conversations that we've been having with the development community are really ones of saying, how do we partner together to figure that out? It may not look the same in every development, um, but we are committed to providing the financial assistance to get there. The thing that I, uh, it is, you know, it's an expectation that we are setting. It's not uh, spelled out in an ordinance the way that the ARO is. And so that's, that's the difference here. So when we're evaluating these things, and, and as you say, it's, it's policy, not ordinance. Um, what is our obligation here in terms of trying to um, reinforce the importance of the innovation district, which as you point out, was passed before this body back in February. Um, is the language currently on this project sufficient or would we want, would we expect um, stronger language and a commitment to the 30%? What would be ideal? This, 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 this project aside for a minute, what, what kind of language are we looking for to indicate that commitment? Um, you know, thus far we have gotten to a point with developers that have, have come this far um, in saying that because this is new and because we are working through this together, um, we will accept language that says best faith effort to get to 30%. But what we're also hearing, as I mentioned, is some of, yeah, but I, you know, I don't know that we're, we can make it work. I don't know um, in some cases. And I, I think this is where my interest is in just in reframing that um, this is the expectation for development in this. So the goal, so coming in, we are expecting that we'll figure it out and we will make it work. And if not, this is not the place to develop right now. Right. So, because I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing the, the full commitments. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Reyes. Yeah, I think from what I understand, this is an important project because it's the first one. It's going to set a precedent. So I would have preferred that the developer comes forward with a clear understanding, a clear commitment. We are going to work towards that goal. It doesn't sound to me like a strong commitment that the 30% is going to be achieved. So I understand it's a policy, it's not the ordinance, but at the same time, this is a significant project. I didn't note it a significant uh, decrease of the massive. We have a significant number of units here. So, and it's the first one. So we need to be clear because we're sending a very clear message. Uh, what do we want to see in the Fulton Market Residential? And it's not 30%. They are not committed to 30%. We need to be clear with that. And we do need to have a stronger language. So. From my perspective, I don't think that the developer is ready to make that commitment. So I don't know why we're reviewing this project now. Why we didn't review this project later when we have a clear understanding where the developer commitment is. If, if I could just respond to that, um, Katie Jinkydale, for the record. Um, to clarify, this is the fourth project to come forward north of Lake um, since the FMID plan was updated. So. This isn't the first residential project that's subject to that 30% um, affordability goal um, set forth in the FMID plan. Um, and while we are committing to the 20% on site, the 2021 arrow that was just adopted and just went into effect on projects three weeks ago, would per its terms allow us to pay a fee in lieu for half of that 20% requirement and put you know, only 5% of units on site and 5% off sites so we really do think we are going above and beyond. We've been working very closely with uh, DOH. We were wrapping up the language as recently as this morning and late last night. So I think we've shown that we are being very collaborative. We have committed to formally initiate the process. Um, obviously we need to get initial approval so we can release full design um, drawings and get moving on lining up financing sources. But to date we've been nothing but responsive and cooperative, not only with DOH, but I think with all city departments, DPD and CDOT. Um, and it is codified in the plan development statements um, in addition to the FMID plan. Um, 
I'm, I'm still not convinced, so I'm sorry. It doesn't matter what number the, the, this project is, more importantly. I mean, it's so big, so massive, the strong message. Thank, thank you, um, um, Katie and uh, Commissioner Reyes. Commissioner Cox, followed by Commissioner Shaw, followed by, and then, and then we're gonna go to the alderman for the area. Sure, um, uh, th thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I do wanna clarify uh, or elaborate on a couple of things that uh, Commissioner Navarro uh, said. Um, th this, this is the third project with the same uh, aspirational commitment of 30% that this body has seen. So there are two other developers who have come before us with the exact same language that is being proposed here. Um, um, stating that they are committed to working with our departments to, to achieve the 30% um, affordable. Um, so I assume that this body approved the last two. And I would just say that this one is different in that it has an office and residential, uh, but it has the exact same um, framework. The reason why the language is posed the way it is, is because we haven't done this before. <laughs> this is a, a new aspiration. Um, we didn't even allow residential north of Lake. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are opening up a whole new area to create yeah. this mixed use community. And um, with that, we're committed to working out with the developers how to make this happen. Um, so we don't want to simply open up and the alderman has been very clear. We don't want to simply reach the 20% threshold when we know that there is a greater need for affordability as this area expands. So the aspiration is 30%. Uh, our departments are still trying to figure out what is the financial model that will work. Uh, and we need the flexibility we also, we just need the commitment on the part of this body to allow us to find the answer. If we had the answer, then yes, the, it would be in the ordinance as opposed to in the policy, but we are all in good faith trying to find an answer to achieve a new level of affordability in the market, in the Fulton Market District. So while I understand our hesitation in not having an ironclad um, commitment, that's because no one here has the answer yet. But what we need is a serious good faith effort on the part of all to seek those answers. And I can assure you, uh, the mayor uh, supports this aspiration. Uh, and this is a part of what we hope we can achieve for Fulton Market. And I think this project is an exemplar of that. Um, I would also just like to um, compliment uh, the development team and their architects for working to set a couple of new models. Uh, we know this area is starved for quality public space and to achieve this much of a public park that's being financed by the development team um, is a new threshold and we hold this up as a model. Um, their interaction and their flexibility with the Committee on Design I would argue is exemplary, was exemplary um, to underground the parking here um, and to veer from the traditional podium um, was a major breakthrough and a major change in their development strategy. So um, to my colleagues who would have preferred that they switch the tower, um, uh, switch the two towers, uh, that proved to be a bridge too far um, but what we did achieve is a re-sculpting of the, the tower so that more sunlight uh, gets into this public space, a bigger um, public realm in the form of the park. Uh, and so I, I, I appreciate um, the flexibility uh, and the creativity that the team showed. I would also say um, this is 80 days from the, the time when this project was uh, presented to the Committee on Design. Um, that's an extraordinary achievement relative to expediting the process. So uh, I think it, you know, if indeed um, 
projects of this importance and complexity uh, can go to the committee in design and be at the plan commission 80 days later. Uh, I think that's something that we should all take note of and celebrate and I hope it happens um, more frequently. But again, I am extremely supportive of the project. I think it's setting some new um, uh, aspirations for us, both in terms of public realm making and in terms of affordability. And uh, I hope uh, I intend to support the project. Thank you, Commissioner Shaw. Thanks, Chairman. So my, my question is in, in somewhat simple. The project has definitely some pluses and some minuses and, and they're clearly concerns. But in a few moments, we're going to vote on whether this project meets the requirements um, for approval. So my question is, does this project meet the requirements particularly with related to affordability? I, I'm not clear on what that answer is. Um, I'm getting the sense that the answer to that is no. Um, from what Commissioner Ovara said initially, but perhaps somebody can help clarify, are we meeting the requirements in this project or not? Um, I can try to clarify, Commissioner Shah. So um, the expectation as codified in the 2021 ARO is being met. Um, and if you value on-site units, you can you would say it is being exceeded because um, as was pointed out, the all of the affordable units are being uh, planned to be and committed to be provided within the building. The complication here is that this plan added an additional goal, an additional expectation that said within this district, we want to get to 30% affordability and that additional 10% is, um, is an increment that the city will pay for. And it's not codified in anything like an ARO that makes it an obligation. It is uh, a goal, it's an expectation. And, um, and so it is um, what's, what's put forth in the PD meets the ARO and thus it meets, um, you know, it meets the obligations. Um, there is an additional, um, goal that we would like to see any residential development meet and the language in the PD at this point says um, you know that that the developer will work toward that but it does not have um, committing language to that and nor have the ones that went previous so hence my comments just to say um, as you know as we get further into this I just wanted to reframe and remind us all as, as plan commissioners and, and just the development community um, that, you know, this was our, our goal and our expectation for, for residential development here. I saw I Noah had his hand up, which might be to, to provide something more technical than, um, than what I have provided, I'm not sure. I was, I was only going to add that uh, part of the review process we go through with considering a plan development is to look at approved and designated plans adopted by this plan commission of which the increased ARO obligations were a goal. So as part of the city's uh, review in allowing or considering to do a positive recommendation on additional density, the consideration relies heavily on additional ARO obligations. Um, thank you. Does that, does that address your questions, Commissioner Shaw? Did you have follow-up? No, I think that that's super helpful. I just wanted to make sure because, you know, based on the dialogue, it was sounding like we were going, we weren't, ex we weren't getting there, but it sounds like we're there and we're trying to do more. And I think that that's great. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that, you know, on a fundamental level, we want to make sure that what we're doing is are meeting our requirements. And, and it sounds that we are and, and that we have aspirational goals, which I think are, which are important for the reasons outlined previously. So I, I think that's great. Thank you. Yeah, well, we're meeting the 20% and, and there's a, the question I think is how, how um, strong is that commitment for that 30%? I think that's what we're trying to ascertain perhaps. Yeah, uh, no, it makes sense. I, I think it makes sense. I mean, if we, given, given that we're, we're, the way that this funding is supposed to come out, I, I think that, you know, giving the room for the city 
and for the developer to work together to do it, I, I, I feel comfortable with that, knowing that, again, it's, it's, it meets the requirements. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Alderman Burnett, I'm going to go to you, but let me get the Commissioner Lyons' comment in first, and, and, then, I'll, and then I'll come back to you. Um, thank you. Uh, just in terms of my, I would like, like to understand a little bit, um, you know, the in terms of understanding how the 10%, um, it sounds like that will be, you know, a good faith effort. Um, I also wanted to understand the financing aspect of it. It sounds like, I think I heard that that would be in some way publicly financed. Can someone talk through for the public, right, who might be following this project um, after you know, after, if it were to get zoning approval, what is the process or the, the public process? What would that look like for um, for that 10%? Will there be another hearing about that? What sort of, what's the um, legislative process that someone might expect for the um, for that 10% to move forward if for folks who might be interested in following that? Or I can take a stab at that. Um, it, in some ways, it depends on the source. So um, our 4% tax credits, we will, um, as opposed to our 9% credits, which we only issue during competitive rounds that we do um, every other year, 4% credits uh, are at this point generally very over, uh, undersubscribed. And so we will issue those at any point that we have a viable project. And um, if it's a different source like um, CDBG or home or from the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund paid for by in lieu fees, um, then there's a different process for public notification. So it really depends on the source and which uh, source ultimately um, makes this project, makes any one of these developments workable, uh, different expectations then apply. Thank you. Alderman Burnett. Well, um, thank, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Um, and, you know, it's funny, this uh, affordable housing, uh, this affordable housing uh, conversation is interesting. You know, it was funny, uh, before we changed the arrow to 20%, I was, I was encouraging guys to get 20%. And, um, you know, the law department was having a challenge with that. So we changed the policy or we changed the ordinances, the laws to make it happen. Um, I think in this case is, is very, you know, to have a, I think we plan with ourselves, right? I mean, of course I had the leverage to do, I've had the leverage of being able to encourage it myself from my position. I think when the city, uh, when the city plays with this like this, you know, you open yourself up for vagueness in, in the law department playing around. Um, I think we should, if you if you want 30%, man, just make the rule say it's 30%. That's what I'm saying. If y'all want to just make it 30%, see, we're going to make it 30% and we're going to give you uh, uh, subsidies to help with that. And, and that's not excluding the fact that uh, what just happened in Springfield with the legislation or the tax credits in Springfield. I mean, we, all of the ingredients are in place to help these developers to be able to do this more so than it was when I was encouraging them to do it without any incentives, you know? So, so it should be a no brainer uh, for them to do it. But if we want absolute answers, I think for these developers, it gets a little challenging because they got to deal with, uh, you know, funders and all of that stuff. So, uh, but if they know, I think when people know exactly what they have to do, it makes it easier for them to do what they have to do to get it done. You know what I'm saying? And um, so I think, you know, if, if, if this is the route that we're going to go, I think we need to consider if you want to say it's going to be 30% over here, say it's going to be 30% over here and leave it at that. And we won't have to be having all of these, you know, uh, vague conversations um, uh, in reference to this. That's just... Uh, coming from me. I mean, like I say, for me, is is from a different perspective, me dealing with them, but for, the, uh, for you guys to deal with them is, is, is um, you know, I always used to get accused of, uh, um, you know, the policy had to change to do the things that I've been doing. So 
So anyway, so that's a whole other thing. So I think. Um, Can I just comment on that before you go on real quickly, sure. if you don't mind. So this really, I mean, this points to a much deeper and bigger issue, right? Which is ordinance versus you know policy, or in this case, planning documents. So typically, when we do a planning document, um, they're me they're meant to be guidelines and they're meant to be sort of goals. And it's unusual that you pass a particular planning document like, like the one for the innovation district as an ordinance. And so, so, but you still wanna push people towards that goal. Um, and so I think that's, that's why there's this sort of push to get move, move them towards the 30%, even though, uh, because that, because that is the district that, that they're in. So it's, it's, a, it's a sort of bigger issue that I, that I know you've dealt with, dealt with before, but, um, and so I think that that's that's why the the thirty percent is this is this is within a planning document for this district, and it begins. I mean, the reason the planning document was developed is because, as Commissioner Nevada pointed out, we're only now allowing even residential um, uh, above Lake Street, north of Lake Street, because this was not a residential area before. As she also pointed out, this has been a uh, you know manufacturing distribution location. So then, so then the idea behind the planning staff putting together this planning document is like, okay, well, if we're going to do that, let's think about it. Let's 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 be thoughtful about about what we how what we want that to look like and we want what we want that area to be as we're adding the residential. And so I think one of the goals that was put forward in that in that plan that we passed in February was this goal to have have not only mixed use but also um, mixed income. Um, and, and besides that question, I also have questions around scale because I think we haven't, we haven't quite gotten to that yet either, um, as was pointed out by one of the public speakers. Um, but anyway, we can come back to that in a minute. But, on the, but just this sort of, just, just this, uh, um, you know, the, the, I don't want to call it a dilemma, but the difficulty, right, of juxtaposing ordinance and, and plans and still trying to be true to the plans as, as put forward to attain certain, certain goals. So, so go ahead, finish. So I, you know, I deal with a lot of these things. Um, you know, some of the things that was spoken about. You know, they said a lot of things, but some of it is about their building being right across the street, and they're concerned about their view, right? So, I mean, you got to know the community to know where people are coming from, um, and no views are promised to anyone, right? And even if this was a uh, a 10 story building, it, it will block the views also. Uh, this area is the economic engine for the city of Chicago right now, right? Uh, more so than any other community in the city. Matter of fact, this area was having development going on when nowhere else in the country was having development going on during the pandemic. You know, so this is a, this is our, our horse to balance out things to hopefully uh, help help the city's coffers and and uh, divert us from ha ha having to do other things like raise taxes or whatever the case may be, because not only uh, does it uh, attract more tax dollars, but it attract more uh, more people to come here and work, more businesses to come here. Uh, Twenty five thousand. Uh, uh, is it 25,000 permanent jobs or 2,500 permanent jobs? It was one of those. It said 2,500. 2,500 permanent jobs, um, you know, hundreds of construction jobs. Um, a lot of residents living here. That's not even counting the, the, the folks who's going to be working in these buildings, um, you know, maintaining them, maintaining the, the public green space that's... Um, that that this developer is building and offering uh, to the community. One of the biggest requests that I have in this community and have had for several years have been green space. And we don't have any city land over here in order to give it to them, right? Because this was an industrial area. This is an area that was not residential. It was an industrial area and it didn't even have stop signs and lights and all of that stuff up because it was basically uh, planned for uh, factories and trucks. And uh, so everything has been has been changed in this community. And one of the things that, you know, you know, a lot of folks, 
it, it's ironic that folks challenge us on the historical district stuff. But I remember when we was trying to put the historical district in, folks because they didn't want to. Be we, we lost you a little bit there, Commissioner. Can you, uh, Alderman, can you just say, a uh, repeat? You said when we were trying to get an historical district, folks. When we, were trying, when we were trying to get the historical landmark district in, a lot of people in this community didn't want us to put the landmark in. <laughs> in the, uh, they didn't want us to put a landmark and historical district in here. But we saw fit to make a plan. We knew we was going to allow density to come to this community, but we wanted to keep a balance. Right. We didn't want to we didn't want to just make it one way. We wanted to preserve some of the buildings over here, but also at the same time uh, take on, you know, all of the development that, that was coming this way. So so I think, you know, we the the city has has had a, a great forethought in, in reference to this. And also we increased the density. We increased this density in this community a long time ago. You know, it's not it's not like all of a sudden uh, we we're allowing buildings to be built. The plan has been for years that density was going to come to this community. In the central area plan, it looks for density uh, to come to this community because this is the area that helps to hold up the the rest of the city of Chicago as far as with economics and jobs and all of those other things. So it's a bigger picture. This, this area is part of a bigger picture for the city of Chicago. And unfortunately for me, and you know, and I take risks in dealing with these things as an alderman because you know, folks, um, you know, folks aren't happy, but you know, my, my, my policy is always, I'm not in the business of trying to make everybody happy. I'm in the business of trying to help folks to be better. Right. And I think this development will help the community to be better. They're getting the green space. We're bringing jobs to the community. We're bringing economic development to the community. We're getting affordable housing. I mean, uh, th this area is the envy of everyone else in the city of Chicago. Uh, matter of fact, it's the envy of a lot of people all over the country. Uh, so I think that we're moving in the right direction with this. I know the developer had to do some things to readjust. Uh, and I know that, you know, uh, with, with all of this de design, all of these design things that everyone is not going to agree on design, right? I mean, we have several architects on, on the, on the uh, commission with us, but we also had that design review thing. And then you have architects who draw this stuff. You know, I, I'm not into that design world, but I am into, um, I'm, I am into making my community better. I am into... Uh, helping to bring economic development to the community. I am uh, aware of people being concerned about their views. You know, I, I, I recognize and I understand those things, but I know that this development is gonna help this community to be a better place, is gonna bring more green space. And so I'm in support of, although I can't vote on it, it's up to all of you guys. Uh, as far as the affordability goes, hey, I support if y'all wanna just make it you know, no goal, make it, you have to, you want, if you want to take the goal away, I'm fine with that. Change the word. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't have a problem with changing the word. That's on you guys. If you want to do that. I mean, y'all got out in front of me. I was, I was, I was beating y'all out on getting raised in the bar. Y'all raised the bar further than I did. If you want, uh, if you want to do that, you can. And I got to get on this other meeting. So, so those are my comments. I support this project. Uh, and I ask for everyone else's support. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. I'm, I'm assuming that none of that was um, an argument against why we have the innovation uh, planning document that this body passed back in February. Uh, in fact, it would be an argument for all the more reason, right? Because as the area is growing rapidly, we want to make sure it grows um, in a way that we can be proud of um, down the line. And we just didn't sort of go with whatever because it was growing quickly. Um, so. Uh, can we go back to the um, one of your um, your <coughs> your photos early on? It shows the building in relation to the to the height of the other buildings in the area. So, <coughs> is it this one? Uh, it might be. 
Uh, was that the only one we got? Is there one just before that? No, there's more. There's more. Got that yeah, one that, and one more. Yeah, that one. That one. This one. Yeah. Um, or that one. Okay. Because I I wanted to see that because of the one of the uh, the one of the uh, <clears throat> of our residents that that spoke, or maybe it was two spoke about the height of the building. Uh, being out of scale from surrounding buildings. But when you see it in context there, I guess it's not so out of scale. Um, Just to be clear, Chair, Chairwoman. Uh, go ahead. Uh, we did approve the Plan Commission a couple other buildings that were taller, specifically 160 North Boykin is 490 feet tall. And is that in the Innovation District itself? Yes. Okay, okay, that 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 helps me. Um, and and um, so we covered everything else that was raised by neighborhoods, I think, by the, by community folks. All right, with that, then let me ask for a. I'm not you're seeing any other comments? Um, uh, any hands raised? So let me uh, see if I can get a motion on the proposed residential business plan development submitted by Tramel Crow. Chicago Development Incorporated for the property generally located at 215 North May Street and 1112 West Carroll Avenue, finding that it meets the requirements for approval. Chairman, before you go to the vote, um, I had a quick question. Go for it. Um, so I just wanted to confirm, based on the conversation and Commissioner Cox's comments and Commissioner Navarro, we, this is a commitment for 20% ARO with a good faith effort. And the one thing I just wanted to reinforce from the developer that they are also fully committed to working with our city to get that extra 10%. You know what, thank you so much, Commissioner Shaw. I meant to, I meant to, uh, to have that stated as explicitly as you just did. So I think we need, it, I need, we need the explicit commitment that there will be a good, good faith effort. Um, um, and say, say again, the last part of what you just said, Commissioner. Good faith effort to achieve that additional 10% more from the city. Okay. Can we Chair Woman, can I add a note before we please, have a Albert please, to, please. Add, to respond to uh, please, please. Commissioner Shah's uh, uh, comment there? I, I do want to clarify the 20% that is a, it's a non negotiable item. Right. It's a right. mandatory law obligation. Right. We understand so that. Yeah. There will be, so the first 20% is absolutely coming in as required by the code. And then now I think it's good for the applicant to respond to the rest of Commissioner Shaw's comments. Thank you, Neil, I appreciate that. Go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. This is Johnny Carlson with Trammell Crow, the applicant. And yes, that language is in there. It is our good faith effort to do so. I believe uh, the language- can, the, can, can, you, can you be even more, yeah, say good faith effort to- you No, know, it's, it's totally, uh, it's written in the ordinance. Um, our effort is we have to file an intake meeting, meet with the city and go about the process in good faith to achieve that. No, no. What, what, what I'm what I'm trying to get from you, Mr. Carson, is an explicit statement that say good faith effort, not yes. just to, say to achieve that, but to say that to, to explicitly state what that that is. Oh yes, in good faith, we will pursue the ten percent with the city in a partnership uh, to try to make this a financeable project with the additional ten percent for a total of thirty percent. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't know that's what you were. <laughs> I thought you want me to <laughs> no, reference. I, I appreciate it. I just like to connect all the dots. So I no, no, no. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you. Sean. I really appreciate that because I meant to do that. So I'm glad. I'm glad you followed up. And I'm sorry, Mr. Carlson, but every time I see your name, I, I you know, I do think of of Johnny Carson. And I'm sure I knew you were going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure uh, that over the years, you get you've gotten lots of references. That oh, a lot yeah. of a lot of expectations for jokes at the end of you know. <laughs> Whatever you might say, and, uh, and all of that, but you know that's not that's not so bad. He was a, he was a pretty cool guy. Uh, all right, so, okay. I'll, I'll second the motion. Uh, I think I need to read it for the record, though. Okay, so let me do that, and then you I think can... you did. Actually. Oh, did I read it? Okay, no, all right. Oh, good, good. I sure did. Thank you. That's I, why I, I, I interjected. Sorry. No, no. That's why I told you I was going to need your help today. All right, good. So we've got a. Did we? So did we have a first? We've got a second from Commissioner Cox, but who was the first? I thought it was Shaw, but I, no, she didn't. She no, she didn't make the motion. She oh, just then started. I will. I will move the motion. All right, now can I get a second? I can be second. 
All right, thank you, Commissioner. All right, so with that, let me go to um, the what it, the uh, roll call. Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. I'm not sure. Oh, Commissioner Burnett is recused himself for this vote, obviously. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Flores. I think she had to go after being here for the first part of the meeting, first couple hours of the meeting. Commissioner Garza. Chairwoman, excuse yes. me. Uh, Commissioner Flores uh, proxied a no vote. A no vote. Okay. Thank you. That's no on Flores. Commissioner Garza. Yes. Commissioner uh, Pinedo. 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 Yes. I mean, yes. Okay. Yes. Commissioner uh, Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Got you that time. <laughs> Commissioner Tobata. Yes. Commissioner Barkley. Yes. Commissioner Dreyes. No. Commissioner Searle. No. Commissioner Shaw. Yes. Commissioner Tunney. Yes. And Commissioner Villegas. Right. Uh, no, that's there's no vote on. There is an absence of a vote on from Commissioner Villegas. Okay, motion uh, passes. What was the total tally on that, Noah? We have three no votes. Thirteen yeses, three noes, one recusal. Okay, thank you. Um, next item on the motion passes. Congratulations, and we do uh, have the expectation that you're going to work to get to achieve that thirty percent. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is D3, a proposed business plan development submitted by the applicant, Mark Goodman and Associates Incorporated for the property generally located at 400 North Elizabeth Street. The applicant is proposing to rezone the site from C3-3 commercial manufacturing and employment district to a DX5 downtown mixed use district, and then to a business plan development. The request is sought to allow for the development of a 270 foot tall 16-story mixed-use commercial office and life sciences building containing 492,171 square feet of office, 131 vehicle parking spaces, 28 bicycle parking spaces and open space, a 3.1 floor area ratio bonus will be taken and the overall FAR of the plan development will be 8.1. Uh, this is item 20712 and it's on the 27th board. Josh San will present the context overview and the applicant will provide their proposal. Good afternoon, commissioners. For the record, my name is Joshua Sun with the Department of Planning and Development. This proposed development is generally located at 400 North Elizabeth Street and is located within the West Town community area in the 27th Ward. The applicant, Mark Goodman and Associates Inc. and their development team appear here today for the purposes of establishing a business plan development at the subject site. This request is being submitted as a mandatory plan development application pursuant to section 17-8-512 and 17-8-514 due to the fact that the proposed building will exceed 150 feet in height and the proposed underlying DX-5 downtown mixed use district, and that the proposal would seek to utilize neighborhood opportunity fund bonus. The subject site is located uh, in the West Town community area where the total population is 87,781 and the median age is 32. The surrounding area has an industrial feel with murals, at grade rail crossings, historic buildings, and modern office buildings. Proposed site located um, where it says site uh, is located on the northwest corner of West Loop abutting North Ogden Avenue, which is on the west, as you can see here, uh, and straddled by two Union Pacific rail lines, as you can see on this sort of aerial. It shows existing conditions uh, immediately adjacent to the site, giving you the sense of the industrial nature of the area. One is looking northwest at Elizabeth and the area that is defined by the vacation of Kinsey. See, two is the view north along North Ogden Avenue. Three is looking southeast down North Ogden Avenue. Four is looking southwest from Elizabeth Street. The proposed site is right here. 
proposed project is shown in red or orange uh, in context with other projects that are existing, shown in yellow, under construction, shown in purple, approved, shown in light blue, and proposed, shown in darker blue. Here on the left, you can see the proposed PD boundary in the dashed line. On the right, you can see its context in the zoning map. Here you can see the proposed site in context with major streets and bus lines along Halstead, Ashland, Milwaukee, and Grand along the pink and green line, and the blue line in the upper right-hand corner uh, at Halstead and Grand right here. This is an aerial view looking east, so you can see how it is situated between the two rail lines within the West Loop along North Ogden Avenue. With that said, I will turn it over to Mr. Richard Clotter with his applicant team to discuss the project timeline and subsequent slides. Thank you. I think your microphone isn't working. I can jump in there uh, while Rich um, works through his technical difficulties. Uh, for the record, Katie Janky Dale, along with Rich Clouder, we represent the applicant Mark Goodman and Associates on this matter. Mark Goodman and Troy MK are present on behalf of the applicant today, as are Jay Longo and Alex Shabel from SCB, the project architect, and Louie Abuna from KLOA, the traffic consultant. You could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, as with every project in the 27th Ward, um, this project received robust community input. As noted on the slide, we've had several community meetings over the course of five months with local stakeholders, including two community-wide meetings for which notices were sent to members of all community groups and mail notice was sent to property owners within 250 feet of the subject property. The ultimate building design was transformed as a result to reduce the impact on affected properties and provide relief in important ways. There was one speaker during public comment who expressed concerns, and those concerns were representative of concerns we heard, to, heard and to which we responded by making substantial design changes to provide relief to the neighbors. Notably, the height of the building shrunk by 40 feet and three stories. As Jay will detail in a moment, there's also a significant setback incorporated to move the building west, thereby creating a setback for the benefit of the condo building across the street. Also in response to uh, requests by DPD and neighborhood stakeholders, the original above grade parking was moved below grade, creating an important design enhancement and mitigating the impact on neighboring properties. Finally, as will be detailed on a future slide, the developer agreed to pay for and otherwise facilitate a litany of traffic improvements that were identified as neighborhood priority, priorities, even beyond the immediate zone of impact associated with the project. In recognition of this level of responsiveness, I want to refer you to the fact that we received letters of support from three community groups in the Fulton Market, which are included in the record. Let me now turn the presentation over to Jay Longo from SCB. Jay? Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Jay Longo. Uh, I'm a principal in, uh, at SCB Architects uh, and the architect uh, for the project. Uh, next slide. So this is an aerial rendering uh, looking northeast uh, at the proposed development. Uh, it's a 16 story uh, life sciences focused building. Uh, the, uh, the project has a lower podium portion of all active uses. As Katie mentioned, we've moved the parking below grade uh, and a uh, upper uh, tower portion of 14 stories. Uh, next, next slide. So in response to the local context of the neighborhood, we've designed the building in such a way that it breaks down the mass from north to south. So the south facing uh, mass is more glass and curtain wall and the north facing is more brick. Uh, and in order to break down the, the overall scale of the office building. Next slide. Uh, at the pedestrian level, uh, working with uh, the Department of Planning uh, and CDOT and also uh, potentially 
responding to uh, an additional metro uh, station in the West Loop. We've created a pedestrian throughway uh, on the vacated Kinsey between Ogden and Elizabeth Street. Uh, and in order to create a more active pedestrian experience, we've reduced the podium height uh, from the original proposal to match the uh, condo building across the street at around 40 feet in height. Next slide. So this is a, a view from Elizabeth Street, the main entry of the building, the lobby, uh, and our loading and our access to the underground garage is all off uh, Elizabeth Street. Uh, and again, you're seeing that pedestrian throughway uh, from the vacated Kinsey here from Elizabeth looking back toward Ogden. Next slide. So the ground floor of the building uh, locates, again, the lobby off of Elizabeth Street. Uh, we have a, uh, our public cafe that faces uh, Elizabeth Street. So it serves both the street and, and our lobby. We have our loading bays uh, off of Elizabeth and then the ramp down uh, to the parking levels below. We've located all of the back of house on the north end of the building, which is around, which abuts the Union Pacific Railroad line uh, and all active uses along the south, um, uh, which aligns the more than 30 foot wide pedestrian greenway that connects Ogden with Elizabeth Street. Next slide. So our below grade parking uh, has 123 stalls. Next slide. Uh, our second floor is a full floor uh, of about 38,000 square feet. Uh, for lab users, this is a, a very valuable floor, uh, given that it's lower to the ground. Um, next slide. And the sort of typical office floor plate is uh, around 34,000 square feet. We've got a, a roof deck on, this, on the west side and you're seeing the podium sunshades moving around the south and the east. Next slide. So again, typical floor plate of about 34,000 square feet. Next slide. And our top floor uh, has an amenity lounge and workout room with a roof terrace that looks south and east uh, with views to the city. Next slide. And then the upper level uh, penthouse. We've tapered that upper level, the upper two levels, to respond to the angle of the of the tracks to our north. So I will quickly go through the elevations, and then in more detail, uh, some of these materials will show up later in the presentation. But this is the north elevation. Uh, for reference, the uh, this elevation is right up against the rail above which is uh, varies in height from between eight and 12 feet. Next slide. This is the Elizabeth uh, Street side. So you're here, you're seeing the interplay of the two volumes of the glass and the brick and our painted aluminum screen um, uh, on the lower podium. Next slide. This is the west uh, elevation along Ogden. Next slide. And the main elevation along the south, uh, which would be along the pedestrian uh, greenway. So our section here, you, you see the building in relationship to the two um, the railroad lines in terms of their height. Uh, we have an underground parking level, a very tall floor to floor for our lobby, uh, and then the typical tenant floors moving up the tower with the amenity floor at the top. Next slide. So in terms of the materials and uh, massing, we've again used the glass curtain wall with a bronze, a decorative bronze panel, which is uh, recalling a lot of the original materials used in Chicago railroads. Uh, bronze doesn't rust, it was where all the lanterns and other materials of the rail line uh, were using. Uh, we have a blended brick uh, on, for the north volume. Uh, that splays black back in, in order to have the top rooftop terrace. Uh, we've got a, a green roof on the third floor looking out over Ogden Street. Uh, and we use the same bronze material, uh, painted bronze material for the sunshades and the perforated screen uh, along the second floor. Next slide. 
This is showing again a close up of the Elizabeth Street uh, lobby entry. Uh, we tried to create a lot of depth in the facade so the piers are set out uh, in front of that lobby glass by five feet. Uh, the perforated screen is crinkled, uh, recalling kind of the pattern of the tracks uh, and also to create additional depth in the facade. Then the second floor has a terrace that runs all the way around the building that's covered uh, so the scientists can uh, step out of their labs to enjoy, enjoy the sunlight. Next slide. So we have uh, an approved site plan by CDOT uh, and uh, uh, Lue Abuno has done a, a full traffic study uh, in the area uh, with the goal to promote uh, a more active and safe pedestrian experience all the way around the building. Um, next slide. We have taken great care in terms of understanding all of the different um, uh, concerns in the community in terms of the different intersections that are over in this neighborhood, especially off of Hubbard uh, and along Ogden, uh, that we're gonna continue to monitor as the building um, gets built. So just quickly through some of the design excellent points, um, we're breaking down the mass of the building again into different volumes. Uh, we're using a high, curtain, uh, high performance curtain wall in order to increase the daylight and access to um, uh, energy savings in terms of the, the south facade. Uh, and we're using a, a brick, bronze, and glass palette to uh, kind of unify all of the different elements together. Next slide. Uh, we've worked pretty hard to try to match the podium level with the adjacent uh, condo building across the street. So the piers uh, are matching the height uh, of the adjacent building and also matching in material. Um, and then we're trying to have a very, very flexible event space uh, on the ground floor along with a cafe uh, to, to have a, a, a more active uh, lobby that faces Elizabeth Street. Um, next slide. And the, the, the entrance is uh, at the corner here, um, right, right along that pedestrian throughway, again, trying to have more active uses uh, to have uh, a better experience as you're walking down that, that corridor between Kinsey uh, and Ogden. So in response to some of the concerns of the community, the tower is actually stepped back from the podium on, uh, on all sides, essentially. We've uh, created a setback along Elizabeth Street uh, and also along Ogden, which uh, meets the specific guidelines uh, outlined in the West Loop um, design guidelines. Next slide. Uh, and again, uh, that pedestrian uh, throughway has a variety of different paving patterns. We have benches and seating areas. We've got places for public art. Um, so the, the goal being, uh, given that this is the very northwest portion of the West Loop, that it becomes a really active uh, and pleasant place to be. So just quickly on how the, the, the volume was broken down, um, and we took the whole site and, uh, and, and created one volume, but then we broke that site down into a tower and a, and a podium. Uh, and then we shaped that tower and pushed it back from all sides and then split it down the middle in order to have the taller volume to the north, shorter volume to the south in order to have access to that natural light up on the top floor of the building and also have south facing glass uh, for the interior of the laps. So this is showing uh, the landscape plan. Uh, we're keeping the, the trees that are along uh, Elizabeth Street and along Ogden, uh, but using a, a pattern paving uh, based on the geometry of the rails uh, to create that uh, pedestrian throughway. Uh, these are the materials. Uh, so the brick is a blend of four different bricks that uh, we found in the neighborhood. Uh, we're using a bronze and brass palette, again, coming from uh, the rail line and some of the um, rail elements that have been through the history of, of Chicago rail uh, and uh, transparent glass. Uh, we are 
meeting the 100 point, or we're, we're trying to achieve 120 points uh, for the sustainability uh, by having a LEED Silver certified building uh, and also a well certified building. Uh, and we also, go ahead, next slide. And we are uh, working very hard to have the regulated development. We have the required both rate and volume for stormwater management with a detention vault below the ramp in the parking levels. I'm going to turn it back over to Rich. Actually to me, again, for the record, Katie Jinky Dill. Um, I'm just going to wrap up with some of the public benefits associated with this project. As a life science building, this project will contribute to the Lightfoot administration's goal of making Chicago a life science hub in the, uh, in the country. Also create um, approximately 2,400 construction jobs and 1,350 permanent jobs and result in an FAR bonus payment of nearly 4.5 million. There are a number of site enhancements that uh, we'll be making that will contribute to neighborhood beautification and traffic mitigation. We also will be making funds available uh, for neighboring neighborhood properties um, so that traffic ch challenges can be mitigated and landscaping and other beautification initiatives, both on-site and off-site can be implemented. With that, we'll turn it back over to DPD um, for the recommendation, but our team is available for any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Uh, the Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the materials submitted by the applicant, and we have concluded that the proposed development would be appropriate for the following reasons. The proposed development is in general conformance with the Fulton Market Innovation District Plan approved and adopted by the Chicago Plan Commission, details of which were included earlier in this report. The proposed development is in general conformance with the West Loop Design Guidelines approved and adopted by the Chicago Plan Commission, details of which were included earlier in this report as well. The proposed plan development promote, promotes economically beneficial development patterns that are compatible with the character of existing neighborhoods per 17-8-0103, as evidenced by the design of the project and the fact that the proposed uses will meet the needs of the immediate community. The proposed plan development demonstrates urban design per 17-8-0906-A. The Proposed plan development is creative and flexible and how it uniquely responds to the program and location per 17-8-0907-A. The proposed building provides setbacks at appropriate heights, which reduce the apparent mass from street level per 17-8-0907-B. The proposed project provides adequate, inviting, usable and accessible open spaces for workers, visitors and residents per 17-8-0909-A. And the proposed project provides substantial landscaping of contiguous public ways per 17-8-0909-A. Please refer to my staff report for further details regarding this project and the plans identified here today. Based on the foregoing, it is the recommendation of the zoning administrator of the Department of Planning and Development that this application to establish a business plan development be approved and forwarded to the City Council Committee on Zoning, Landmarks, and Building Standards as such. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Searle. Yes, just a, a couple questions and then uh, a comment. Um, the Was the vacation of Kinsey uh, a part of this development or was this already in place? It, it was uh, vacated a number of years ago. It's already been in place. Okay, thanks. Um, and then um, when you say, um, EV charging readiness. Uh, does that mean that you have the, the you know, conduit in place to make all of the parking spaces uh, available to be EV charging? Is that what that means? Or a certain percentage? A certain percentage, <laughs> yes. What, what is that percentage? Uh, I believe that's 30%. Okay. I believe we should start asking for 100% <laughs> when we know that, you know, 10 years from now, General Motors is going to produce 100% of electric cars. This is our future. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I would consider, <clears throat> you know, looking at that um, expense or for the developer to look at that expense anyway and say, wait a minute, are we doing enough? Um, and then lastly, I just want to say I really appreciate the 
connections you made in the in the uh, description of the design to the references that are around you, the railroad and the you know the bronze and some other things that you said. I think this building um, compared to the last one, <laughs> um, you know, does represent the concepts and the guidelines in my mind that we should be looking at in future developments in Fulton Market and in this district. So thank you for that. Commissioner Searle, this is Noah. I just wanted to add to your comment. I missed Mr. Longo's response on the number of EV uh, uh, spaces that he provides, but per the zoning code, he'll have to have, uh, he'll have, to have at least 20% of the total parking spots provided, EV ready or, uh, or EV installed. That's a zoning code regulation. And he said 30, right? Didn't you say 30%? Correct. Perfect. Yeah. So they'll be above and beyond the code. Correct. Right. I just want to put that on the I way. think we should be looking at that code, Noah, because we're building buildings for the next 50 years, let's say, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, what are they going to have to do when they need to put 100% in there? You know, I anyway. agree. <laughs> something to think about. So okay. what would, Thank you. Uh, would, would that be something that, the, that the, the city council would have to initiate? Noah, or do we? Uh, yes, yeah, so an amendment. An amendment to the zoning code would need a, a legislative action. So um, I think Commissioner Searle is making a really important point, and and if we're thinking, doing some forward thinking, we we need to follow up with that. So, um, and Noah, if you can help us make sort of make that recommendation to the uh, city council, that would be great. We can talk more about what that would take to do that. Yeah. The, the commissioner, the Department of Planning, also can initiate it. Yeah. Yes, we will. We will discuss internally, and we'll, we'll respond back through to the planning commission. I will have a response back to the planning commission. All right, please. Thank you, um, Alderman Burnett. Uh, right on cue. So, do you have any comments on this project? Thank you, Commissioner. You know, just like most of these, uh, there's there's most of these pro uh, most of these projects. There's always some pain with it. <laughs> um, um, well, one, and, and I, I failed to mention that with the last one, uh, they did meet with all of the community organizations. Um, the last one, they got most of the community support, community organization support. In this one, they not only met with the three uh, regular community organizations, they also met with the neighbors of River West. Uh, I encouraged them to have several offsite meetings uh, with the, uh, the property across the street, uh, with the neighbors of River West, and they, they went to a couple of other community meetings on their own. Um, they, uh, this wasn't the initial design. They incorporated a lot of things that the community asked for. Uh, there's a proposal working with myself in the Department of, of uh, Transportation to do something with, uh, uh, with, with a, is that Racine Street? To put some green space there uh, something that's needed in the community, the developer is offering to pay for that, uh, working on some things in regards to the transportation. Um, you know, this is a life science uh, building. As you all know, uh, life science is what's happening right now. Uh, every city is competing to get life science uh, uh, people in their cities. Uh, we're in competition with other cities to attract try to attract uh, this type of uh, development. Um, matter of fact, uh, at one of our community meetings, World Business Chicago actually was there uh, stressing um, to the community how this is a city thing, is bigger than just a neighborhood. It's about the city being competitive, attracting these jobs, uh, and that's in attracting these people to move to the city to help build up our population. Uh, it's gonna bring you know, 1,300 jobs, over 1,300 jobs, several uh, construction jobs, over 2,000 construction jobs. Money is gonna go into the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund, just like the last one, which is gonna help on the west and the south side. Uh, this is a, a good development, uh, and as I say, um, now that area has always been a dead area. Matter of fact, uh, Budweiser used to be on that property and they had a uh, large trucks driving back and forth. And before that, there was another big company there 
and there was always a uh, large semi truck traffic and and all of those things uh, on that property. This has always been a a, a industrial area, uh, and to have a office building uh, with a restaurant, with uh, opening up Kinsey Street and you know, Kinsey Street was always a uh, right there and Ogden Street was always one of those streets. You would want to go down to take a shortcut, but you was a, a little afraid to go down there and take a shortcut because you didn't know what was going to be lurking or waiting for you uh, on the other side. This would brighten up uh, Ogden Street, uh, bring some new life to this community, uh, keep it in line with all of the other um, innovative and, 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 and beautiful developments that's going on in the community. It'll bring a lot of uh, people to the neighborhood, a lot of eyes on the street. Um, you know, and I venture to say, uh, I don't know how actually how life science people work, but life science people in my mind probably don't aren't just the regular nine to five people. I think when they, when they start getting their discoveries in, I don't think they quit and go home. I think they stay there and continue to work. Uh, I think a lot of these folks are going to uh, move in, in, in some of these properties in the area. Uh, and, and I think it's going to be great for the city. So, so the community, the community groups that were in support of it negotiated on several things. I commend the developer for working with them and adhering to a lot of the things that they asked for. I appreciate them working with uh, the Department of Planning, World Business Chicago, and everyone else uh, to help to bring this place here, but also to bring uh, this economic development and revenue to the city of Chicago. Uh, this is going to fall right in line with uh, us, uh, potentially maybe over the years, probably after I'm gone, uh, bringing a metro station uh, over to this area also. So I. Uh, I support this. I ask the uh, committee to support it. Again, I, I, you know, this is another one of these instances where we don't make everybody happy, but this is going to make the community better. I ask for your support. Thank you. With that, do I have a motion on the proposed business plan development submitted by the applicant Mark Goodman and Associates Inc. for the property generally located at 400 North Elizabeth Street, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? Garza, I'll make the motion. Second. Okay, was that Commissioner Garza making the motion? Did I hear Commissioner Searle? Who'd I hear? Yes, yeah. Garza. Uh, Either way Garza. you want to do it. Yeah, I can be a second or he could be. All right. Um, Commissioner Garza um, so you made the motion seconded by Commissioner Searle. Let me go to roll call. Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett recuses himself. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Flores. Oh, I'm sorry, she's gone. Commissioner Gaza. Yes. Commissioner Pinheiro. Yes. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Novada. Yes. Commissioner Barkley. Yes. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Yes. Commissioner Shaw. Commissioner Shaw, no, no response. Commissioner Tunney. Yes. And Commissioner Villegas, no response. Okay, motion passes. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank next, you. Item, next item on the agenda is D4, a zoning map amendment proposed for the North Branch Industrial Corridor, submitted by 1521-25 Elson Adventures, LLC, for the property generally located at 1521-25 North Elston Avenue. The applicant is proposing to rezone the site from M2-3 light in industry district to a C3-3 commercial manufacturing and employment district. This will allow for the existing on-site building to be used a lot, utilized in its entirety for office tenant space. Item 2840-T1, this is also on the 27th ward. Fernando Espinosa will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Mr. Espinosa. Good afternoon for the record, Fernando Espinosa with DPD. The site is located in the city's West Town community area. It's approximately one quarter miles away from the CTA is number nine and nine X Ashland Express bus stops. 
The site is also directly east from I-90 Expressway. Most our community population is 87,781. The average household size in the area is two people per household. The top three industries of employment and administration, followed by accommodation and food service and healthcare. The site is also located in North Plains Industrial Corridor. In May 2017, Plan Commission approved the North Branch Plan, framework plan. The plan includes modern land use parameters. It includes three main goals to plan are maintain the corridor and as net, as an economic engine and vital job creator center. Provide better access for all transportation modes. And enhance the areas from incremental and both environment. The surrounding zoning districts in the immediate area are M3 3. The site is located again in the North Branch Industrial Corridor within Sub District A and the Corridor Opening District. The site is bounded by North Houston Avenue and a two story residential building to the south. In two story commercial, I'm sorry, in one story commercial office building is located to the north. The site is currently improved by a six story building. The surrounding land use in the area include a mix of uses, which include commercial, office, residential, industrial, and vacant land. I went on to move the presentation to Tim Pine. The applicant's attorney, Mr. Barton. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman, members of the commission. Um, for the record, I'm Tim Barton of the law firm of Thomas Raines, uh, attorney at law. We represent the applicant 521-25 North Elston Avenue, LLC. I'm joined today by Alex Pearsall, the manager of the LLC, and by Christopher Talsma uh, of Philoramo Talsma Architects, who is the project manager. Um, at the outset, I want to thank the Department of Planning and especially Fernando and um, Noah, Zafer Noah Zafranik for their assistance. Um, in this slide, you see, we're looking at the subject property. Um, it's improved with uh, an, an existing six-story building. It has 21 parking spaces. The building is currently under construction and uh, nearly complete. Uh, the building permit for it was issued in 2019 under the current M23 zoning. Um, this is a view looking north. Um, um, at the top of the screen, you see the Lincoln Yards uh, property, um, as well as the Home Depot. Those are the largest um, parcels. Um, you also see a little bit of North Avenue, um, which is a mix of small businesses. There's a doggy daycare and uh, an appliance store, a couple of uh, motor vehicle repair shops. Um, we go to the next slide. This is um, the view of the east side of the street, just south of the property. As you see, here's a small two-story office building. 
um, residential um, down the, you know, next to that. And in the slide on the right hand side, um, you're looking from Lemoyne Street, you're seeing uh, residential uses. Next slide. Here are some, a couple of views looking down Elston from the south. Uh, the subject property is at the extreme left in the left-hand photo. Um, again, commercial on the east side, primarily uh, residential on the west side. Um, you can see that also in the slide on the right. Uh, next slide. Um, so that, like I said, the building permit was applied for in 2019. Uh, the building will be completed this, uh, this year. Um, our map amendment was filed in September. It has the support from the North Branch Works Organization, which is the business and industrial uh, support organization for uh, industrial corridors. Um, it all, also has the Alderman Burnett's uh, support. Next slide, please. So here's, uh, here's a view again, looking uh, from the west. Um, it's approximately 290 feet south of North Avenue. Um, the location has largely commercial and um, residential uses in the immediate area. The corner of, Nel of Elston and North is somewhat desolate. Um, the lots on, the th on three of the four corners are vacant. Um, and immediately to the north of the subject property is a, a diner and um, uh, drive-in. Um, actually, I take that back. There's a small commercial uh, or office building immediately to the north. Um, the Kennedy Expressway is just to the west. Uh, virtually across the street is the, is the vacant lot that was formerly the Stanley's Fresh Fruit and Vegetable uh, store uh, that was demolished in 2019 and the site is now vacant. Uh, again, there are two small offices on the block and the remainder of the block South of Le or south to Lemoyne Street is uh, residential. Next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, the site, the site was formerly um, improved with a three-story residence. Um, as you can see here, the building is near completion. The purpose of the proposed rezoning is to expand the types of uses that will be allowed here. It's currently zoned for manufacturing. This would allow office uses, office uses um, beyond the 9,000 square foot limit that's um, allowed in manufacturing. Um, the reason that this is before the plan commission, again, is because, um, because of the change to uh, from an M zone to a non-industrial uh, zoning. Uh, the applicant has paid the industrial conversion for this, uh, this application. Uh, next slide, please. This is the site plan. There are, as you can see, there are 21 parking spaces uh, the parking and the access was reviewed and uh, approved by uh, the Department of Transportation. The site is 300 feet from the bus stop for the, both the number nine and the 16 North Avenue bus, which is at, on North Avenue at Elston. Um, this is a, a location where the number nine bus um, stops as a reroute from the, or as an extended part of the, its route along Ashland Avenue. So this is within uh, TSL. Next slide, please. 
And this is a floor plan showing what the proposed office uh, space would be. Obviously, it's an um, open uh, plan right now, but um, any future build outs for tenants will be subject to um, further permits. Um, Overall, we think this will be um, a positive uh, change. It will help activate um, this underutilized block. Uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to Noah, or to rather to Fernando. Thank you. And for the record, Fernando Espinosa, Department of Planning. And as previously stated, the, uh, the total project cost of this project will be six million. And the potential is to generate 100 office jobs once the rezoning is approved from M23 to a C3-3. Department of Planning and Development could review the submitted materials by the applicant and has concluded that the proposal would be appropriate for the following reasons. The change in zoning would not adversely affect the continued viability of the industrial corridor. The North Branch Framework Plan identifies office use is an appropriate use for this area. Additionally, the proposed only classification to a C3 is compatible with the surrounding zoning. Please refer to my staff report for further details on this project and the plans presented here today. Based on the foregoing, is the recommendation of the zoning administrator that the application for zoning amendment in North Branch Industrial Corridor be approved and forwarded to the City Council Committee on Zoning, Landmark, and Building Standards for approval. Thank you. This concludes the department's presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Fernando. Uh, do I have a motion on the proposed A zoning map amendment proposed for the North Branch Industrial Corridor submitted by 1521-25 Elson Adventures LLC for the property generally located at 1521-25 North Elston Avenue, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? So moved by Commissioner Searle. Thank you, Commissioner. Seconded by? Pinedo. Thank you. Um, before I go to the vote, do we have uh, a statement by the alderman? Or does he want to weigh in? Uh, yeah. Alderman Burnett, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so like the counselor said, uh, this has gotten the approval of the North Branch uh, Community Organization, which is the local organization over there. But this is an existing building. They just changing the use in the building. So it's not really a real change in, in, in how the property is going to look. Um, so it's just, uh, so I, I support this. I ask the community to support it. Great, thank you. Commissioner Biagi. Commissioner Brumfeld. Are we voting? We're voting. I'm sorry, we already have a motion on the floor and we're voting. Yes, there are no, there are no questions or comments from the okay. commission. I've got a first and I've got a second. I'm going straight to, I'm going to the vote. Uh, Commissioner Biagi? Commissioner Brumfeld? Yes. Commissioner Burnett? I'm oh, sorry, he's recused. Uh, Commissioner Cordova, yes. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Commissioner Flores? I'm sorry, I, see, I don't have a paper one in front of me. That's why I'm, I'm, doing, I'm making these errors. Uh, Commissioner Garza? Yes. Commissioner Pinedo? Yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Commissioner Moore? Commissioner Murphy? Yes. No, no response from Moore. Commissioner Murphy is a yes. Commissioner yeah. Novata? Well, Commissioner, Commissioner Moore is a yes. yes. Commissioner Novata? Yes. Commissioner Bar uh, Barkley? Yes. 
Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Yes. Commissioner Shaw. No response from Shaw. Commissioner Tunney. No response from Tunney. Commissioner Villegas. No response from Villegas. Uh, motion passes. Um, thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and thank you again, Fernando. Thank you. Uh, Moving on to the next item on the agenda, D5, a proposed plan development submitted by the Chicago Housing Authority for the property generally located at 4210 to 4258, 4300 to 4358, 4400 to 4458 South Cicero Avenue, 4800 to 4926, 4801 to 4959 West 49th Street, 4301-4359 South LaPorte Avenue, 5800 to 4958 West 45th Avenue and 4401-4435, 4441-4459 South Laverde Avenue. This site is currently zoned RS-3, residential single unit detached. The applicant is proposing to rezone the site to B3-3, community shopping district, then to a residential business plan development. The proposal will establish two sub areas, A and B, with a maximum of 725 dwelling units and allow for the development of several mixed use buildings, approximately 440,000 square feet of commercial space, publicly accessible open spaces and accessory parking spaces, all of which will be built in multiple phases. Item 20657, this is in the 22nd Ward. Nolan Zoroff will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Mr. Zoroff. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me okay? And can you see my screen? We can see your screen. You're a little muffled, but yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Again, for the record, my name is Nolan Zoroff with the Department of Planning and Development. The item before you this afternoon is a proposed plan development for Leclerc Courts, generally located between Interstate 55 and 45th Street along South Cicero Avenue, and including the address ranges listed here. The applicant is the Chicago Housing Authority, and they are co-developing the property with Cabrera Capital Partners and the Habitat Company. The applicant appears before you today because they are proposing to rezone the property from RS-3, residential single unit detached, the applicant is proposing to rezone the site to B3-3 Community Shopping District and then to a residential business plan development. The proposal will establish two sub areas with a maximum of 725 dwelling units and allow for the, allow for the development of several mixed use buildings, approximately 440,000 square feet of commercial space, publicly accessible open space and accessory parking spaces to be built in multiple phases. This is a mandatory plan development due to the number of housing units proposed, the square footage of commercial space proposed and the overall site of the development. And I'm trying to advance my screen. There we go, sorry about that. Uh, the subject property is located in the Southwest Planning Region in the Garfield Ridge community area. According to the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, the population of the area is around 35,000, of which 42% are white, 5% African-American, 51% Hispanic or Latino, and around 2% some other race. The median household income is just shy of $75,000 per year. The subject property comprises approximately 32 acres of the former CHA Leclerc Court's public housing development. It is located along South Cicero Avenue with Interstate 55, the Stevenson Expressway, and the Metro Heritage Corridor commuter rail to the north, vacant commercial land and a senior living facility to the east, an established single family neighborhood to the south and southwest, and the site of the future Academy for Global Citizenship to the west. Less than 500 feet to the west of the site is Leclerc Hurst Park. The subject property is currently zoned RS-3, and the applicant proposes rezoning the property to B3-3 and then to a residential business plan development. Adjacent zoning to the east includes a plan development for a senior living facility at 45th and Cicero, and another plan development and B3-1 zoning that is currently mostly vacant. To the south and west are neighborhoods zoned RS-2 and plan development 1476, the future academy for global citizenship. Uh, here you can see a diagram that shows the proposed sub areas for this plan development and its initial phasing. The applicant has proposed two sub areas, A and B, and will de develop the site in multiple phases. 
Subarea A includes a proposed commercial block, which will be developed first and has completed the design review process, and a mixed use block, which will be developed second and is subject to part two design review and a future courtesy presentation to the Chicago Plan Commission. Additional future phases are contained within subarea B and have only received conceptual design review at the time of this presentation. Future phases will also be subject to part two design review and courtesy presentations to the Plan Commission. And this diagram depicts the full site program and identifies which portions have gone through design review um, with the Department of Planning and Development. Again, only the area outlined in red, phase one, has been fully reviewed by DPD. The remainder of the proposed plan development, including sub area A phase two, the orange buildings on this site program, will receive full design review in future uh, during part two review. The applicant will be expected to work with DPD on site plan and design at the appropriate time and will provide courteous presentations to the Chicago Plan Commission with each phase. Uh, there are no DPD authored or adopted plans that cover the subject property. However, DPD and the Chicago Department of Transportation are currently working on the Cicero Avenue corridor study, which will result in recommendations, design guidelines, and site development scenarios for the corridor that may impact future phases of this plan development. The applicant is aware of this and has actively participated in the study, and they have committed that future phases will be consistent with the study's outcomes. I will now turn the presentation over to the applicant's attorney, Carol Stubblefield, who will further explain the details of the proposal. Ms. Stubblefield. Thanks, Nolan. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair, uh, members of the commission. For the record, Carol Stubblefield with Neil and Roy, offices at 20 South Clark, here on behalf of the applicant, the Chicago Housing Authority. With me today is Ann McKenzie, the chief development officer from the uh, Chicago Housing Authority, Martin Cabrera from Cabrera Capital Partners, Jeff Head from the Habitat Company, Roxanne Knapp from Knight Engineering, and our traffic consultant, Lue Abuna from KLOA. As Nolan mentioned, the applicant is proposing to rezone the 32 acre site for the purpose of constructing a mixed use development that will be constructed in phases. The applicant has complied with all notice requirements and obtained and uh, all of the required approvals from CDOT, FIRE, and MOPD. The project will comply with the city's goals for diversity and minority participation, sustainability, and stormwater management policies. Phase one construction is anticipated to start in the second quarter of 2022 and be completed in the second quarter of 2023. The project will create approximately 775 temporary construction jobs. That would include all phases. And it is anticipated that following the full build out of all development phases, the project will create approximately 675 permanent jobs. The development team has earned the full support of the community and Alderman Rodriguez after working together and collaboratively on these plans for the last two and a half years. I would now like to turn the presentation over to Ann McKenzie with the CHA. Ann? Thank you, Carol. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Ann McKenzie, Chief of Development at the CHA, and we are so excited to be bringing this to you today. It's an important site to both the CHA and the city of Chicago. The LeClaire site was developed in the 1950s and it was as home to many Chicagoans. As you heard earlier during the public comment period, Joanne Williams was one of them and she's been very involved in this process as well as our working groups as we do in housing authority sites. This is a highly visible site to the whole, whole community and the whole city. The plan that we will show you today focuses on the needs of CHA residents and other residents first, both renters, homeowners. This is about neighborhood building community. The plan we're going to show you focuses on what is needed to make a neighborhood with an emphasis on walkability to schools, groceries, health care, recreation, jobs, and transportation. It's such a privilege to introduce to you today, and Nolan, if you can change the slide, um, our team, um, which is led by Martin Cabrera, the leader of the LeClaire Partners, our co-developer on this. And I'm gonna turn this over to Martin to walk through the community process. 
And it's a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. It's I was just going to give you a special welcome and hello. Nice to see you. No, pleasure to see you, and thank you. Yeah. For uh, all having, been in, having been in this in this role as chair of the Planning Commission prior to my, my sitting here, so very much a welcome to you. Oh, well, thank you. And for all the, the staff and commissioners, I know part of my time being on the Planning Commission helped give all the input over those years to help make this project. But uh, I also want to thank kind of the CHA, and Tracy Scott, and Mackenzie and Andrea Safakis. Uh, as well as our Habitat uh, team and our partners. Also, special thanks to Alderman Mike Rodriguez, who has really kind of helped foster the communication, discussion, and shape of, of this project. So, and the DPD team, Commissioner Cox and his team, Gerardo and Nolan as well, for all your hard work and effort and late night uh, emails and responsiveness, but also to uh, CDOT and definitely our community leaders that have given us tremendous amount of input and dialogue and feedback. So we are very grateful. I know this is, uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. This is a mixed income, mixed use community development and which will contain multifamily housing and commercial uses and will include retail, healthcare, restaurants, a grocer, a daycare center and a community center. This project is bold and reimagining of what community neighborhood development can be. This is an opportunity to unite diverse communities and it represents a new era in Chicago's neighborhood development. We believe this project is a model for how to approach affordable housing so that it serves as a catalyst for economic prosperity and upward mobility in an environment where neighborhood residents can live, work and play. I think we're excited about the housing as well as the commercial, but I think the real spirit behind this development is bringing communities together. And we are gonna be bringing together black, white, brown, and yellow families where they can kind of grow up together, live with one another and hang out with one another as well and have those barbecues in the neighborhood and in their backyards. So that is something we are extremely excited about. The redevelopment uh, at LeClaire is the largest community in Chicago's Southwest Side's history. And this project will transform the 33-acre site along Cicero Avenue and serve as an economic engine for, for neighborhood revitalization. Our vision is to integrate the community and serve as a catalyst for growth, fulfilling a vital affordable housing need while bringing lifestyle commercial development to a vibrant neighborhood. This project recognizes the needs and potential that exist on Chicago's Southwest side. And the vision for this project is to integrate with the community and serve as a catalyst for growth. Some of the key facts on the project, uh, which are laid out here, are approximately 750 new multifamily kind of housing studios, one, two, three, and some four and five bedroom apartments. But also we've been very responsive to the community needs. And that's something that we take pride in. We've had a lot of discussion and had to change the plans as well so that we were uh, adhering to some of the needs of the community. And it was constructive feedback back and forth. We didn't agree at all times, but they did add a lot of value in what is now kind of uh, the project that we're moving forward with. So we're very appreciative of that. This will also create, as they mentioned, approximately 1,400 jobs and providing a uh, large grocer of roughly 60,000 square feet uh, to the location of which from the neighborhood residents, the top three things that they proposed to us was a fresh grocer, fresh grocer, fresh grocer. And we're happy to uh, let folks know that we will be having a top-notch grocer coming into the development. But also throughout the, the development, we will have murals of community art on different buildings. And that's something that would come up before Planning Commission and all the years that I've been there. So taking some of that feedback through those years and from the community groups to ensure that we we're gonna have some of the community art and having local community artists work with us. And for the units in the first phase, 
the range of some of the units will be between $860 and $1,050 per month, depending on the unit size and the income level. So we'll also have high-speed internet access, but also green and recreational spaces. And we have secured a healthcare provider for the site that will operate a full service clinic, providing pharmacy, urgent care, prenatal and elder care, and also dental and general medical needs. This is an opportunity to unite diverse communities and it represents a new era in Chicago's neighborhood development. This project will transform this 33 acre site along Cicero Avenue and will serve as an economic engine for our city and our neighborhoods. We can go on to the next slide, please. Here we'll give you an aerial view of some of the, uh, of the development. And one of the things the city asked us to do is to bring back the grid to the development. So there will be a lot of infrastructure taking place uh, with our development and also taking into consideration the safety issues of the school that will be right uh, next to us to the west. But we are realigning the grid but we're also uh, putting in a visual green passage, as you can see uh, a bit in this slide from Cicero, which will go extend about three blocks to the west. And that, that green passage, and you know, it was, it was uh, a lot of dialogue going on be, between uh, ourselves and, and, uh, and plan commission and staff, but once they kind of laid it out, we knew that it made an enhanced kind of the overall development. So it's something we're excited about and for having our, our development be a community development and that folks are, are being happy to walk, not just within the development, but also to the commercial sites as well. So in sub area A, as they have pointed out, we will have a grocery store as well as a medical office building. And, uh, as I mentioned, we're putting a lot of attention to safe vehicular and pedestrian access kind of through the site. Now, I know for the building materials, um, that's something that we are uh, encouraged about and just the design features as well from uh, DPD and all of the, the feedback that we've been receiving from them. So we appreciate it. And now I will go ahead and pass it over to uh, Roxanne Nett from Knight. Next slide. Thank you, Martin, I appreciate that. I'm Roxanne Knapp with Knight Engineers and Architects. I just wanted to take another look at the overall site again so we can kind of focus in on uh, what we're gonna be talking about over the next few slides. Um, that would be the uh, red area that's a little bit more transparent further to the north along Cicero Avenue. This is uh, sub area A, phase one. Next slide. So digging into this site a little bit more, you'll take a look at um, the two blue buildings that are where we're gonna focus first. The um, one labeled B1, the larger one, is the grocery. And then the other one would be the medical office building. Um, some significant points about this is that we will be providing 314 parking spaces, 125 of which will be dedicated to the grocery, and then 117 dedicated to the medical office building. Um, these were the two areas where the community wanted us to focus, so um, we're happy to start in this location. Um, the some of the significant um, contributions that were made in our communications with uh, DPD was the creation of a pedestrian walkway through the site, which you can see in that um, white um, vertical line that goes from Cicero Avenue to the plaza of the grocery. And then also the extension of what appears to be uh, La Crosse Street. It's actually um, a private street through the site but it was important to make the pedestrians um, coming from the neighborhood um, really engage with this site as, um, as part of the site and not an independent uh, retail space uh, just adjacent to the site. Next slide. 
So this is a visual um, bird's eye look, and you can see from this slide, um, not only the grocery and the medical office building, but that white line that, that uh, demarks the pedestrian line that carries through from uh, Cicero Avenue directly to the, um, the plaza, and then also the extension of La Crosse Street that uh, passes right by the front door of the grocery. Next slide. And then again, a plan view of the um, grocery itself. And here you can see the, um, the uh, loading dock area, which is um, protected visually by screen wall and landscaping. And then also the um, dedication of the, um, the group here to really create some open spaces. And the plaza here is a, um, a function of several different opportunities for different gathering types and then an entry into um, a cafe off of the, um, the grocery store itself. And again, um, at the very bottom, you see just the, um, the starting of the connection between the building itself and the, the site as it moves to the east. Next slide. This is a visual looking at the grocery store as if you were um, walking from the neighborhood to the south. Uh, really um, captures, I think, the connection of the um, community into the site and the fact that it's just um, a structure in the community and not a separate um, commercial development adjacent to the community. Uh, you can see the, um, the photograph to the upper right is what you would see today standing in this location. Um, and then you can see also how the building has uh, created an, uh, an opportunity at the corner for there to be a um, cafe within the grocery and how it opens up to the, um, the south and uh, west from here and creates several um, sitting areas for gathering. Uh, you can just barely see it, but um, there's also an opportunity for public art along this wall. And then also in this image, you can see how the pedestrian passageway connects directly to the building. Next slide. In here, we take a closer look at the materials being used. This will be a, um, a precast concrete building, but we have um, faceted it with um, uh, masonry on the exterior of the primary side, the, the east elevation. And here we can also see that the building itself is 24 feet in its main um, uh, bulk, but as it goes to the um, central uh, entry area, we do step up to mark that entrance. We also mark the entrance with um, a glass um, portico with a, um, a very light and airy uh, canopy above that. You'll also see as it moves to the south, the creation of the glass corner and um, bringing the scale down to the pedestrian. And then also a, a bit of a look at the um, plaza to the south. And then the bottom view here really, I think, captures the opportunity for us to engage the community with some public art. Next slide. Uh, these are a little less interesting, but they also are the back and the, um, the uh, uh, north side of the building. Uh, we do show here that um, there is more opportunity for art in these gray areas, and they can extend um, further vertical if necessary down towards the street. And then um, what you don't see in the top version is the loading dock. Um, that's because we've created a screen wall. And uh, what's missing from both of these is the, the, uh, the trees that will line the street in front of them. Next slide. Um, this visual gives us a little bit of a look. We go back on the upper left-hand um, image is the, um, the rendering of the site itself. And then um, just to, a little bit of a shout out to what we would expect to see. And these are other um, uh, stores and other um, buildings that reflect some of the things we're trying to do. In the upper right, you can see the, the step up at the entrance, the expanse of windows that brings the natural light into the store. It also marks the entrance. And also that delicate um, canopy that goes over the front entrance. And then in the lower left, you'll see um, a little bit of a, a nod to what we're thinking about bringing the scale down at the corner to create a pedestrian um, entrance and um, visual connection um, on that southeast corner. 
The other images uh, reflect some of the materials that we would be using. And then the fact that you can actually do a lot with a precast concrete building um, to make it look quite elegant. Uh, next slide. And here we'll take a, a step to the south and take a closer look at the medical office building. In this um, visual, you'll see that we have a, um, a one-way entrance off of this extension into the actual site that we're calling La Crosse Street um, because it is an extension of La Crosse. That one-way entrance slows down the vehicular access and allows for that entrance into the medical office building to be a little bit more um, secure and uh, slower traffic. We've also been able to add a canopy that extends and allows for you to um, exit your vehicle under, um, under cover here. That extension leads out to a, um, an island or an oasis uh, plaza that would be more of a garden plaza that would offer uh, several different types of seating and um, just allow you to go out and enjoy the open air adjacent to the medical office building. As we move to the north, there's a, um, at the northern corner of the building, we are planning for a uh, pharmacy drive-through that would allow you to pick up your pharma, uh, pharmacy needs without exiting your, exiting your vehicle, which we think actually enhances um, the safety of the site. Adjacent to that directly is where we anticipate seeing our loading. It will actually be tucked within the footprint of the building. And so uh, we hope to avoid um, any visibility of that um, at all. And then as we go along uh, Cicero Avenue to the south, the building actually steps in at the corner. It allows us to widen the sidewalk and um, engage with the public a little bit more. And then we've created a secondary entrance right there that will lead directly on the interior to that um, primary uh, reception area so that one reception area can receive anybody coming into the building from the public. Next slide. Um, this is a, a look at what the, we anticipate the building looking at, um, looking like from the corner of 44th and Cicero Avenue. The upper um, photograph there is what you would see if you were standing there today. Um, in uh, looking at this building, it will be a two-story medical office building. So one of the things about that is the public, they would like to keep on the lower level. It doesn't really lend itself to having a lot of glass, but in working with DPD, we were able to um, take a closer look at the necessity of bringing uh, clear story windows in the lower level um, and then lightening up the, the um, materials so that they were more um, warm and user friendly. And you'll see that in that orange color, which is a, um, a wood plank. But the, um, the structure itself on the corner really opens up to the public. It allows a little bit more engagement and um, a, a better feeling of creature comfort. The, uh, you'll see that the, the tip of the building at the southeast corner actually has a little bit of a dynamic to it and it raises from the 30 foot height of the wings to the 40 foot height of the, um, the tip of the corner there. And I think that this allows us to give a, a little bit of a nod to um, the adjacent buildings to the south that will be stepping up from uh, four, five and six stories um, in the next phase of the project. Um, next slide. Now this is a visual from the, um, the primary entrance side of the medical office building. Again, in the right-hand corner, you see what you would see today in that location. Um, this one also helps you uh, realize that that glass box um, actually um, translates to the inside and the primary entrance and the canopy um, that uh, allows for vehicular um, uh, dry access into the building and then uh, a look at the uh, island uh, plaza area in the front. And then um, directly to the, the left there, you see just the, the corner of the pedestrian access that runs through the site. We believe that this is an excellent opportunity for us to slow down the site and to um, protect the pedestrians um, through here. You'll also, also see that there's a, a great number of landscaping and uh, we think that that's uh, also been an important part of the, the process in um, really making this uh, a, a pleasant place to be and not just an open parking lot. Uh, next slide. Uh, these uh, elevations show again, the connection of that glass box 
um, through the, the site from the primary corner at um, uh, 44th and Cicero, but to its primary entrance uh, within the uh, protection of the site there um, and um, allowing the, the public who will be um, entering the site uh, vehicularly um, to have a taste of that, the, the picture of the building itself. Um, you can see the canopy there and then also the landscaping that will create that bit of a respite out in front of the building. Next slide. Again, um, this building, the, the wings here are um, 30 feet and the tip of the um, glass box is 45 feet. And um, here, I think it's a good way of looking at how the, um, the structure on the, um, or the, the envelope of the wings actually engage with the glass box and they, they actually peel away at the corner to allow for more public engagement with the building um, at that primary corner. Next slide. Um, this slide gives you a bit of a taste of the, the building itself. And then that lower um, right hand um, image is what the, um, the potential client um, who will be um, in this building gave as um, something that they thought would be a really dynamic and interesting look for them um, in their facility. Uh, we took that and um, created the image that we have in the rendering. And then these other images show you the materials, how they can be used to actually bring the scale um, down to something that's quite engaging and comfortable for the public. Next slide. Um, this one, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the transportation, traffic, and parking involved with the site. Um, the site was taken into account um, all of the feedback that we've gotten from the city agencies and the community and has applied it to our proposed plan. We have realigned the roadways, as Martin has um, indicated, with the existing city grid and promoted circulation and mobility of the pedestrians, bicyclists, and vehicles while facilitating the speed and efficiency of access for emergency vehicles to the site. We have incorporated raised pedestrian walkways to clearly identify safe and accessible pedestrian connections between the public transportation and the future buildings. And we have um, vehicular site access to phase one area will be highly visible uh, through highly visible drives located on uh, 43rd and 44th Street. So you will not have direct access off of Cicero Avenue into this site. Um, we also have um, some access off of Lamont Avenue at the top of the, the image here. Um, we'll include bicycle parking facilities um, that will be provided um, along uh, 44th and La Crosse. And we're coordinating these efforts with the uh, Divi station uh, with the uh, Divi as well. Next slide. Our stormwater management um, will be in accordance with requirements of the Department of Water Management Ordinance. We are capturing a 100 year storm and detaining it on underground facilities. We'll have a minimum of 15% of the site will be landscaped and vegetated. And best, pra best management practices under consideration will include bile swales, vegetated swales, runoff BMPs, green roofs, and and groundwater infiltration BMPs. Uh, parkway widths on the public roads have been maximized and vor vortex restrictors will be implemented at each of the ca catch basins in the public way. Next slide. The addition of new traffic generated by the proposed mixed use project development is projected to have a limited impact on the operation of the street system. The primary inbound outbound access roads from Cicero Avenue to the proposed development will be via, via signalized intersections at both 43rd and 45th Street to reduce unnecessary circulation with the residential neighborhood to the south. The eastbound approaches will be modified to provide ease of access and pedestrian accommodations with countdown timers and high visibility crosswalks will be provided at both 43rd and 45th Streets. And the eastbound approach at 44th Street intersection will also be modified to help improve the traffic circulation. Uh, next slide. In order to integrate the slide into the surrounding neighborhood, the streets will be restored again to the city grid, aligning with the south 
um, the neighborhood to the south. And in order to provide a more efficient circulation of the proposed development and the new school to the west, the traffic flow patterns will be modified uh, to help um, better engage with the community uh, that way. Next slide. Uh, this slide uh, includes some direct design guideline um, excerpts and how the team has worked with the city to meet the standards of the design excellence requirements. Uh, we've had a great opportunity working with them and we appreciate um, the communication that has come with um, the, the new style of, of working with the city um, in engaging prior to this uh, level of communication. So we do appreciate that. Uh, next slide. Taking a, a more uh, a closer look at just a couple of the um, things that we've dealt with, the park space um, labeled A was created as a result of the communication with the city. And it allows us to create greater visibility and a safer environment for the, um, the school. And um, as we see B, we've created a large pedestrian boulevard that Martin also mentioned. Uh, it's a great opportunity to bring the, the um, site, the residential site from Cicero Avenue all the way through in a pedestrian manner, creating a pedestrian boulevard, um, and another great opportunity. And then itemized um, by C, labeled C, is the uh, landscape buffers between the right of way and the development wherever feasible. Uh, we are um, working with the city to make sure that uh, the landscaping um, creates a, the environment that is um, really uh, desired by everyone here. And then D, the introduction of multiple public gathering spaces um, that allow us uh, to engage with the public um, in a unique way that is in connection with the buildings that uh, they're adjacent to. Slide. Uh, sustainability is very important to our team and we do take pride in being uh, responsible stewards for our built environment. Um, every uh, member of the team has a role to play in the pursuit of uh, climate resiliency. And that's not only from the design, but it goes through to the commitments by the developer and the CHA and the commitment of our um, construction uh, partners as well. Uh, from the selection of environmentally, environmental product declaration materials, the reduction of energy and water waste in the infrastructure design, the diversion of construction waste from landfills, um, to the possible implementation of solar panels, rooftop gardens, and even urban beekeeping. Um, from this, I will hand it over to Anne. Thank you, Roxanne. Um, so I promised you a dream team and I hope I delivered. Um, we really, really um, are excited about this audacious plan. As you heard um, from Nolan, we will be back many, many times. This is a multi-phase development. Um, if you could turn to the next slide, Nolan. Um, so I'm here though to, to speak to our favorite topic, affordability. We are the Chicago Housing Authority. We are completely aligned with the Department of Housing and the City of Chicago on affordability. Um, we will exceed 50% um, affordable on this because we are bringing back our own residents. We have residents with the right to return. We will have a wait list for CHA residents on this. We have made a commitment to at least 183. I don't remember how we came up with that number for CHA. Um, but in addition to that, there will be many more tax credit. One thing to note is there's always a little bit of a mismatch between the Chicago Housing Authority and tax credit limits. Um, we go to 80% of area median income. We have very few residents between 60 and 80%, but I just wanted to point that out. So I think it's always worthwhile for people to know that. Um, and then we're even looking at for sale on this and affordability for that, but more to come on that. On the next slide, Nolan. The benefits to the public, the community. This is my favorite, favorite topic here. Um, Housing, housing, housing is what we talk about, but when we have a big site like this, it's really neighborhood also. Um, we at the CHA are about building neighborhood and creating a wonderful opportunity for first and foremost, our low-income residents to live in mixed income communities like the rest of us in Chicago. Our residents are residents of Chicago, just like you and me. 
Um, so we're excited about all of these. I will read through all of them. Um, High-speed internet, we know the importance of that. That's been hugely important. That's been a big topic at CHA over the last two years. We need our residents, um, like every other Chicagoan, to be able to study and work from home. So we're very excited about that. Um, the green space, the, the number of trees. We've had numerous conversations internally about trees, gardens, and um, walkability of this site. Next to housing, the most important thing we talk about at CHA regularly is jobs, 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 jobs. Um, we will be kept honest by I told you about the Leclerc Working Group. They're pushing for jobs. And of course, Alderman Rodriguez, this has been the constant topic we understand it's incredibly important to us. We have what is called a section three program. If you ever wanna know more, please contact me at CHA and I'll tell you about that. Because of jobs, um, that's why we're looking at what uses should be here and also access to jobs. That's why we love this as a transit oriented development. You have um, the city's participation goals. Um, up for MBEWBE, and you've got a partner here as a sister agency. We also have MWBE goals. Um, so we have not had any trouble. We are not at all concerned about reaching the MWBE goals or the 50% participation from Chicago residents. We look forward to bringing results that exceed those. Um, back to you. And on that note, Nolan, it's back to you. Thank you. Uh, the Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the materials submitted by the applicant and has concluded that the proposal would be appropriate for the following reasons. It promotes economically beneficial development patterns um, as evidenced by the redevelopment of land that has been vacant for years, um, the provision of more than 700 units of housing and 400,000 square feet of retail and office space. It is compatible with the character of the surrounding area in terms of uses, density, and building scale uh, by reestablishing a commercial frontage along Cicero Avenue and scaling height and density appropriately to meet lower density residential areas to the south and west. It provides accessible open space and recreation areas for residents and workers and landscapes open areas on the site. It reinforces desirable urban features within the area by reestablishing the commercial frontage, developing vacant land, and providing generous pedestrian realm improvements and it complies with the PD standards established in 17-13-0600. Please refer to my staff report for further details regarding this project and the plans identified here today. Based on the foregoing, it is the recommendation of the Zoning Administrator of the Department of Planning and Development that this application to establish a residential business plan development be approved and forwarded to the City Council Committee on Zoning, Landmarks, and Building Standards as such. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions from Commissioners? Go ahead, Commissioner Garza. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chairwoman. Um, I don't, I don't have any questions. I just have to say that, wow, what an incredible project! I mean, so thought out, and um, uh, the fact that they uh, plan for a federally qualified health center as the one commissioner that has thirty years experience administering a healthcare system in the Chicago metro area. I can tell you that. Uh, I think if nothing else, we've seen in the last 20 months or so how desperate we are for healthcare resources and especially in communities of color, underserved communities. And for these guys that have built that in, uh, I think it's so forward thinking and, and really necessary today. And so I just wanna commend uh, Mr. Camrera, who I've always known to be very community minded in really all communities uh, throughout the city. So great project, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Commissioner. Commissioner Gray is followed by uh, Commissioner Burnett. Thank you. Um, if Ms. McKenzie can speak more to the uh, to the housing component, so she mentioned more than 50%. Is that means that the other less than 50 is going to be market rate? Um, so I want to understand if this is going to be um, like a, 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 in the past, a one third, one third, one third or not. So... I will appreciate that information. Sure, I appreciate that. Um, right now we are um, assuming that this will be approximately um, 60 to 70% affordable. 
I want to be clear though on what we're calling affordable. So I don't, I, I wanted to be careful. If you do home ownership, this affordability might be at 100% or 100%, 120% of the AMI. If there is a, some success when we get to an idea of a, of a, um, of home ownership. So the initial phase is much more, um, I think, a 70% um, affordable and about 30% market. Yeah, no, I understand uh, when it comes to affordability, the income limits are much, much higher. My concern is the rental units. That's what I want to understand. What's going to be the affordability for the rental that does not include the CHA, uh, uh, the public housing component? I'm, I'm looking for, as the community is 50% is, is Latina currently, I'm looking for opportunities for Latino families to be able to rent. And we know that Latino families, most of them do not hold the CHA voucher. So that's, that's kind of my interest to understand the level of affordability for the rentals. I, I, I really appreciate that, Commissioner. And um, Jeff Head, I think, has the exact numbers, which is why he raised his hand, I'm assuming. Jeff Head from Habitat. I, I didn't raise my hand to give the exact numbers, but I did want to um, uh, speak to Commissioner Reyes. Um, the, the project, the, we, have, we have two applications for tax credits for the two buildings uh, along Cicero as the first phase. Um, they're, in, they're into the city and we hope to hear back on those um, uh, when the city announces the tax credit awards later this year. Uh, in both cases, uh, the affordability, the, the, roughly 90% of the units are affordable uh, in, under our application, um, and uh, they're affordable under, under tax credit uh, rules and regulations. Going forward into the, to the later phases, you know, I think that we're going to look at uh, uh, balancing the, the, the needs and the opportunities Certainly, in, um, based on the current uh, uh, conditions in the community, I think we would continue to be in that higher 80 to 90 percent uh, affordable in the uh, uh, for, for the for the development on the rental side. Any uh, any for sale would be an affordable for sale product. Does that answer your question? So you, you mentioned 80% AMI for the rentals? So, so I, I mean, we, we always, there's always these kind of, you know, cross categories that don't, um, that, that don't meet up perfectly with the CHA units and the, and the tax credits. As you know, the CHA affordability goes up mm -hmm. to, up to yeah. 80%. Uh, the tax credits go up to 60, at least under the current conditions, which I know you're familiar with, with not being able to do the um, income averaging. And so whether the, the income averaging um, uh, uh, regulations get sorted out over the next several months, or whether we need to kind of sort of carve a couple of, carve a handful of units out of the tax credit allocation so that they can be set aside for CHA, renters that are um, with, with higher incomes, we'll sort that out. But I think that um, what I'm saying to you is this is gonna be predominantly affordable development and um, with, you know, with the minimums that, that Ann outlined in terms of uh, 183 CHA residents um, returning to the site, potentially more than that. And, uh, and, and also going forward with, with the, uh, with the future development, I would expect the, the, uh, the, the numbers that Ann outlined at 70% are minimums, and I would expect that they will exceed those minimums. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Reyes, just to make a quick comment, uh, I think when we looked at the overall development and we know that the Southwest side is very different from the North side where you have low income affordable and market right on top of one another. So the price variation, uh, there isn't much difference. But when we looked at the, for some for sale opportunities, because we do want families to own homes as well, mm -hmm. the cost to build each, uh, each building would far exceed what the current market was. So the intent is to 
and possibly in phase three to have some market rate units for families uh, to buy. But yeah, no, I, I totally understand. And I am not a proponent at all of making a family that is earning 60 or 70% of my homeowner. That, that's not what I'm asking for because I know that creates other challenges. My main concern is the affordability within the rental affordable housing, particularly because what I said earlier, around seven, eight percent of Latinos are able to hold a CHA voucher. So uh, we really need to provide just economical rent. So families from the community will be, you know, will be able to rent from this beautiful development. I, I do want to make clear there will be a wait list for this, and presently our wait lists are mm -hmm. open. So these will not be from our housing choice voucher where you are right commissioned that is a closed waiting list. Um, this will have a waiting list that will be open. So once yeah. our right to return residents are, are housed, there will be a waiting list that anyone can join. Right. It it will be it will be a like clear, you know, a site wait list. So yes, it will give an opportunity to Latino families. But again, Latino families, as you might know, Anne, have other challenges for which they are not able to apply to those opportunities. So that's why I'm always advocating for just cheap rent, you know, simple. Thank you, Commissioner Reyes. Commissioner Burnett. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I actually used to have a, one of my sisters actually used to stay in Leclerc Courts. Uh, and I was very familiar to with the uh, the only little uh, mom and pop grocery store that was down the street on Cicero, Miss Simmons. She actually used to do a ministry at the at the jail. Uh, it was a very nice lady, but she actually owned a home over there. Uh, that's a very unique community. It always have been a mixed community, uh, mix in incomes and and mix in uh, in ethnicity. Um, Matter of fact, there's a lot of nice homes just around that neighborhood. Uh, so I think it's uh, only fitting to have some, some market rate housing buy it. Um, those folks who bought over there move next to public housing and, uh, and, and welcome, welcome uh, living over there. Uh, I want to commend uh, my colleague, uh, Mike Rodriguez, um, and everyone is involved with this, uh, this development, uh, Martin, uh, we commend you for, uh, you know, coming down and, and helping folks and not forgetting where you come from. Uh, we know uh, this isn't about money for you because uh, you're getting more bang for your buck doing other things. Uh, we understand that you care about the, uh, about helping people and about the community. So we appreciate you and everyone that's on your team. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of uh, concerned about the same question. I know that you, you, you spoke about uh, the 183 CHA residents who have the right to return. Um, I remember this, uh, you know, years ago, my wife, my wife, my sister lived over there over 20 years ago. Uh, and just like with all of the things that happened with all of the public housing, uh, they tore it out, tore them down, moved folks out, and told them they were going to be able to come back. Can you tell me um, uh, how how many, so what's the, and I think this is what the commissioner was trying to ask, what is the percentage of CHA? What is the percentage of affordable? What is the percentage of market rate? Alderman Burnett, is that um, we will be coming back on a phase-by-phase -phase basis. Um, I'm anticipating that the CHA is going to be, um, I would guess about 40%. Um, and then we'll have an affordable, as, um, as Jack had pointed out, and we'll have a probably small market for the first couple of phases. Um, I do want to make clear that if anyone does know people with the right to return, um, who, who believe they do have one, they should be getting in touch with CHA. Um, and we are not just voting for the right to return, we're getting beyond that with that number. Yeah. So, so it's going to be 40 percent. So, so I, I, I think that's fine. I don't know how how vacant the buildings were before you all had everyone 
to move out like some of these other buildings around town. But I think that that's okay. Uh, and, and I mentioned Miss Simmons grocery store. She had a little mom pop grocery store. Uh, she knew everyone in the community. All of the kids bought their candy there. And then she died. Uh, she died several years ago. And when she died, that grocery store closed. And when that grocery store closed, there was a food desert in that neighborhood. Um, everything, all of the other businesses in that community is really geared toward folks going to the airport. You know, it's not really geared toward a, a neighborhood and a community. So I think it's, it's uh, you know, very commendable that you all are putting a grocery store back. I know everyone over there, they're going to love it. Uh, that's going to bring jobs to folks in the neighborhood also. Um, but that's, I think that's fantastic. Also, I think it's great that you all are being holistic and, and bringing the health center there. I think that's wonderful too, uh, because it's probably a health center um, void in the neighborhood also, and folks have to travel far to uh, get the health. I commend this development. I, I like the team that you have. Uh, you have some good folks on there. Uh, you blessed to have Jeff Head and Habitat because they were the receivers on a lot of these properties. So they they understand the deal inside and out, right? Uh, I, I've sat around the table with Jeff with the stuff in Cabrini Green and Henry Horner and some of the other things that's going on uh, years ago. Um, so that's that's unique. Um, Millhouse is a, is a great developer. I'm more, um, they're great develop, developers and all of the other folks on your team uh, are good and they, and, and you have folks uh, on your team, Martin, who really care about the community. They really care about, you know, they all are successful in their own right, but they also care about bringing people up. And I think that's unique. I think this is a beautiful development. Um, I commend you all again, uh, Mike, I, I commend you. Uh, I don't know, I think this was always, I don't know if this was always switched between um, the former alderman uh, and and Zalewski between Zalewski and uh, and and the other alderman, they were always. I know um, they were always fighting to keep this area because it's good people uh, in this community. And uh, so I commend you on, you know, keeping it mixed up and and making sure everyone have opportunity to live over there. Uh, congratulations to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Commissioner Villegas. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I also want to congratulate my colleague, Alderman Rodriguez, and also um, congratulate um, the uh, lead developer, uh, Martin Cabrera, who has been working on this project for quite some time. Uh, and being a product of uh, CHA housing as a young boy uh, at Lathrop uh, Homes, it's uh, great to see that uh, these projects and these developments and these neighborhoods are getting these types of uh, developments that could fit anywhere in the city um, and not just you know putting projects that are less than what the community deserves um, this is exciting to see this type of project especially with the economic engine of, of midway down the block it allows for employment I think this is would will continue to spur development along Cicero Avenue as Alderman Rodriguez likes to say the, the gateway to midway um, I think that this is an exciting project and I wholeheartedly support, support this project. Uh, and I look forward to, to uh, touring it at some point when it's uh, completed. So congratulations, uh, Alderman uh, Rodriguez, as well as uh, the developer Martin Cabrera for, for your vision and for your commitment to the city of Chicago. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Brumfeld. Uh I'll, I'll keep my comments brief because uh, I know there's others that I want to talk, but I'm just excited to see development moving forward uh, at LeClaire Courts. Um, I think this is, of course, uh, a new gateway uh, for the well-traveled Cicero Avenue. And I think as Alderman Burnett mentioned, you know, a lot of the retail and a lot of the commercial development that is there is really kind of more auto-serving. And it's, uh, I think it's a statement that uh, this first phase is going to start off with not only a grocery store, but also a medical building as well. Uh, and I just want to applaud the development team as well as CHA, especially because I think it's rare uh, that we've seen other developments start on CHA on land 
that is commercial and it is retail focused. Um, we know that the housing is going to come, but I think it uh, really speaks to the CHA development team that they actually focus their, their early phases on uh, non-residential uses and assets that are really gonna be beneficial uh, to the neighborhood. So I just wanted to make those statements uh, in general uh, and just really uh, thank CHA and the development team for what they're doing and anxious to see not only this first phase, but uh, some, uh, additional phases uh, in the future uh, moving forward. So uh, excited to see this moving. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Commissioner Moore. Um, hi, good afternoon. Um, Everybody has already made so many wonderful accolades on the project. I just want to say I also like the project very much. I like the community feel of it, the way it's put together. So congratulations to all. I do have one question about um, the internet, high-speed internet and Wi-Fi. And my question is just around, um, in, is that envisioned in the housing as um, being... Um, being there, like to have access to it, like to have jacks or whatever, or is that something that Wi-Fi is going to be like, um, you know, like you turn on a faucet of water and it's there? Because what I'm understanding now, post, you know, while we've been going through this pandemic, um, your internet bill is part of your, your utilities. You just cannot function without it. And I think to the point of the um, transportation we talked about earlier, having the electric cars already piped in for the next 50 years. We also need to be thinking about in these type projects, especially with people who are gonna have limited income, um, that they have as many of those services that they're gonna need to go to work, go to school, pay, you know, use those services. So that was my question. I, I can pick that, um, uh, Commissioner Moore. Uh, you know, the, the, inter the internet um, connection world uh, is changing so quickly that if I told you what we were going to do today when we go to build the buildings 18 months from now uh, and, and, and bring in the internet, it may be different. But I think that what, what we expect is to have a state-of-the-art uh, internet access, high speed uh, for, the, for the residents at the, the most minimal cost possible. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll be able to fill in those details a little bit more. I don't know that it was uh, completely clear when, when we started the presentation, but the, the, the design review was really focused on the commercial component. We're, we're awaiting the tax credit on the, on the residential component. And when we have funding in line, we'll come back with uh, a, a similar update to the commission so that you can have a better, a little clearer sense on, uh, on the residential side what the details of the development are going to look like, and we can include some specific information about how the uh, that internet component will roll out. Well, thank you for that, and I, I encourage you to really uh, think about that being no cost instead of low cost, if you know, you. it's feasible. I that. Thank you. And may I just say really quickly because it's important. We we are talking to HUD regularly about exactly what you just said. So thank you for for getting ahead of it. Um, that we consider it a utility. It's not in the utility allowance right now from HUD, but we are pushing um, from CHA and we are not the only housing authority pushing for that. So thank you for those words. Great question, Commissioner Moore. Thank you. Commissioner Lyons. Uh, hi, thank you. Thank you all for the presentation and the very thoughtful um, uh, design. I, um, I, you know, I also I think it's really exciting to see housing uh, more housing going up, especially um, accessible housing um, near uh, one of our economic engines, uh, Midway Airport. Um, you know, a lot of employs a lot of folks, a lot of great jobs, and I think um, having people be able to live close, jump on the bus, and you're there is wonderful. Um, particularly in a, a community that you're designing like this. Um, I also appreciated the. Um, uh, you know, the, the way folks were talking about the creation of jobs, not just housing, and that people could um, live and work there. And so I was wondering if, and it, I apologize if I missed it, if, um, if there was a operator for the grocery store, and if um, maybe we could, someone could speak to the quality of the jobs um, that, uh, you know, residents in the future um, uh, folks could expect to see on the site if the grocery store in particular or um, if someone could speak to the permanent jobs um, 
that we can expect to see. Another great question. Martin, do you want to take that? Or? But I know it, it is something that uh, it is a top-notch grocer. And I think the number of jobs that will be created full-time in the grocer are about 280. And the grocer is excited about hiring people from the community because it's easier access for them to get to work. Uh, but they're also, it's more reliable if they have to depend on uh, train or bus or car as well, which some of them will. But if they can walk to work, they're going to be a lot more accessible to uh, their job. And also, we do have the daycare center, and we built that in, in the first phase so that we can help some of those families that do need to travel uh, to go to work and uh, different kind of parts of the city so that it is there. And even going back to uh, one of the issues on the Wi-Fi, that's something that, that we've all experienced. And we want to make sure that our families throughout the whole development and in the commercial areas will have access to Wi-Fi. And we're also looking at solar uh, on the rooftop, since we will be having many solar, where we can even decrease the cost uh, of uh, the, the monthly uh, rents as well, if we can get uh, kind of more incentives for the solar. So it's something that we're considering and uh, for the jobs, they will be uh, roughly about 280, if I can recall correctly, uh, the number of jobs for the grocer. Thank you. And I presume since you said it's a, a quality grocery store, there will be uh, uh, healthy food options as well? Yes, fresh produce and uh, healthy food options uh, yeah. for the community. And I think looking at the community where there are black population, Latino population, uh, the community was asking for it, but also uh, we have the healthcare facility there as well. So it's uh, something that the folks are really excited about. Yeah, great, fantastic. Uh, Commissioner Cox. Uh, yes, thank you. I mean, there's obviously there's so much uh, to be excited uh, by this project. It's certainly my first um, collaboration with uh, CHA. And so I'm really proud after two years to be able to bring something of this quality to the plan commission. I also, um, this is our, my first uh, uh, venture with um, uh, Cabrera as, uh, as well. And um, uh, I don't think I knew as much about the life story and how much uh, this resonate, uh, resonated. I understand now why you're so passionate uh, throughout this process for this project. Uh, and then I, uh, I have to give a shout out to, um, to Alderman, um, uh, uh, Rodriguez, uh, he has been a, a steadfast steward uh, of this project, um, pushing and pushing and pushing it to get it to this point. Uh, and uh, I, it could not, quite frankly, have happened uh, without him. Um, I think the, uh, the idea of leading with the grocer and, and leading with the um, medical um, is, is, is masterful. I think it gives folks uh, a real uh, sense of hope. It's not just going to serve the future residents uh, who will be coming to this site. It's going to serve all those existing residents who are in this area. So um, I, I think the, um, the, the challenge uh, has been to try to anticipate <laughs> that there will be hundreds of residents. So trying to get the walkability, the framework uh, that you saw through uh, lace throughout the grocery the grocery store site um, anticipates the hundreds and hundreds of families. These are families with children. These are elderly who will be walking, who can now walk to a grocery store. So trying to get that framework in place before the housing is there, I know that that was um, uh, we really had to work um, to get that done. And I appreciate um, I appreciate the teams commitment to uh, anticipate that. I will say another thing that um, this site has to anticipate, which is harder to do, was what the future of Cicero will be, uh, and that we are moving away from an auto-centric um, uh, focus of Cicero to a much more pedestrian focus. So um, that framework and the work that we do with CDOT to make sure that it's a tree-lined boulevard I would just say that the site plan, you know, uh, I, and I know you are committed to making sure that the site plan um, responds to the future framework 
for Cicero. So Cicero is going to be lined with shade trees, uh, and that's not currently reflected uh, on the edge, uh, the 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 Cicero side of the building, of uh, Cicero side of the site plan. So uh, I know that again, you are out ahead of the framework plan, but uh, as the framework plan catches up with your site plan, I hope to see uh, a really robust pedestrian oriented tree line of Cicero in your site plan. So I just wanted to highlight that. But this is, um, this is make no mistake about it, very, very, a very special project to have a project of this kind of middle density uh, that's on the kind of outer boundaries of Chicago uh, that has to respond. It's not the center. It's not Carini Green. It's not that type of urban environment. It's a, den it's a dense but very green neighborhood that is appropriate for its location. So kudos to uh, all the team, particularly to Alderman Rodriguez, uh, this has been nothing but a pleasure working uh, with your team, uh, and uh, I look forward to voting on this one. Thank you. I have a question for Ms. Knapp. You said uh, in your presentation, I believe a couple of times, you made reference to blank walls and opportunities for public art. Can you talk a little bit more about um, the opportunities and how, how somebody would do that? would be able to have that opportunity or then what are your thoughts about that? Anybody on your team? Madam Chair, maybe I can answer that for you. Yeah. One of the things that uh, we wanted to have is a community feel and for people to, and even younger kids to, to look to see where we could put up murals throughout the development and for different leaders, local leaders, national leaders, international leaders, so that they know some of their history as well and so we've teamed up with a couple of community arts groups here in Chicago, one on the south side, one on the uh, southwest side, to really uh, look at how do we put some of those images up and have the community be involved as well, and even CPS students uh, from the art side. And that's something that we want to we want to make sure that we're doing because it, it means a lot to us personally, but uh, to have some of those images. So the next uh, our next uh, movement on that side of the project is really going back to the community so that we can hear from them who are the leaders that they want to see put up on some of those buildings. Mm -hmm. And so that we can have the other arts groups that we commission to work with us to start on each of those phases. So it's something we're very excited about and looking forward to having, you know, even the images of some of our leaders, when people are coming from Midway Airport, they're coming down Cicero Avenue. They might not get the best impression of our city, but we're rich with history in our neighborhoods. And even to see that development, to see some of those leaders and people driving along the I-55 can also see the leaders throughout the development is something that, that we're excited about. So that, sounds, that sounds very wonderful. And you're right, it's part of the overall theme. And I think part of the reason why we're all so excited because of that community feel uh, of this development. And, and hopefully it'll be a, a model um, for other kinds of, of developments. Um, before I go to Alderman Rodriguez, and thank you for being here, Alderman, I have another question. Um, is the site gonna be reme remediated? Does it need to be remediated in any way? Um, this is um, Anne from CHA. Most of it was remediated. We will do a new phase one. We're going through NEPA review um, because, of, um, it's because of the federal land involved. Um, but most of it was remediated previously. Okay. Okay, great. And um, with that, let me turn to Alderman Rodriguez. Welcome, Alderman. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Commissioners, uh, for having me. Um, I first uh, want to thank uh, my colleagues, Alderman uh, Burnett and Viegas, for uh, their kind words. I also want to thank our, our uh, community advocates and organizers from the Greater Southwest Development Corporation, Southwest Collective, and Hearst Community Organization for uh, being on this uh, Zoom virtual um, meeting and for speaking so passionately about their community and about our community and about our city and about this development. Uh, this has really been a labor of love for me. And as a matter of fact, on my first day in office, on May 19th, 2019, is when CHA awarded this 
uh, development to uh, the Claire redevelopment and to Martin Cabrera. Um, you know, ever since then, we've been diligently working on making this a reality. And I've got to say, um, its initial phase is far exceeding even my early expectations. Um, I like to state that I do have a very high bar in asking developers uh, to engage community. So Cabrera has done no less than 24 meetings um, with community groups in the neighborhood from the local school council at Hearst Elementary School um, to the, uh, uh, the community organizations that are so very important uh, in the community. Just last week, we had a community meeting on Zoom. We had a meeting with Right to Return residents. We had a meeting with the CHA working group. And we had a fourth meeting with community leaders and elected officials. Uh, this development has garnered support at every level of government from Congressman uh, Jesus Garcia, Commissioner Alma Naya, State Representative, State Senator uh, in the area as well, uh, as well as yours truly. Um, you know, this uh, development has to be about transparency, and I really appreciate all the back and forth that's gone on with this developer. They've really responded. Uh, and I know we'll continue to respond because there are various constituencies that have significant uh, interest in this development. This is the gateway to Midway. Uh, we got to get this one right. It's once you come off Cicero Avenue, uh, this is your first view uh, going towards the expressway. Uh, forgive me, going towards the airport or when you come off the airport, your first view in uh, what potentially leads you to the I-55 Expressway going downtown or other parts. Um, this development will be a driver of increased corridor activity on Cicero Avenue. We've got too many empty spaces over there. Uh, but when I see what some might see as empty spaces, I see an open canvas for beautiful potential opportunity and development. Um, you know, this development uh, is going to kickstart the gateway to Midway. Uh, we'll have traffic light improvements, uh, better pedestrian, more friendly uh, uh, pathways. We're doing zoning approvals today for, uh, and, 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 the, and the city council for these two buildings. And you know this 50,000 square foot FQHC, this health center is extremely important on the Southwest side of Chicago. But even more important, I remember knocking on doors starting in 2013 and 15, 14 in this area. Every door I knocked on, they had three issues. Like Martin said it, we want a grocer, we want a grocer, we want a grocer. Well, grocer is a coming, and I'm excited about that. Uh, but more importantly, our city needs affordable housing. The southwest side of Chicago needs affordable housing, and I will be a champion uh, for that. I'm glad Wakola asked the questions around diverse communities, and not just Latinos. Latinos, yes because uh, we are growing in the city in that area, but the historic black community there and the historic uh, white ethnic community in that. This is a melting pot space. Everyone lives in this area. So I'm so excited about the diversity that we can enhance here in this development. There'll be hundreds of construction jobs. Uh, I'm so excited about that. I'm also excited about the hundreds of jobs that'll be there permanently. You're talking about a healthcare center that might employ 200 individuals uh, full time and permanent in that 50,000 square foot facility. Uh, so exciting. And our Hearst Elementary School, which is right down the street is under enrolled. Uh, it needs more students. Now it's growing in population even before this. The last thing I'd say is since this development has become a reality and people are starting to hear about it, in the last two months, I've gotten more interest on development on Cicero Avenue than I had in my first two years in office. That's what this means. This is catalytic. This is changing. The Dunkin' Donuts on 47th and, and Cicero is going to add a drive-through. The, the local nonprofit is bringing in a, 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 across the street, hopefully, a local restaurant with job training. And AGC, the Academy for Global Citizenship, they're going to start construction right next door in Q1 of this coming year. So um, the Gateway to Middleway, Cicero Avenue are incredibly important for our city. This will be the most significant development on the Southwest side in generations. And I'm so happy it's in the 22nd Ward. It will remain in the 22nd Ward. Uh, I will not allow this to go away and it won't. And no one's talking about it. 
Um, but at the end of the day, this is about improving quality of life of our neighborhood residents, both brown, black, and white, but also about the improving the quality of life of all citizens in the city of Chicago. And I think we're hitting a home run here. I'm excited about this, as you can tell. And I thank you, and I wish, and I will hope uh, and uh, for the for the for the uh, kind reception of these commissioners and a favorable vote on this development. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Alderman Rodriguez. So this is one of those really exciting uh, projects that's, that everyone can feel very excited about. And so congratulations to all of you who've taken the time to put together such a great project. Um, with that, I'm gonna ask for a motion um, as soon as I can find my, um, as soon as I can find the document to do so. So uh, moved. Thank you. Uh, let me get, let me say here, do I have a motion on the for the record? I have to state, do I have a motion on the proposed plan development submitted by the Chicago Housing Authority for the property generally located at 4210-4258, 4300-4358, 4400 4458 South Cicero, Cicero Avenue, 4800-4926, 4801-4959 West 44th Street, 4301-4359 South LaPorte Avenue, 4800-4958 West 45th Street, and 4401-4435, 4441-4459 South of Burn Avenue. Finding that it meets the requirements for approval. Was that you, Commissioner Moore? Uh, it was me. Um, Oh, that was Reyes. Okay. Commissioner Reyes. Yeah. And, I'll second. I'll second. And, Garza, second. and the second on that was Commissioner Garza. All right, with no um, further discussion on the um, um, on the uh, on the motion, let me go straight to, to uh, roll call. Commissioner Biagi, I think has left the meeting. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Yes. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Garza. Yes. Commissioner Pinedo is a recusal. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Novada. Yes. Commissioner Barkley. Yes. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Commissioner Searle. Uh, Commissioner Shaw. Commissioner Searle left the proxy vote. Yes, Chairwoman. Okay, I think I thought I saw, saw, saw. Okay, yes. Commissioner Searle is a yes. Commissioner Shaw is a yes. Commissioner Tunney, are you still here? Commissioner Villegas. Yes. All right, the motion passes with a great deal of enthusiasm. Congratulations, Mr. Cabrera, CHA. Uh, we're also especially happy that uh, the return, the right to return is being executed. So this is, this is really exciting. Um, and I think as the alderman pointed out, it's very um, it's a major development on the Southwest side. So congratulations to all involved. Thank you. Thank you, sure. Thank you for your leadership. I, I would be remiss if I just didn't mention the amazing work of DPD and CDOT and others on this. I wanted to thank the city folks as well. I, I, I did not do so in my speech. I, I would be remiss if I didn't, but thank you, Madam Chair. You're quite welcome. Thank you again. Pleasure. Next item on the agenda is D6, a proposed technical amendment to manufacturing plan development number 776, submitted by the applicant, Alderman Derek G. Curtis, 18th, for the property generally located at 2850 West Columbus Avenue. The amendment to the plan development would, remo would remove approximately 28 acres from the existing plan development to allow for a rezoning of the subject parcel to an M2-2 light industry district. No other changes to the plan development number 776 are proposed. Item A-8722 in the 18th Ward. John Malloy will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their findings and they will do so in, in the quickest, most efficient way uh, and to provide us the information that we need. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Plan Commission. Again, for the record, my name is uh, John Malloy with the Department of Planning and Development. Uh, the, the next two items on the agenda are both related. Uh, again, this one being the amendment to manufacturing plan development 776 located at 2850 West Columbus Avenue, in the 18th Ward uh, and introduced by Alderman Curtis. And the following agenda item will address uh, a proposed new plan development application which will incorporate the property uh, discussed in this amendment. <clears throat> the subject 
uh, PD is located in the Ashburn neighborhood, located on the far southwest side of the city, and the, again in the 18th Ward and the southwest region. It's near the intersection of uh, West 77th Street and West Columbus uh, Avenue uh, within the Greater Southwest Industrial Corridor East TIF, uh, near the, again, near the intersection of 77th and uh, uh, Kedzie. Uh, again, it's currently zoned PD 776, and um, the current PD is approximately 62 acres. Uh, the amended PD will be approximately 42 acres. Uh, the, Population of Ashburn is approximately 43,000 uh, residents. Uh, of those, 48% uh, are African American, 36% Hispanic, and 13% white, with a median uh, median household income of about $64,000. <clears> Here's a map of the current PD 776. The boundary um, is generally uh, uh, Sacramento. I'm sorry. Um, generally Kedzie on the west, 77th Street on the south, uh, the Chicago and Western Indiana Railroad on the north, and um, I believe this is uh, Troy on the east, or I'm sorry, California Avenue on the east. Here's an aerial of the current PD boundaries. Um, <clears throat> there's uh, generally residential uses to the south, uh, industrial railroad uses um, to the north. Uh, to the east is a PD, which is a church. And um, along Kedzie is uh, industrial uses. Here's what the amended PD will look like. Um, the boundaries will remain the same on the north, east, and um, uh, south uh, boundary lines. The new boundary line would be generally Troy Avenue on the uh, west. Here's a picture of the existing PD. Uh, this is a uh, industrial development called Gateway uh, Park. Um, Gateway, this PD was established in 2001 um, and it was going to be a two phase uh, industrial uh, construction project. The first phase is what we're looking at here is a 600 and 60,000 square foot industrial development. Um, I'll go back to this aerial. So this was completed uh, around that time. Uh, phase two was to be an expansion of another 700,000 plus square feet of industrial space. Uh, that never happened. Uh, so in 2010, the current uh, owner of this site, Illinois Transport, acquired the parcel uh, and amended the PD once in 2010 to allow for this container uh, and truck chassis storage uh, use. Um, part of the development included construction of two smaller buildings and uh, generous landscaping along 77th and along Columbus Avenue. There will be no further changes to this PD uh, at this time. Um, so, uh, the Department of Planning Development recommends approval of this technical amendment to plan development number 776. The proposed amendment uh, amended plan development meets the purpose and criteria set forth in the Chicago Zoning Ordinance. And its adoption would not have any adverse impact on the public's health, safety, and welfare. Uh, the proposed amended plan development remains compatible with the surrounding uses of residential, commercial, and retail developments in terms of land use as well as density and scale of uh, the physical structure. The existing underlying zoning for this amended plan development, M2-2, um, will remain uh, consistent with other zoning districts, both adjacent to this site and in the immediate uh, area. And finally, the public infrastructure facilities and city services will continue to be adequate to serve the amended plan development and also complies with the re requirements for access in case of fire and other emergencies. The proposed amended plan development continues to promote economically beneficial uh, development patterns that are compatible with the rest of the character of the existing neighborhood per uh, zoning code 17080130 and continues to meet the needs of the immediate, uh, immediate community. Um, based on the foregoing, it is the recommendation of the uh, zoning administrator of the Department of Planning and Development 
uh, that this application for amendment to manufacturing plan development number 776 be approved and that the recommendation to the city council on zoning, landmarks, and building standards be passage recommended. Um, Alderman Curtis is on the phone, on the call, I believe. Uh, thank you. That concludes my presentation. Great. Right, thank you. Can we hear from uh, Alderman Curtis? Yes. Good morning, uh, members of the Planning Commission. This is Alderman Curtis, uh, 18th Ward. Um, I just want to say uh, one thank you uh, to the uh, Department of Planning and Development, CDOT. We've been working on this project for some time, almost two years, trying to. Uh, well, the 18th Ward is a is not only a a, a, re, a single family home residential community; it's also a transportation hub. I have two railroad intermodals, and now I, I have um, uh, Illinois Transport, which is the largest uh, container company uh, in the Midwest. Uh, right now we have, we're having issues with uh, truck traffic on, um, uh, on our arterial street, which is uh, Kedzie Avenue. And uh, I, I've asked the owner if he would purchase nine more acres to, to um, to help uh, alleviate the the problems with the the traffic, we have traffic uh, where where, where uh, semi trucks were sitting in traffic for over two or three hours, uh, blocking you know everything else. It actually sits next door to a dialysis center, which mm -hmm. is uh, dangerous. Mm -hmm. So uh, this a minute project uh, uh, PD would definitely bring a relief, uh, not only to myself, but the uh, residents of the 18th Ward. So we're hoping to get um, consideration from the members uh, to allow this PD to happen. Thank you. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. So I'm not seeing any additional questions or comments. Uh, do I have a motion on the proposed technical amendment to manufacturing plan development number 776? Thank you. I think for the record, I have to do it anyway. Submitted by the applicant, Alderman Derek G. Curtis, 18, for the property generally located at 2850 West Columbus Avenue, finding that it meets the requirements for approval. Moved by Commissioner Burnett, seconded by... Alderman Villegas. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. I'll go to roll call vote now. Uh, Commissioner Br uh, Brumfield. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Yes. Board of Visa, yes. Commissioner Cox? Uh, yes. Commissioner Garza? Yes. Commissioner Pineda? Yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Commissioner Moore? Yes. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Commissioner Novada? Yes. Commissioner Reyes? No, excuse me, Commissioner Barkley? Yes. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Commissioner Searle? Uh, I'm sorry, she left. I knew that. Uh, Commissioner Shaw. Uh, Commissioner Villegas. All right. Uh, motion passes. Yes, oh, yes, yes. Ahead. Sorry about that. Okay, yes. that's Villegas. Gets, we have a yes vote on Villegas. Thank you very much. Motion passes. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Alderman uh, Curtis, for being here. We appreciate it. Next on the item, next on the next item on the agenda is D7, a proposed plan development submitted by Abe Holdings LLC for the property generally located at 3100 West 77th Street and 7600 South Kedzie Avenue. The applicant is proposing to rezone the approximately 39-acre subject property from the existing M2-2 limited industry light to a planned development. The applicant process proposes the expansion of an existing intermodal container and truck chassis storage yard, which will include new landscaping along the western perimeter of expanded yard, a new water detention area, a new truck connection under the Kezi Bridge, and the construction of a thousand square foot accessory structure. The overall plan development will contain 51 accessory vehicular parking stalls. 
John Malloy will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Thank you again, Madam Chair, for the introduction. Uh, again, John Malloy with the Department of Planning and Development. Um, this is the same community. I won't go through the, um, uh, the information again, but I'll add that the land uses around this uh, particular site is approximately 41% uh, single family, 34.5% uh, transportation related, 8.5% um, open space, uh, a little over 3% industrial and about 2% uh, vacant. Um, so uh, this is the new uh, PD line that we're, uh, I talked about in the previous uh, agenda item. And this was removed from the PD, this PD 776. However, it'll become part of a new PD, which will connect with uh, the acreage on the um, west side of Kedzie it, um, that the alderman alluded to which is currently M2-2. And it'll be connected by a 50 foot roadway underneath the Kedzie Avenue Bridge. Here's a better look at uh, the uh, aerial. Here's the current operations of Illinois Transport. This is the new parcel. And here's where the connection will be along that um, Chicago and Western Illinois or Western Indiana Railroad. Um, I will turn it over to um, Rolando Acosta to go through the remaining slides and explain the project. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the commission, Rolando Acosta here on behalf of the applicant, Abe Holdings LLC. Here with me today is Bill Loftus from Spaceco who's been working on the design of the new facility, as well as Josh Cooley, who is the uh, principal with Abe Holdings better known as Illinois Transport in this community. Uh, I thank the Alderman for his comments. I think he has set the stage for us as well as John Malloy. Uh, so this project tries to address a traffic situation that has been occurring uh, at 76th and Kedzie Avenue. Uh, John, if you could go to the next slide. Sure. Uh, where, which is the, the current access to the Illinois Transport Facility. And we, it, the genesis of it, CDOT has been involved in, we should thank Bill Higgins and the CDOT staff for their assistance for about two years in trying to resolve most of the trucks that arrive at this facility come from the South. And so for when they exit, so they would come to 76, make a right turn, go to the facility, exit back on 76th Street, and then head South on Kedzie Avenue. It is that left turn that is causing the, the traffic congestion that has been mentioned the alderman on behalf of the community approached uh, Mr. Cooley and asked if he could do something to alleviate uh, the congestion by basically eliminating the left turns or minimizing them. He has gone about purchasing the property to the west, which will be improved to allow for better circulation on the eastern parcel and a connection that will eliminate most of the left turns. Uh, if we could move to the next slide. So you can see here the the image on the left is looking south on Kedzie from the railroad uh, right of way that is to the north of both properties. On the left, you see the existing Illinois transport facility. On the right, you see the new parcel, which is essentially a green field. Uh, the other image is just a, an image looking straight east on 76th Street from Kedzie. Next slide, please. Uh, image on the left is looking from 76th Street. You can see the semi-trailers making the left turn headed southbound on Kedzie uh, and headed south to what is the right image, which is the intersection of 77th and Kedzie Avenue, which is a signalized intersection. Next slide, please. The proposal will create a circulation path under the bridge that goes over the tracks on Kedzie Avenue, so it won't cross the right of way. And essentially all trucks will enter going eastbound on 76th. They will uh, circulate north and they will exit by going through the connection adjacent to the railroad tracks, headed into the west parcel, and then back out to Kedzie Avenue. So it's a right turn in, right turn out, no left turns or very minimal left turns required alleviating the congestion. Next slide, please. 
This is a site plan showing the circulation as well as the existing parking and repair facility on the eastern parcel, east of Kedzie, uh, showing the circulation in from 76th Street through the facility. And then at the, the upper end, you can see uh, the exit route that connects to the western parcel. On the eastern parcels, there's 46 parking spaces, office space, truck repair. The access is from 77th Street, uh, which is a southern boundary of the planned development. And there's a significant buffer green space between the facility and 77th Street along this. The next slide shows you the western parcel. Again, the connection up at the top or the north. The trucks will enter through here, circulate through the facility. There will be container storage on the western parcel, as you can see. And then truck exiting would be at the southern end uh, out to uh, to Kedzie Avenue. There's a small 1,000, approximately 1,000 square foot uh, building that would be located as more of a guardhouse. Parking will be adjacent to it. Immediately to its south is a large detention area with a naturalized detention uh, that has been reviewed and approved. This project has been ongoing for two years. It has gone through full city reviews on many accounts. Essentially 26 of the 28 required permits have been issued, including stormwater permits. Uh, and CDOT has extensively reviewed this, this proposal, as well as the Illinois Department of Transportation, which has regulatory jurisdiction over Kedzie Avenue. Landscape plan. Uh, we have a significant number of trees that are being added to the parcel. Actually, for some reason, this is not fully showing them on the east side, but there's over 250, 300 new trees being planted. Uh, there is approximately a 50 to 80 foot buffer between the facility and Kedzie Avenue, which will be fully planted. There's a buffer against the railroad track that also will be planted. And then a 40 foot wide buffer from Spalding Avenue to the east, to the west on, across Spalding are the fields for the Sarah E. Good STEM Academy. So we essentially are creating a significant green belt all the way around the property and also at the southern edge, separating this property from the southern private land that is currently unimproved. So buffering it from any improvement that would occur uh, to its south. Next slide. The building itself is a relatively uh, straightforward industrial type building with a brick, a brick facade and a angled roof. Next slide. So this traffic, this uh, entire project is conceived from a traffic concern that tries to alleviate the long queues caused by the left turns. I previously mentioned the 85% of the traffic approaching and leaving to the south. So that has been the focus. It seeks to separate the right turns. And the net result is that we have approximately 60 left turns. If I sort of do an average between the morning and the afternoon peak hour numbers, approximately 60 left turns coming out of 76th Street, that will be reduced to less than 10 as a result of the improved circulation pattern. That's great, gonna greatly improve the operation of Kedzie and 76th as well as Kedzie and 77th. Uh, and the residual left turns are really minimal and not sufficient to negatively impact the intersection. Next slide, please. In terms of green space there's, and sustainability, there's increased green space. There's a naturalized detention. All of this will help to not only enhance the area visually, but also help with air quality in the area. The reduction in congestion reduces idle time, which reduces emissions from the trucks and other vehicles that are traveling on the right of way. Uh, the areas on the Western parcel that are traveled by trucks will be paved, hence mitigating dust. Once the Western parcel is complete, the Eastern parcel will be adjusted to provide uh, dust mitigation coatings on the uh, travel areas of the eastern parcel. So even the new, the existing parcel will be improved. And we have a small building, but it's still very energy efficient. efficient. It exceeds the requirements of the uh, electrical code in terms of efficiency. It, it provides for low, wa low flow uh, water feature, water dis discharge. We have significant landscaping. 60% of it has been, is it proposed to be native plantings, which also is a sustainable feature uh, as part of this project. And next, and I believe my last slide, 
This is an investment of over $7 million in the community. It's retaining the 60, 85 jobs that Illinois Transport provides. It's alleviating traffic congestion, about an acre and a sixth uh, of landscaped area, two thirds of an acre of a detention area, 350 trees on site with dust mitigation on both new and the existing sites are among the benefits of this project. And with that, I turn it over back to John. Uh, thanks, Rolando. Um, the department recommends approval as the proposed plan development meets the purpose and criteria set forth in the Chicago Zoning Ordinance. And its adoption would not have any adverse effect, impact on the public's health, safety, or welfare, including um, the proposed development is in substantial compliance with the underlying M2-2 uh, zoning compatible with surrounding developments in terms of land use, as well as uh, density and scale. The proposed development will promote efficient and safe circulation patterns, minimize conflict with existing traffic patterns and mitigate traffic congestion. Um, the proposed development will reduce human exposure to noxious materials by implementing dust mitigation strategies and reducing vehicle idle time. Uh, the proposed development will reduce uh, stormwater runoff by providing um, 0.67 acres of stormwater detention. And the proposed development will provide a significant landscape buffer along its street frontages, minimizing visibility of operations from the street. Uh, based on the foregoing, it is a recommendation of the zoning administrator of the Department of Planning and Development that this application for the establishment of a plan development be approved and that the recommend, recommendation to the City Council Committee on Zoning, Landmarks and Building Standards be passage uh, recommended. Again, uh, Alderman Curtis is, I believe, still on the call, the meeting, um, and could offer uh, his support. Thank you. Uh, I'm not seeing Alderman Curtis on anymore, but I think we could assume he's in support of this project. And of course, we're very, um, very happy to have anything that's gonna alleviate some of those fumes of idling, um, of idling truck traffic. So um, this is this is a good. Looks like it's a direct response to concerns that the community have raised that the alderman has brought forward. So, um, and it was nice to get the cooperation also of the company. So I see your hand. Uh, I was just getting ready to go to a call for a motion, but go ahead, Mr. Cox, uh, Commissioner no, Cox. I know, not to prolong it, but uh, you know this is um, uh, just. Uh, um, to, to underscore uh, Alderman Curtis's advocacy for trying to resolve um, uh, the coexistence of single family um, and other public uh, adjacencies to, uh, to this industry. Uh, and uh, this is a very creative solution to um, thread the access road under the existing um, uh, overpass so that um, we could resolve uh, a, real, a real pinch point and congestion spot. And at the same time, uh, there is a school and playing fields adjacent to this. So securing a really robust buffer, um, the kind we don't normally see for these type of land uses was another um, commendable outcome. Uh, you know, thanks both to John Malloy and, uh, and um, um, uh, Nolan uh, Zaroff, uh, we've been able, to think I think, to find uh, a real, a really nice compromise. It's 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 unusual when these type of improvements actually um, lead to a aesthetically more pleasing um, outcome, and I think we've achieved that here. So I think it's worth noting. I know it seems kind of uh, perfunctory, but anything but. You know, uh, this is we have a lot of situations in Chicago where these type of land uses uh, are adjacent to uh, residential areas. And I just appreciate the fact that we're giving it its uh, due, due attention uh, that so that it will actually be an, an enhancement to the quality of life of people who live uh, in that immediate area. So uh, thank you again. Commissioner Cox, thank you very much. And to your point that it isn't uh, normally done, I think to use your word, um, and I think all the more reason why more attention needs to be paid into this, you know, because of the 
juxtaposition so often of these kinds of uses with single family homes or just any kind of residential home. And, you know, we, we know that there's high rates of asthma and other respiratory illnesses that are associated with, with intense diesel fumes. So well, this may not be a complete solution, but it's certainly, uh, it's certainly an improvement. And so a uh, big kudos to, to folks involved. And um, if it, I think we need to continue to look for those kinds of solutions, because oftentimes part of why you might have lower income communities or communities of color surrounding these kinds of sites has been because of, of the various kinds of red, redlining and, and lending practices that kind of uh, lead to people being, um, being forced in these kinds of situations. So a big, 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 huge shout out to uh, Commissioner, I mean, to Alderman Curtis, to everybody involved, um, to the department. And I think if we can see more of these kind of improvements, it, it would be a really great, great plus um, for, for everybody involved. Um, so with that, do I have a motion on the proposed plan development submitted by Abe Holdings LLC for the property generally located at 3100 West 77th Street and 7600 South Kedzie Avenue, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? Pineda, so moved. Viegas. Uh, moved by Viegas and seconded by, I'm sorry. Pinedo. Pinedo, thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner Brunfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Yes, yes from Burnett. Great. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Commissioner Gaza? Yes. Pinedo? Yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Commissioner Moore? Yes. Commissioner Murphy? Commissioner Nevada? Yes. Commissioner Barkley? Uh, Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Commissioner Shaw? Yes. Commissioner Villegas? Okay, motion yes. passed. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Villegas is a yes again. Uh, thank you very much. Congratulations to all involved. Thank you. Uh, motion passes. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is D8, our last agenda before we go to a, a report on on, on MBEs and WMBEs. Uh, uh, D8 is a proposed amendment to residential plan development number 156 submitted by Morningside South Affordable LLC for the property generally located at 141-171 West Oak Street. The applicant is proposing to rezone the property from residential plan development number oh, 156 yes. to DX-5 downtown mixed use district to residential plan development number residential plan development number 156 as amended to allow the existing 201 residential dwelling units to be occupied both as multi-unit residential units and as elderly housing. 59 accessory vehicular parking spaces will be provided and there are no proposed changes to the exterior of the building. Item 20740, and this is in the second ward. Emily Thrun will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Ms. Thrun is up and ready to go. Go ahead, Ms. Thrun. Thank you. For the record, my name is Emily Thrun with the Department of Planning and Development. The applicant appears here today because they are proposing to rezone the site from residential plan development number 156 and then to DX-5 and then to residential plan development number 156 as amended to allow the, for the existing 201 residential dwelling units to be occupied both as multi-unit residential units and as elderly housing. 59 accessory vehicular parking spaces will be provided and there are no proposed changes to the exterior of the building. The subject site is located in the near north side community area. The population in the area is just over 1,500 people. The average household income is over 106,000. Almost 57% of the households are one person households and 57% of the residents take transit, walk or bike to work. The site is bounded by West Oak Street to the north, North LaSalle Street to the east, a surface parking lot and a four-story building to the south, and North Wells Street to the west. The site currently contains a 13-story residential building and a surface parking lot. The site is located in a transit surf location and is approximately 1,250 feet southwest of the CTA's Clark, Div Clark Division Red Line stop. The surrounding land uses primarily include institutional and residential, and the surrounding zoning districts in the immediate area are RM-5, RM-1, 
RM 5.5 and plan developments 197, 467, 150, and 690. The next few slides include images of the exterior of the existing building and the existing streetscape. No changes are proposed. Are proposed. Um, no changes are proposed to the exterior of the building as a part of this proposal. Here is a front view of the building looking south. And here are views of the building in front of along West Oak Street. Views along the South Street and views along Well Street. The proposal is subject to the Central Area Plan adopted in 2003 and the Central Area Action Plan adopted in 2009 by the Chicago Plan Commission. Some of the goals of the plans include creating high density mixed use corridors that are linked by transit. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Steve Friedland, the applicant's attorney, who will further explain the details of the proposal. Good afternoon. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. My name is Steve Friedland. I'm an attorney with Applegate and Thorne Thompson, representing the applicant for this requested amendment. Let me first introduce, I believe I see that uh, Rich Carlton, hi there, Rich, here is, uh, uh, from our development team is, is with us. This is an interesting uh, project, and I want to first provide some context to all of you. Um, the, the, the property, uh, this 201 unit building, was originally approved and developed under Plan Development 156 in 1976. Um, many of you, if you're familiar with the area, will know it as Jenkins Hall. And um, at some point in its history, it was acquired by Moody Bible Institute. And when Moody Bible Institute acquired the property, and let me back up one step, in 1976, the plan development provided that the 201 units would be elderly housing. When Moody acquired the property, um, it uh, populated the building with um, 110 of the units uh, for students, uh, and then 90 units were still occupied by elderly residents under an existing uh, Section 8 HAP contract. In 2014, Moody Bible Institute amended the plan development for purposes of documenting students being able to live in the building. Um, as some of you know, Moody Bible Institute has been selling its property, and last year it marketed this site, but now that Moody's has sold it to my client, and I should take just a quick moment to say that <clears throat> um, my client is uh, a joint venture of two development teams that have a lot of experience in affordable housing and in keeping properties rehabilitating existing affordable housing. Um, Foundation Housing is a not-for-profit that does this all over the country. And um, uh, the, the other partner in the project is Pennant Housing Group. Uh, Rich Charlton is with Pennant. He's with me today. And um, their goal in acquiring Jenkins Hall was to figure out a way to preserve the existing Section 8 HAP units for elderly, the 90 units. But considering that all the students would be leaving, how to keep the building viable. So the purpose of the zoning amendment before you is to allow those other 111 units to be deemed dwelling units, not student units under the plan development. Uh, well, Emily, you can probably just go to the next slide. So um, as Emily indicated, she showed the pictures of the building. Um, this is a mature site. It's been in existence since 1976. Um, there's an existing parking lot to the south of the building. It has 59 parking spaces in it. Um, the 12, the 13 story building um, is in you know, deep, good shape. Uh, and again, it has been occupied all of these years. Um, now it's almost, you know, more than half of it is vacant because the Moody's students are no longer in the building. 
Um, there is mature landscaping all around uh, um, you know, the site. And as Emily indicated, what uh, the applicant is proposing to do is really not change really anything on the exterior, but to do a significant rehab on the interior of the building to upgrade units, um, including the existing Section 8 senior units. And we can talk about that in a moment. But I think if you go to the next slide, Emily. So um, this is a view, of, this is the, the floor plan of the existing first floor. And there, there will be um, uh, upgrades done here. The one thing we wanted to point out that we were able to figure out was um, to the um, west or to your left, um, on the site plan it is a resident storage room that has existed for a long time. And what they're, um, uh, uh, the applicant's going to do is convert some of that resident storage area to bike storage. So um, along with the fact that this is you know, a transit serve location and obviously the city's uh, desire and expectation that we have uh, additional bike parking, there will be space for at least 132 bikes in that um, resident storage room. So that's one upgrade. If you go to the next slide, you'll see the uh, floor plan. So basically floors two to 12 in the building have uh, um, a, uh, you know, the same floor plan. There are 17 units per floor. Um, overall in the building, again, there's 201 units in the building. Overall, 198 of the units are one bedroom, one bath um, units. There is one unit, which is one bedroom, two baths. And then there's two units, which, is, which are two bedroom, two bath. One of those two bedroom, two bath units has historically been the uh, manager's office, the, the, the um, uh, and uh, it will continue to be occupied by uh, um, someone who's uh, um, responsible for the building. Um, the uh, next, uh, you can go to the next slide, yeah. This is the top of the building, which is uh, called the 14th floor, but it is the 13th floor of the building. And it has 14 units. It has a slightly different layout than the other floors. That gets us to the total of 201 units. Go to the next slide. So um, these are elevation drawings of the building. Again, nothing's changing. Uh, the building height is about 219 feet. Um, the you know exterior is in good shape. And um, uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that there's just a few more slides of just the uh, different exterior elevations of the building. Um, but as I say, we're, we're not modifying that, um, you know, to, to any extent. Um, go to the next slide. So because the rehabilitation work is deemed um, a moderate renovation under the code, we do have to meet the 25, 25 points under the sustainability policy. We, we will do that. We think we're going to do that utilizing the transit serve location and some energy code savings. So that's that's our plan at the moment, but uh, we'll work with the city to, to work that through. Um, one thing, and it might be helpful right now if Rich has his mic available, you know, one of the things that's going to happen, hopefully when this uh, zoning change, if it's approved, uh, occurs, um, is that um, there will be a rehab of all of the units, including the units which are currently occupied by the seniors. And Pennant and Foundation Housing have done this, frankly, they've done this across the street in another uh, Section 8 building in the neighborhood just recently. And they do this around the country. And I think Rich can explain a little bit how they do that with the residents in place um, and you know, very sensitive to the fact, especially that these are senior uh, um, folks. Sure. Uh, thanks, Steve. Yeah, for the record, my name is Richard Charlton. I am a principal at Pennant Housing Group. Uh, we are fundamentally uh, Section 8 preservationists. So uh, as Steve said, we recently, two years ago, undertook a, a similar preservation and rehabilitation 
of Morningside North, located at 170 West Oak Street. Uh, and we're very happy to have the opportunity to do the same across the street here. So uh, it, it, with this, I mean, obviously that the first phase here is to go in for the, the amendment to the zoning that will allow us to take the next step, which is the, the re rehabilitation of the property. Uh, and, and similar to Morningside North, this is generally a like and kind replacement, uh, bringing major systems up to current standards, bringing uh, life safety to current standards, introducing new technology to the building in the way of, of Wi-Fi um, and doing, doing things of those nature. So fortunately here for the moment, we have, um, we have many of the units that are unoccupied, which will help us with the plan of the rehab. But those specifically for the, for the units that are occupied, we specialize in resident in place rehabs. As Steve said, to date, we have done just about 40 properties throughout the country, uh, representing just over 5,500 units in 13 states. Uh, I'm very happy to say that we have not had to displace a single resident um, through any of that process. And, and a large part of that comes really down to coordination, due diligence, and communication. Um, we really need to figure out ahead of time exactly what we're up against. And so we spend a significant amount of time with our engineers and architects and, and contractors looking into the building and figuring out what might be the, you know, the, the oh no moments and try to, to get ahead of those. Um, generally, we're in units about five times through the construction process. It's not consecutive days. It's throughout the term of the, of the construction. So, for example, we may be in a resident unit one time to do the, the, um, the kitchen countertops and cabinets. And then the next month we're in there for the bathroom upgrades and the next month the flooring, the next one for the lighting and then plumbing. Um, it really comes down to communication. We, we, a month ahead of time, the residents get a notice that we anticipate being in their unit on such dates. And again, two weeks out, same thing. And then the next week, and then a few days ahead of time, you know, either we've, we're confirming that we're staying on schedule, or if for some reason we've fallen behind for various lead time items, we want to make sure that the residents are up to date as quickly as possible and they know what we know. Um, we ask that they're out of their units from about nine o'clock till 4 30, 5 in the afternoon. While that work's going on, the contractors have staff that can help move larger items for the residents um, and for the smaller, uh, more personal effects and valuables totes are provided that uh, allow the residents to secure their most valuable assets. Um, and, and at the end of the day, when they return, we had, they had a fully operational unit and we go down the line and it's been very successful for us. We're very proud of, of our ability to accomplish this. Um, and we look forward to doing it again here at, at uh, 171 West Oak. Thank you, Th thanks. Emily, if you move to the next slide. Um, so uh, the ARO actually does not apply to this request that we're making to you now because we are not doing a substantial rehabilitation and we're not adding or, you know, adding any units to the building. But as I've stated, you know, we view this as a way of not only keeping this building at 171 West Oak viable, um, and you know, having it reoccupied by regular people uh, in the majority of the units, but it also is a way to continue to let seniors and disabled individuals uh, continue to live in the building like they have been for many years under the HAP contract. Um, the applicant will be uh, seeking to renew that. As many of you know, these HAP contracts um, are usually somewhat long-term, 10, 20 years. So their expectation is that they will continue that, um, uh, you know, for forever, uh, continue that in the building. And um, our documents under the zoning and the PD reflect that. Um, I think we have one more slide. Um, yeah, so uh, again, we, we, we do think there are significant public benefits to upgrading this building. Uh, as Rich just indicated, there's going to be, you know, a, a nice rehabilitation of units, which, you know, is, is good. This building uh, is older and um, there has not been a significant upgrade of the interior for some time. 
Uh, also, there will be 50 construction jobs generated and four new permanent jobs when we're done. And uh, in addition, the applicant is committed to the city's goals for minority business enterprises, women business enterprises, and participation of Chicago uh, residents. Um, thank you. Thank you. The Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the materials submitted by the applicant and has concluded that the proposal would be appropriate for the following reasons. The proposal is in compliance with the PD standards and guidelines. It promotes economically beneficial development patterns, includes a level of amenities appropriate to the project, and promotes transit, pedestrian, and bicycle use. Please refer to my staff report for further details on the project and plans identified here today. Based on the foregoing, the zoning administrator recommends that the application to amend residential plan development number 156 be approved and forwarded to the City Council Committee on Zoning, Landmarks, and Building Standards as such. Thank you. Commissioner Lyons. Hi, um, thank you for the presentation. I um, wanted to see, so is there a written commitment or a covenant that will preserve those 90 units for elderly individuals that are currently living there and a commitment that no one will be displaced in this process? And if so, could someone point that where that language is? So I'm, I'm happy to take a part of that. So in our bulk table, um, while the 201 units will now be deemed dwelling units under the code, um, uh, we have agreed and there is language that says a minimum of 90 of those dwelling units will be occupied by elderly housing residents or disabled residents. Um, there is existing right now a HAP contract on the property, so there wouldn't be any way now to displace anyone um, because, uh, um, you know, because of that HAP contract. And, um, you know, hopefully, uh, um, you know, the, the fact that the development team is really in the uh, um, business of retaining uh, Section 8 and HAP, you know, HAP contracts, uh, should give you some uh, sense that that's exactly what is going to happen at the building. But we did put in the 90 units into the PD. Got it. I see it in the bulk table now. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments uh, from any other commissioners? Commissioner Reyes, sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Friedman, so that HAP contract, when this is going to expire? Rich, do you have an answer to that? The existing HAP contract was renewed in 2017, so it has roughly uh, 16 years left, but as part of our preservation and rehabilitation project, we, will, or we are going into HUD to enter into a brand new 20-year, which is the longest of, uh, offered by HUD. Yes. So you so you're gonna you're gonna keep this one, but in this, in the process of renovating the units, you're going back to HUD to create a new one. So you're gonna start at that point with the next 20 years. For for, for mere reasons from, from financing to just starting anew under yeah. our ownership with the rehab, we always prefer to to go in and re-enter into a, a brand new 20 year. Okay. Yeah, and so because this is a hub contract with HUD, uh, nobody's going to be displaced. And if, if the ten, if any of the seniors is displaced, it will apply. They will have to comply with the uh, Urban Relocation Act. Uh, so this is for Commissioner Lyons. Uh, so this is going to be very closely monitored by HUD. I see you nodding. Does. Team nodding. Okay, great. What about Alderman Hopkins? Do we have a statement from him or is he here to weigh in? Chairwoman, it's, uh, it's Noah. He was unable to uh, make it to the meeting, but we have a letter of support from them and he has uh, actually worked closely with Mr. Friedman and his team to do just the things that uh, he discussed, which is make sure that the 90 units are accounted for as part of this amendment and that these mm -hmm. uh, the seniors that are there are protected long-term. Great. Yeah. So then do I have a motion on the proposed amendment to residential plan development number 156 submitted by Morningside South Affordable LLC? Madam Chair, Madam President. Oh, what I do, what I do. Mm -hmm. go ahead. Uh, Alderman Burnett, 
I just want to uh, commend the developer and commend Alderman uh, Hopkins on uh, supporting to preserve this building for affordable housing. Um, I actually, this actually used to be in the 27 ward years ago. And coincidentally, Jesse White's sister used to live in that building. Uh, I remember when the buildings got built many years ago. Uh, it started out initially being a lot of uh, um, uh, Russian Jewish uh, folks living in there along with African Americans. Um, and then when Moody took it over, they split it up between them and, and the students. I think it's great that it's gonna be uh, um, affordable and low income. Again, I'm happy that they um, preserve Morningside too. Uh, as you all know, we just voted not too long ago on the, uh, the big project just to the, to the west of there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I forget what you call it, but uh, it's gonna be a large project. So it's good to have this type of diversity um, in this community. Uh, so I commend uh, both the developer and also Alderman Hopkins for the preservation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me go back and start again. Do I have a motion on the proposed amendment to residential plan development number 156 submitted by Morningside South Affordable LLC for the property generally located at 141-171 West Oak Street, find that it meets the requirements for approval. So moved, Novara. Moved Second. By seconded by Commissioner Reyes. Um, let me now go to roll call. Uh, Commissioner uh, Burnett. Yes. Is a yes. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Commissioner Garza? Yes. Pinedo? Yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Moore? Yes. Commissioner Novara? Yes. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Commissioner Shaw? And not no answer. And Commissioner Villegas. Yes. All right. Well, congratulations, uh, team. Uh, motion passes. Thank you very much. And we have uh, uh, we do have an informational piece before we before we adjourn uh, to share an update on the WMBE goals pursuant to the executive order. DPD staff Nancy uh, Razovich. Uh, Assistant Commissioner will provide a brief update on the status of project compliance in accordance with the Marial Executive Order on WMBE participation to the members of the Chicago Plan Commission. Um, Ms. Ms. Uh, Razovich. Um, good afternoon, Chairperson Cordova. Um, Noah, can you give me uh, privileges to share, please? I believe tech support just gave them to Nancy. Thanks. Okay, can you see the presentation? Yes, looks fine. Great, thanks. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Cordova and members of the Plan Commission. My name is Nancy Radzovich. I'm an Assistant Commissioner with the Zoning Bureau within the Department of Planning and Development. I'm here today to provide the Commission with an update on the minority and women business enterprise, MBE and WBE respectively. Um, and local city residents' equitable participation on PD projects that have been reviewed and approved since the adoption of Executive Order 2017-2, uh, um, known as EO 2017-2. Um, by way of background, um, this executive order was initiated back in August of 2017 and requires developers who are seeking plan developments, uh, plan development zoning approvals uh, through the plan commission to submit signed affidavit as well as supporting documents related to their efforts to promote and incorporate uh, participation by certified MBEs, WBE firms, and for hiring local city residents uh, for the jobs that are created, those construction jobs that are created as part of these PD developments. The particip participation goals established in 2017-02 include 26% uh, MBE participation, 6% WBE, and 50% city resident, or what we call the local hire um, uh, participation. 
The affidavits are to be provided at the time of plan commission review. The second time they're supposed to be provided when they go through the part two zoning review, which is done when they apply for the building permits. And then finally, they're supposed to provide their final reports that show the actual participation levels at the time of final certificate of occupancy. Um, to assist developers and general contractors in identifying certified MBEs and WBEs, uh, the Department of Procurement maintains, or uh, the DPD uh, refers them to the Department of Procurement because they maintain a list of minority and women business um, enterprise agencies on their website. It's easily sortable and searchable. And then this is the same location where any sort of um, minority business or women business enterprise could get certified through the city, same location. Uh, in addition, DPD had created and maintains a list of assist agencies. And those are some um, more local agencies around the city that might be able to assist the GCs and the developers, uh, again, to find minority or business enterprises, as well as some uh, potentially local residents to work on their projects. Um, as previously noted, the developers or GCs are required to provide affidavits at plan commission review, at zoning, part two zoning review, and at final COO. So at the, um, to date, the plan commission approvals through September, 2021, so through the end of last month, uh, 228 PD applications were reviewed and approved through the plan commission that, that fell under this executive order. The value of those is uh, just under uh, $41 billion. And um, the estimated number of construction jobs that those projects um, collectively uh, proposed to create were um, gosh, uh, over 132,000 construction jobs. At the time they go through uh, review through the plan commission, every developer to date um, has committed to a minimum of 26, six and 50. Um, just to kind of break this down, since, since this is the plan commission, um, wanted to show a little bit more detail on the number of projects that actually have been reviewed since this executive order uh, took place by each year. Again, 2017 was only a partial year. So this, these 15 PDs that are shown in 2017 reflect the approvals that started in, December, in September of that year through December. Uh, 2018, 2019, and 2020 are full years. And again, 2021 is a partial uh, tally so far um, and runs through January through September. So, you know, 54 projects have been, or PD projects have been approved, um, PD applications have been approved uh, this year so far um, by the Planning Commission. So for the part two review, again, this is when those um, applicants, those GCs or developers come in for their zoning, what we call the part two zoning review at the time of building permit. Through the end of September, 107 part two zoning reviews were completed. This is, um, those reviews were completed within 89 different PDs and for 94 different projects. And the reason why there's a different number of permits versus projects is sometimes there's multiple permits for a given PD or project um, foundations or, or different phases of particular PD pro project. Um, through the part two reviews through September, close to uh, $8 billion in total estimated project costs of those approved projects, those permitted projects. Um, over 28,000 jobs were estimated, construction jobs were estimated to have been, um, to be um, created for those projects. And um, at the time of permitting, a lot of them still try to commit to the 26, six and 50, but some GCs actually come through and have more finalized um, um, projects and, and know who their um, subcontracts are gonna be. So there's actually some, at this point, some differentiation with those GCs. Um, so at collectively uh, for these 94 projects, there are, um, we've got 25.5% minority business enterprise uh, participation anticipated, um, still right around that 6% for WBEs. 
and then just below the 50% for the um, city local hires. Some of the, um, some of the contractors and developers um, based on conversations with a particular ward alderman or, um, will also track their um, participation from the local board. This is not required by the executive order, um, but sometimes they will note that. So I included that um, through, through September, through these part two reviews, 4% um, of those city hires were expected to be from within the ward. And again, the final reports are due at final certificate of occupancy. Um, through the end of September, final um, certificate of occupancies, 39 of them have been issued by the Department of Buildings. Um, of those 39 uh, DPD, we've Zoning Bureau, uh, we've received um, 20 complete final reports to date. Um, in addition, I've received three additional partial reports where they weren't including all the information that we needed. And then um, there's also another 12 developers that I've been in contact with for, um, I'm sorry, eight developers on 12 different projects. They've advised that they are working on pulling their final information together. So, you know, I expect those to, to come in um, within the next month or two, I guess. Um, the final participation, again, this is based on the 20 reports reports, the final reports that we have received, the complete reports. Um, the value of those projects are close to $900 million in total project costs. Um, the participation level collectively was about 21.1% for MBEs, about 7.8, uh, almost 8% for WBEs, and then 37.4% for the local hiring um, portion of the projects. Uh, again, some of those reported um, how many ward um, hires they had. And so from the data um, from those 20 reports, 89 of that, those local hires actually came from the ward within the project uh, where the project was, um, was completed. Uh, this just graphically shows uh, the difference between the goals in blue, the 26, 6 and 50, and the actual participation levels for those, um, based on those 20 uh, completed reports that have been received to date. And then finally, I just wanted to kind of show graphically where these projects are. Um, so the red dots are the ones that have been, I mean, the, the blue dots are the ones that have been approved by plan commission, but no further action has been taken. So the approvals through plan commission, but they haven't gone through permitting or gotten a COO yet. Uh, the green ones are the ones that have obviously gone through plan commission and have gotten the building permits. And then the red dots are the ones that have completed all aspects and, and gotten their final COOs. And with that, I will um, conclude my presentation and open it up for any questions. Thank you very much. Um, really appreciate you, the work that it goes into putting this together. Um, I, I have a question, um, you know, I've tried to get in the habit is, uh, I don't always do it, but to remind developers to uh, be sure and report back to you. Um, is, has that improved at all or are you still having a problem with that? Yeah, it's, um, and, and thank you for that question because um, we've talked about that obviously before. Um, one of the challenges that we've had is, is you know, we've got these, these two different departments working on, on quote unquote this aspect of it. So. You know, all the COOs are being issued by um, the building department. And it, it took us a while, but, but um, thanks to work with uh, Grant Ulrich, we, we figured out a way to kind of add a little tripwire because um, up until recently, there really wasn't a, a tripwire for buildings to be able to, to kind of help us alert those developers. You know, the other aspect of this is because the PDs go through, through, um, approval by a developer, in many cases, by the time it gets to the point of COO, you know, either the, the developer may have changed or, or they may not have even been involved as much as the general contractors. So, you know, it's, it's been um, challenging trying to find in the past, you know, trying to find out who those right people were. So a lot of what we're missing are things that we're still trying to catch up on on these older COOs. 
But now that we've got this system in place with um, the building department, we can now put notes on, they've given us the, the permission to put notes on what they call the certificate of occupancy module. And so now that we've started doing that, you know, within the last couple of weeks, I've been getting emails from their inspector, you know, saying, hey, you know, this person is is filed for their final COO, right? So at that point, you know, I get the contact person and I can start reaching out to them. And then they include that note when they send out their emails regarding what needs to be done for um, final COO that that those contractors need to, to contact me. So oh, our great. hope is that this is gonna be resolved. And these privileges um, have been extended to our two part two reviewers, um, Eric Glass and Mike Marmo, so that when they actually do their part two reviews now going forward, they can actually enter that not only on the building permit, they can put a note on the building permit, and then also again in this COO module. module. So we're really hopeful that this will kind of help bridge that gap. Um, and then we'll start seeing um, fewer kind of gaps between the COOs being issued and those those final reports coming in. Great, thank you so much. All right, sure. Commissioner Villegas. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. This is something obviously that's very important. This is yeah. a huge economic development opportunity for smaller firms. Uh, and quite frankly, the developers that I've spoken to are uh, understand that, that, that this, this executive order and, and other um, methods in trying to get MWB participation isn't going away. And so um, uh, I'd like to see if we can get a breakdown by ethnicity for the MBEs that's been reported thus far. Um, I think the, uh, the, last, uh, the last slide, um, had, um, yeah, there you go. You had 21%, 21.1% MBE participation. Uh, I'd like to see that. And then um, at the time of submittal, you know, when they are, are uh, attesting to the 26 and six, are they providing some, providing you or Department of Procurement some type of utilization plan on how they plan to get to 26 and six? Or are they just saying that, yeah, we're gonna do 26 and six. So um, those are very good questions. I'm gonna start with the second question. So what they're required to do is specifically provide first and foremost affidavits at, at each phase. So they're supposed to provide those affidavits. Also at the time they're going through the plan commission as well as at part two review, they're also supposed to be submitting like kind of their plan for how they, they plan to, to meet the goals, right? Um, what I've been finding is on the back end, a couple of them um, are also providing, you know, that same kind of summary, um, although it's not technically required, they've been providing some additional kind of feedback on the back end to try to show that they did make some efforts to try to get, you know, to get more participation um, involved. Um, with respect to um, the minority breakdown, it's, it's not something that's been required. It's, it's not something that's, that's required to be filled in by our forms. So, you know, I don't know if, if going back, if I can get them all to, to try to break it down by um, which, you know, which minority, um, you know, and I'm, I'm, I think what your question was, you know, what proportion were of this 21% were, we're black versus, um, you know, Latino, um, but that's that's not something that they've been asked to track, and so we don't have that information. Um, it, it's not part of that executive order. Do you have a follow up, Commissioner? Yeah. So, uh, but, but when they submit at the time for utilization, I mean, how how do we verify that the firms they're submitting are in fact MWBE firms? Because from there, you would determine kind of based on who certified them, uh, who you can find out from there what ethnicity. And I think that it'd behoove us to have this information, especially when you have 32 members of the city council and at some point this is gonna go to the city council and that question is gonna be posed as to the, the, the breakdown on the team that's actually being uh, submitted for the, for the, to comply with the 26 and six. 
Yeah, what they provide and what they're required to provide, um, again, what they're providing at, at plan commission review as well as part two review is, is mostly their strategies for how they're gonna get participation. And it's, it's you know, we're gonna send letters, we're gonna call these people, we're gonna reach out to these people, right? So it's, it's more about the strategies. What they provide at end is really um, a database that just has the name and the participation level. You know, it would, it would require someone to do a lot of um, research to, to then kind of cross check it to, to find out who, I guess, what level of minority. And, and I'm, I'm gonna be honest, I don't, I don't know, um, I don't know what exactly um, the procurement department captures when, when they do those um, certifications. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't know how that, that can um, be captured. It's, it's, again, it's not a, a technical requirement of the executive order and it, it would require quite a bit of time to, to kind of do that back recon on it. Okay, so those that this is the, the final, the 39. What about the ones that are in this part two and then the ones that are just starting? Is there a way to capture that now? No, and again, um, at, at plan commission time, what they're doing is they're providing an affidavit to say, we this is what we're committing to. And, and for the most part, when these projects are coming through um, for plan development approval, you know, the developers might have, you know, 50% uh, plans done at that point, right? So they haven't even gotten to the point. They might have a GC on board or, or have a GC on mind, but it's not until they actually get to that permitting point that they're gonna start really start um, advertising and going out for bid on, on some of their subcontractors. They might have some um, ideas of what they, um, of who they might hire or how they might do that at Part two review, but again, none of that is is on the forms, or or and it's not a requirement as part of this executive order, so it's not being captured. It's it's not been captured because it's not been required. So, um, does the requirement, in order to capture that data, does that there need to be a an amendment to the executive order or an ordinance to require it? I mean, how would I, I just think that that's important information to capture up front, similar to what we do with other projects on the city side. I mean, uh, if you're just a testing that you're gonna do it, um, but you're not showing how you're gonna do it and it be a, like a utilization plan, then you're just saying you're doing it. And we saw that 21.1% was the final number, um, which is, I mean, close to 26, but when you see on other projects, it's a lot higher because there's a little bit more accountability. And I think during the disparity study, I think Colette Haltoff has talked about the, the, um, uh, some of the issues with compliance. And, um, and I think that, um, and, and, it, and I think that's why they, there, there's a new compliance part that's gonna come out in the budget. But you know, we're talking about $40 billion potentially worth of work at 26%, it's roughly 10%, $10 billion of economic development going into the M minority firms and another uh, 2.4 billion for uh, uh, women-owned firms. I think it's, I think it's crucial that we, we have that ability to track it so that we, uh, when they, when, if they are having a problem meeting it, we know ahead of time so that way we can assist the contract and assist the developer rather in meeting the goals that we're trying to, that we're trying to, uh, to achieve as, as a city. So I, I will um, just kind of, um, you know, put a, a reminder out there that, that compliance for this particular executive order is that they file the reports. So this is not, um, this is not, this executive order is not saying that they need to comply with these levels. It's, these are just simply goals. The only compliance aspect for this particular executive order is that they're required to file these reports and, and document how they intend to meet the goals and then at the back end, you know, what what, you know, how they how they how they did, you know, what was their end result in in the participation levels. So the the participation levels themselves um, are not a question of compliance. It's it's just them providing the reports. So in that case, the answer to uh, to uh, 
Commissioner Viegas's question, maybe yes, we need, we need a new executive order. I didn't mean to cut in you. Go ahead, go ahead, Commissioner. No, I, I was just going to say then we're just making them comply with the paperwork. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, listen, um, uh, Nancy, uh, Commissioner Cox, um, you guys play a crucial role in economic development for the city. And uh, the fact that there's uh, 40, potentially $40 billion worth of work on the books, uh, even, and even if half of it comes to fruition, 20 billion, we're talking a huge economic development to, to small uh, minority women-owned businesses in the city of Chicago. So I think, I think that uh, we, we wanna, I wanna work with you to help you strengthen it uh, in a way that we can get minority small businesses that are generally located and headquartered in Chicago, that pay property tax in Chicago, that pay all the fines and fees and all the other taxes that we put on businesses here. Um, we want them to have an opportunity to participate on these projects too. So I wanna work with you to figure out how we can strengthen this because in my discussions with developers in the industry, they understand that there's this executive order is there, but quite frankly, if this is just a paper tiger that we just you know comply yeah. with the paperwork, then we're doing a disservice to the small minority women-owned businesses that think they're going to get a part of this forty billion dollar pie. We might as well just say that you know what, um, uh, go ahead and and take a look at it, but you're not going to participate in it. Now we have twenty-one percent. That's that's the old projects, but we have. Uh, this is 879, you have about 30, $38 billion worth of work still to come. I, th I think we need to do a better job at that. That's all I'm saying. And I wanna work with you to help you get this done. So I think um, that's what you've, the issues you've raised are really important, Commissioner Villegas. And so I guess the question is, what are the next steps? Uh, let me go to uh, Commissioner Reyes. Um, and then Commissioner Cox, I presume, is going to directly respond to your your uh, your questions and your 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 expression of wanting to work on this. Um, go ahead, Commissioner Reyes. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to echo what uh, Alderman Commissioner Villegas just said. I think that it, it's got to be more than affidavits. It's got to be what we heard this morning with the previous twenty percent, thirty percent. It has to be more than just aspirational or just a goal. So I think that um, we need to work together to figure it out how to get it to the point where they have to provide the name of the subcontractors. I know in the world of affordable housing, when we get uh, federal funded, we have to, the general contractor is the one that carries that. And he provides all the subcontractors. And I know here it's not the same, I understand that. But I think we need to find other ways to hold developers and general contractors accountable because there is a, this is a great opportunity as Alderman Villegas just said. So uh, I, we need to move from fine. aspirational to, to, to numbers. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I did wanna clarify, they do provide the names. You know, that's, that's part of what's on the table what they don't do is provide that added level of detail that that um, that Alderman Viegas was was asking about in terms of you know what type of minority it is. Mm -hmm. So they provide their final reports. Yes, it includes the name and includes the percentages of their contract and what proportion of the the total uh, value that was. And and that's that's what um, you know per the again per the executive order as it is now as well as as the documents that are required, that's, that's what they're, they're required to uh, provide. And I suspect um, Alderman or um, Commissioner Cox is gonna um, talk a little bit more about this, but there's, there's definitely some legal implications that, that are related to zoning laws that would need to be really considered. Um, and, and I am not an attorney. And well, let me, go, let me go to our attorney on that. Uh, Mr. Gaynor, would you like to to respond, at least give us an initial response on this as we gather more information. <clears throat> sure, uh, this is Mike Gaynor, uh, General Counsel for Department of Planning and Department of uh, Housing. I'm sorry, I just uh, I just recently joined the Zoom. Um, so is, is the question about um, 
is it about repercussions for, for not let, let, let me let let me let uh, commissioner Villegas restate it go ahead commissioner sure uh-oh we heard sure I think that was me yeah oh I I can take a stab but he's sure. on mute he's on he's still on mute He might have he might have gotten distracted for a moment. Part of what he what he was asking, Mr. Gaynor, was um, so right now there's there's not much of a request for any you know compliance other than just sort of say this is what you're going to do. And so uh, Commissioner Villegas was really asking about what it's going to take to to strengthen this, um, uh, so that so that they can, for example, reporting who some of the subcontractors are. Um, but I think we're into, he's interested, as am I, I think, and, and also as Commissioner Ray has expressed, uh, an interest in seeing more teeth in this than, than it being, as he referred to, a paper tiger. Go ahead, Mr. Gaynor. I think he well, was also kind of alluding to, um, you know, right now um, the, the requirements are that they provide the reports, right? right, um, right. And, I, and I think where he was going is, is can we make that the these more than just goals? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. So um, I guess my general comments would be, first of all, um, if, if something, uh, I'm just going to use this word, and I don't mean to say stronger or weaker in a pejorative sense, but if something stronger than an executive order is, is what um, uh, uh, Alderman Vegas or any other council members would be interested in, what we're really talking about then is an ordinance, um, yeah. not not an executive order. And or, I would say, or, or a revised executive order. Well, I, um, well, I sure, but I when it comes to the when it comes to the issue of teeth or repercussions or what have mm -hmm. you. Um, mm -hmm. Here's what I here, here's what I would say. You know, the basis for the city's MBE ordinance, um, the the. Uh, the evidence that backs it up is a disparity study, uh, because you know the MBE program is a you know for lack of a better term it's a race based set aside, and for race I mean the case law says that race based set asides um, are subject to strict strict scrutiny, uh, and that's a high it's a high threshold and it's on the you know it, it's on the defendant it's not on the it's not on the plaintiff um, so the city would be able would need to be able to defend. Uh, um, let's say if there was an ordinance applying MBE, WBE to um, plan developments the way that it's applied to city contracts, uh, we would need to be able to defend it uh, under strict, strict scrutiny standard. And the way to do that would be to have a, a disparity study. And when, when the, um, uh, the Department of Procurement Services and the, and the administration just went through this exercise um, and went through a, um, a revised or a refreshed scrutiny study and came to the conclusion that that the uh, MBE ordinance um, for procurement um, uh, that there wasn't enough justification to go any any further beyond that um, that uh, that all transpired over the past year past year plus so again there would have to be a disparity study proving that uh, or evidencing that. Um, that there are disparities in the world of zoning. And what we're, we're talking about is, is private developments, right? Not, not city contracts or not um, city incentivized uh, development, but, but purely private improvement. Zoning is, you know, zoning is at bottom, uh, PDs are zoning and zoning at bottom is about land use. It's about, it's about uh, use location and density and massing. Um, and so we'd have to, a disparity study would have to prove that there is, um, you know, discrimination or imbalances or what have you in the construction industry, uh, in um, in these private developments, and that and that <clears throat> that the, the 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 fix or the remedy would have to come through um, imposing MBE WBE strictly more strictly on zoning to get to uh, a result, you know, to sort of um, uh, put things in better balance or what have you or, or address discrepancies or injustices. So that's how, the, I, I, I believe that's how an ordinance, um, an ordinance would have to, to work. Uh, it, it had it have to be defensible and we, we need the evidence of a, of a disparity study. 
Um, I, I, I couldn't I couldn't begin to speculate as to how that study would work or what it could find, but at a minimum, I think that's what it would take. Commissioner Vegas, did you have a follow up question or any comment on that? No, I think I think then the executive order um, that we have in place here, um, forty billion dollars potentially worth of work, uh, one billion of it already done, and looking at the compliance portion of it. Um, I think is an issue. And I think that's why here's a great opportunity to try to uh, uh, grow small businesses, specifically minority women-owned businesses that are headquartered here, located in Chicago, that pay taxes here. I think that uh, we're missing an opportunity here. I understand the disparity study. I understand that we just went through the exercise of the disparity study, but I would argue that the same amount of that disparity study looks specifically at construction. So we're not even talking about the architects and engineers, we're talking about construction, which is similar to the work that the developers are currently doing now. Um, and so if we go through a disparity study exercise, you're gonna see the same results because it's the same industry, it's the construction industry. It was, it was very tailored to the construction industry. Um, so that would be that would be my my rebuttal rebuttal to to Mr. Gaynor's uh, comment there. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Cox. You've had your hand up. Yeah, no, I appreciate uh, Alderman Viegas' um, uh, probing here. You know, ultimately we're talking about you know the carrot, you know the carrot versus the stick. Earlier we we're talking about um, planning documents versus ordinance. Now we're talking about executive order versus uh, ordinance. Uh, in, in the reality is we're trying to get to a goal of increased minority and women participation in these industries. Uh, and you can do it um, multiple ways. Um, given the fact that that aspiration has been set of 26 and six, and the initial reporting is, is showing that they are uh, making good faith effort to achieve it, they're falling short, but we set a bar. Uh, and, that, and, and that has changed behavior. Um, I think um, we would be um, wise to try to find ways to um, model uh, what a good compliance uh, goal strategy looks like. Clearly, there are already um, developers who are um, producing results. Well, is that now the model? Do those who have to comply even know what a good framework looks like? And I think that's something that if we have um, developers who are leading the way, then well, each one needs to teach one. Uh, and so I think that that is something within our power to put out the best case examples of how um, developers are meeting their goals. Um, so I think that's a primary thing. And then, you know, I, I was at the HACIA's uh, annual meeting um, just a week ago and, and heard from a number of Latina um, business owners who were making connections in um, parts of the construction industry that I, I had not even really focused on. And it underscored just how significant these trade organizations are in having a, a place where developers can actually meet um, qualified tradespeople who are MBE, uh, WBE. So I just think a stronger partnership with these organizations and a much more proactive role on our part to show developers those few models that we've seen that are um, very consciously moving towards that goal. Uh, and again, you know, I think Alderman Viegas' point is extremely well taken. The construction industry is the economic engine of small business creation. Uh, and we should be trying um, a, a multitude of tools. So I'm just gonna say, you know, uh, we know, uh, I think the legal challenges of, of trying to, you know, use the stick we have not at all exhausted the carrots. And I would like to see us um, double our effort 
uh, to see um, how we can use, you know, our best practices and, and the work that I think um, has been done, that Nancy has done to pull together this information. And as I said, I know that there are um, models of developers who take this very, very seriously. And I think Thank they you. would be the first to, to teach their colleagues how to do it correctly. Thank you. Commissioner Pinero. Uh, Nancy, I, I believe that it was in your last um, graph that you showed kind of the goal. So, yes, um, the goal versus the actual. Um, um, am I understanding that correctly? That's the aggregate since the executive order was put in place? Yes. So, um, so I guess to, to kind of um, summarize, um, you know, the 26, 6, and 50 are obviously the goals. The, the 21, the 7.8, and the 37.4, that is strictly based on the number of projects that have been um, completed, issued mm -hmm. still closed, and the subset of that 39 is the 20 that we've actually received the completed reports. And, and I wanted to kind of um, also um, kind of follow up with, with what Commissioner Cox was saying is, is it things that I've been hearing is that, you know, some of these reports are from projects that were approved back in 2018, right, or 2017, when this program was still new. So I think a lot of this, this data that's still coming through is, is the program was fresh, it wasn't as established. And um, as Commissioner Cox has suggested, that, that some of these developers have gotten a lot better at this, right? And, and they've, they've found better ways to try to meet these goals. So, you know, I, I think as we see more reports coming in, we might see some better levels of participation for the, for the more, I guess, mature projects, if you will. Um, the other, I'm sorry, did you have a follow-up question? Yeah, yeah, well, so my, my question was very much in line with what I, I think the point that you're alluding to, which is, what is the tendency? If we have information, if that's the aggregate, but we have information since the executive order was put in place in 2017, what's been happening on an annual basis or every six months so that we can draw a tendency and understand it if truly there's been an improvement. And if that's the case, then it's at least a step in the right direction, but of course uh, still falling short, but, uh, but at least we know where, what direction we're headed. Yeah, and I, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm right now, I'm, I'm just kind of um, doing it off, off of my recollection, but, you know, I, I haven't actually done that analysis to show the trend data, like how much it's changed progressively as, as they've gotten the, the reports done later. Um, the other anecdotal thing I wanted to kind of mention is, is, you know, as I've mentioned, a couple of these GCs, the ones who, um, you know, kind of to choose a uh, uh, bridge off of uh, Commissioner Cox phrasing, the ones that are, are really trying to take this, you know, take it more seriously, but are really more vested to try to figure out how to, how to make this work. Um, you know, they've provided me some additional follow-up reports. They've talked to me. Um, one of the contractors who did an industrial project, for example, said, you know, for them, it was really hard to meet the goals because they, they only had about five or six line items. They had concrete. They had mm -hmm. paint those types of things. And, and one of the things that I've heard from them, as well as a couple of other um, GCs who've kind of provided that added information is, is you know, they've tried to solicit um, bids from minorities and women businesses. Problem is, is some of these businesses are, are so small that they either don't have the, the resources right, the, the level of um, staff to, to complete a larger scale project, or they don't have that capital to, to get that started. And I think that's a common theme and, and um, that I've been hearing from other agencies that have kind of these goal programs where, where you get a lot of these, um, these MBEs and WBEs that, that um, you know, maybe have, have challenges to get across that initial threshold even to, to get to the level to be able to participate on, on these larger scale projects. And Nancy, uh, this, is, this is where I feel that working closely with the trade organizations 
that are, yeah. they are the conduit by which uh, yeah. they meet all of the providers. Yes. Um, and they, and I, as I said, I, I heard three or four testimonies of Latino uh, uh, providers in the industry, very small practitioners who benefited from this MBE, uh, WBE um, mm -hmm. executive order. Um, so uh, I think I think there are key, and maybe we hold uh, quarterly sessions with the primary um, trade yeah. industries, and maybe we bring uh, the handful of developers who have made real progress, and and let them teach their their industry counterparts how this can be done. I just think we there's a lot we can do in that space, uh, and I think we should take advantage of uh, these uh, trade um, associations and organizations. This is what they live for, connecting their members to opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I don't know if we've done that, but you know, one follow-ups that we could have is to uh, reach out uh, to the executive directors of these organizations uh, and see how we can connect their members beyond the presence of a website and you know, go to this website and you see who our members are really to proactively, again, uh, cultivate that. Because I think we, I mean, given the pipeline that's being described, uh, we would be wise <laughs> to continue to double down our effort uh, to find uh, proactive ways to make those connections, so. Okay, uh, Commissioner Villegas followed by Commissioner Reyes. Yeah, uh, and um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Cox, I think that is a great idea. I think that uh, if there's a way to do these uh, quarterly uh, or, or semi-annual uh, events with uh, trade organizations, I think that would um, send, a, send a stronger message that we are really serious about utilizing uh, small businesses located in Chicago, minority women owned businesses in Chicago versus just sending them to a web, website, like you said, and said, here's a list of folks, uh, go ahead and look at it. And then, and then part of their good faith effort, having done this in the past when I was with the Department of Transportation, by going to the website, calling a couple of folks, they've, that's, that, that has, uh, uh, they've checked the box and, and said that that's their good faith effort. And so I think, uh, uh, Commissioner, with your department and you leading that effort with the developers, I think sends a stronger message. Great, thank you. Commissioner Reyes. Just briefly. So could we also, as part of the presentation in the plan commission that we could ask more specifically, not just in terms of, because sometimes we ask about who's gonna be the general contractor, but we could also ask, you know, what is their aspiration in terms of minority hiring? So at least from the beginning, they're getting the same message from us that they, they need to start thinking about who's gonna, you know, who's gonna help them to achieve these percentages. And my other question is, um, no, that was a comment. This is a question, I'm sorry. If, if a developer doesn't meet these percentages, something happens or nothing happens to them? Again, these, um, unlike, unlike the program you were talking about where, you know, if you get federal funding, you're required mm -hmm. to, you know, right? These are not, um, through this executive order, it's, it's not that they have to meet these levels. That is that is okay. not what the executive order says is these are goals. Okay, okay. That's how it's written right now. And then again, back to, to the compliance aspect, you know, right now the executive order basically the it establishes goals and then the compliance mechanism under the current executive order is that they they report out, you know, again, they report out how they expect to. Um, meet the goals, and then at the end, they're they're required to just simply report out. So they're not required to meet these levels; they're just required to report where they actually ended up. Yeah, thank you. Of course. Well, there we go. That's a, that was a good discussion. Um, any more comments? Then, thank you so much, um, Ms. Radovich. That was really thank you all. Yeah, that was really good. Um, so with that, uh, this concludes this month's meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. moved by Commissioner Cox. Moved by Commissioner Reyes, seconded by Commissioner Cox. 
We do have to do a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Burnett. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Garza. Commissioner Pinedo. Yes. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Uh, Garza is a yes. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Okay. Good, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Nevada, Commissioner uh, Reyes. Commissioner Navarro is a yes. Great, thank you. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Commissioner Shaw, I think, has left. Can Commissioner Villegas? Well, Commissioner Villegas. All right, we had, an, I think we had the quorum though. This does conclude this month's meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission. And uh, we are now adjourned at 4.10 p.m. So thank you very much all. Have a, have a good uh, rest of the evening and a good rest of the week. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank good. you, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thank you.